Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Tonight is Monday, February 7th, 2022. Welcome to everyone. We'll start our meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Once again, good evening and welcome. Thanks to everybody for joining us online and here in the council chambers as well. Uh, Mr. Brillard, if you could please call the roll call of the council. Councilmember Carter. Present. Coulter. Present. D'Alessandro. Present. Lohman. I'm here. Martin. Present. Nelson. Here. Mayor Bussey. Here. Record show, all seven members of the Bloomington City Council are in attendance this evening. Next up on the agenda is our approval of the agenda. And I wanted to point out we have under uh, hearings and resolutions, we have five items listed. Officially, four of them are public hearings. Uh, 7.2, the time of sale inspection evaluation ordinance. Uh, officially, we closed the public hearing on that last week, but I know we've had a lot of input and a lot of uh, uh, interest in that. What I would like to do, I don't want to call a public hearing on that, but I think I will take a public comment if the council is amenable to that, to hear if uh, there's additional comments. Uh, I do want to make sure that we don't uh, cover ground already covered by folks, anybody who would like to comment on that, but uh, I do want to have the opportunity for people to, uh, to, to chime in on the time of sale inspection evaluation ordinance. So, so with our five hearings and ordinances, and then we have organizational business, and we've got uh, a number of board appointments, and uh, that will, I think, fill up most of the organizational business. And, fill up most of our evening, and I think we'll push right up until 11 o'clock again tonight. Okay. Council, any changes or additions uh, to tonight's agenda? If not, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilmember Carter to approve tonight's agenda. Hearing no further discussion on this, Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We have an agenda for this evening. Item four on our agenda is the public comment period. It is our every meeting. Uh, we have 20 minutes set aside for members of the public to come forward and address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. We do limit each uh, statement to five minutes. Just make sure everybody has the same opportunity. And uh, it's not a back and forth, of course. And it's uh, we will chime in with uh, answers to obvious questions, but otherwise we will leave rebuttal or comments to item 4.1, which is the response to the prior meeting's comments. And that is what we will start with. Mr. Verbrugge, item 4.1 tonight, the response to the prior meeting's public comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Good evening. At our last meeting, which was January 24th, uh, resident uh, Dr. Brian Armitage, uh, who lives uh, 16th Avenue South, spoke to the council uh, with concerns about the uh, pickup of uh, collection of garbage. Uh, he and two of his neighbors uh, have a unique situation in that they share a private driveway. In early January, Republic Services notified the city uh, that they experienced difficulty accessing homes uh, on private drives like this and would no longer be uh, collecting garbage at the homes and would require carts to be relocated to the public street. Uh, Dr. Armitage uh, expressed his concern about the change in the garbage collection location. Uh, garbage is currently being collected at the end of the driveway adjacent to the public street, similar to how collection occurs at other similarly situated properties and how it is outlined in the city's garbage and recycling contract with the haulers. The issues raised by Dr. Armitage have been investigated and communicated uh, back to him and council received a memo with those additional details. So the next steps for us, uh, staff continues to discuss possible uh, accommodations that could be made to provide collection on the private drive with the Republic Services, uh, although uh, those options don't appear promising at this point in time. <clears throat> Unless uh, other accommodations can be made, the collection will, will continue at the public street and uh, staff will continue to contact uh, Dr. Armitage and his neighbors and we'll update the council via one weekly if anything changes as well. So. That's uh, the response to the previous public comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. I see Councilmember Nelson with his hand in the air. Councilmember Nelson. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, uh, City Manager Barugi. Appreciate the information, appreciate what you sent over to us and the work staff has done on this. Um, I just want to go on record that I'm not really satisfied with Republic's response to this, and I have a couple of questions. Did something in our new contract change? Because it seems like it had been picked up um, as the residents have requested for several years under the organized trash hauling situation. Was there something different in the new contract that that changed? Um, the other question I have, I mean, I think to Mr. Armitage, I apologize if I got the name wrong there. Uh, it had been picked up that way for decades. So I, you know, I'm still, you know, candidly a little bit um, uh, dissatisfied with the trash haulers explanation of why they can't do what has been done for decades. Um, again, appreciate staff continuing to work hard on this issue and take care of these residents and um, interested in, in kind of that information. Mr. Verrugge. Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, I'm not aware that there's a change in the contract regarding the the private drive issue. I think the what what staff determined uh, when they went out to look at the conditions in and uh, listening to Republic Services explanation had to do with the the nature of the driveway and uh, safety issues with with ice and snow and their ability to access it safely. Um, the the issue that we have currently is that the Republic was essentially providing a service uh, above and beyond what was required in the contract. And at this point, they're defaulting to the contract language, which is the public street. And so, uh, you know, we're continuing to work with them to see if there is a way that we can do this. Um, but per the terms of the contract, and I don't think that was any change uh, in the most recent iteration, they're, they're meeting the, the contractual requirement. If I could, Mayor, just one quick follow-up. Mr. Nelson. Just for clar clarification. Um, Republic was the previous hauler at that location. There was no change through buying out another company or anything of that nature. They've been doing it the entire time. Is that accurate? Um, Council Member Nelson, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, I'm not 100% certain of that. I'd have to check back with staff to make sure that that is accurate. Okay, thank you. Yep. Council Member Lohman, question? Yeah, I did have uh, one question and one one comment. Um, uh, Mayor, I just want to make sure that staff is aware that uh, we had a resident last time trying to get through in public comment and was not able to get through. Um, uh, so just uh, um, we can just be aware of that um, last time. I did have uh, a couple quick questions about, about this particular uh, situation. Um, I did have a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Armitage um, uh, regarding uh, the situation, uh, even this evening again. And um, uh, the thing that he is concerned about, and which is the question I have, is uh, were all three uh, residents notified uh, regarding the, the issue that they had with uh, the particular uh, uh, their driveways? Because it seems to me that he felt that uh, there just wasn't a lot of transparency with this process, uh, and uh, he was not aware that... Uh, that there wasn't even an issue going on. So, do we have communication from the uh, uh, from the uh, trash hauler that, uh, uh, that 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 all three uh, residents were were contacted regarding the situation that was going on? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, the information that staff has provided is yet yes, they were contacted um, by uh, Republic. Yeah, I don't want to get into a back and forth right here, but uh, he, he's denying that, that that actually occurred. Have we actually I'm seen sorry. I, I, I misspoke, Councilmember Lohman. They were con the the residents were contacted by the city staff, not by the uh, not by the hauler. And so we contacted them that there was an ongoing issue um, uh, with with being able to get to there. So he's saying that that hasn't happened. Uh, he never got that communication. Is there some missing communication between staff and in terms of in terms that there was an issue, when were they first notified uh, regarding uh, this issue? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, I'd have to go back and see when that first contact was. I know that when uh, Dr. Armitage spoke to the Council two weeks ago, uh, staff had been in contact with him and was already in the process of preparing a response. 
yeah, I mean, beyond that, we don't have to go back and forth right now, but um, uh, basically what I'm hearing from, from residents is they're very disappointed. They don't feel like we're advocating on their behalf and they're very supportive of this program. And so I'm just trying to, trying to figure out how to communicate with, with folks in terms of what's going on. So I'm hearing one, you know, one thing from, from residents and, you know, they're, they're feeling like this hasn't been a very transparent policy or, or process, um, uh, and a number of other, uh, other items that I'm just trying to figure out how to. How to, how to you know work within the contract to be able to get them what they've they've been able to, to really have over the decades and so um, and so I'm just hoping that we can figure out uh, where the disconnect is uh, you know we're, we're all three of them equally uh, communicated to uh, by staff was it just this year I mean they were really disappointed that this happened right in the middle of winter uh, that they have to change their entire process he wasn't able to talk to me all uh, very long today because he was actually going in for a hip surgery uh, today. So he won't be here, but I know that he's going to have some folks, uh, he's planning to have some folks talk uh, in public comment. So, um, and then just last, Mayor, um, the last thing is, uh, I didn't see a response to one of his questions with regards to how other private uh, drives are treated in the city. And I'm assuming that, that, that that's what you're saying is that other private driveways don't have, have this particular service. Is that is that correct? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, in the in the memo that we shared with the Council, there were there was some discussion about other private drives. There are a couple of circumstances where the haulers are providing service on private drives, and the nature of those private drives is what allows them to do that because they are more like a city uh, street in terms of the width and the ability uh, to do turnaround. Uh, that's one of the limitations with the with the. Uh, properties that are being discussed right now is uh, is the the conditions uh, are not conducive to the easy backing or turnaround of equipment, especially in uh, snow and ice conditions when the road is actually uh, smaller than it is during the summertime. So yes, long long answer. The short answer is yes, there, there are some private drive examples where haulers are servicing them. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll pick up some more questions later on. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, just uh, real, real quick, just to request some information for a little down the line. It, yeah, just it kind of bugs me that this sounds like uh, uh, customer service they were going above and beyond to provide previously. Uh, and I, I would just worry that with the city getting involved in negotiating contracts and things like that, that they now feel that they don't need to be nice to neighbors like that, or that it's the seniors problem, if the driveways I see. So I guess I, I would just be curious what kind of customer service standards we're currently um, setting strict parameters and measurements around in terms of our work with the haulers. And could those be more specific? It sounds like this is just a nice thing they were doing, but I would hate to have the city getting involved be the reason why stuff like this stops. So just curious. Thank we'll you. have staff follow up with more information, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Council, any additional questions on this? If not, I'm sure staff will get back to us either in one weekly or uh, next week we'll follow up on this, I'm certain. With that, we move on to item 4.2, which is our public comment period. As I said, a 20-minute period where we allow residents to come forward and speak to the council on items not on tonight's agenda. I know we had at least one person call ahead. I believe Ms. Ness is on the phone waiting to speak to us for item 4.2. Riza, do we have a, a Sally Ness on the line wishing to speak to item 4.2? If you wish to join the public comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Yes, we have Sally Ness on the phone. Your, your line is open, Ms. Sally. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. This is Sally Ness. Thank you. Last meeting, the City Council approved a conditional use permit at 1701 American Boulevard. There were questions asked that should have been answered before Council voted. January 13, question asked, if there are no table and chairs in the event center, how many people can the event center accommodate? Is the event center designed so that it can overflow into the attached lobby? City response, the multi-purpose space would be calculated at one person per 15 square feet. The parking requirement would be one third of occupancy. The lobby serves as an entry to the whole campus facility, so it is not grouped with the multi-purpose room. My comment, it is an event center, and the number of people that can attend an event should determine parking. Also, there appears to be three main entrances to the cultural campus. Additionally, there is an entrance to the lobby. So again, what prevents the use of the lobby as an overflow for the event center? 
question asked, page 58 of the staff report states, provide trip generation numbers for the site using ITE trip generation standards. I do not see any trip generation numbers or data why they are not provided. Are there trip generation numbers? City response regarding trip generation, the staff members, engineering and traffic who work on this issue are currently out of the office. I want to confirm with them the status of this question prior to providing more info. My comment, the question still has not been answered and should have been before planning and city voted. January 14, question asked, assembly at 8201 Park is allowed one person per eight square feet. What prevents this space from being used at a greater occupancy? The question about the intended use of the event center was not answered. What is the intended use? My comment, these questions were not answered and should have been before being voted. January 19, question asked, did someone comment about there being additional parking available across the street? City response, the member did not discuss sites across the street, but rather that there may be opportunities for shared parking in an overflow situation at either the abutting office property to the east, 81, 1801 American Boulevard, or the hotel property to the west, 1601 American Boulevard. Regarding occupancy rates, the associated parking demand multi-use facilities often present more complex, unique considerations than a typical single use, such as office or warehouse. While it is important to consider what the maximum potential parking demand of a facility or use may be, it is also important to consider that overbuilding surface parking is also not a good policy outcome for the community. My comment, this reply indicates a concern and planning did not address it. Additionally, the planning commission should not be offering other property up as a solution. The city stated multi-use facilities often present more complex or unique considerations and therefore the need for a thorough discussion Yes, overbuilding surface parking is not a good policy, but neither is approving an event center in an office complex that was not designed for an event center, does not include required parking, and it was done without knowing the intent of the use or how many people can attend the event center. Again, it is an event center, and the number of people that can attend an event should be determined parking. June 21st, question asked, why is the culture campus a consent agenda item not a hearing. The Planning Commission recommended approval of Resurrection Power Church at the site with Batteries Plus, but after the council hearing, additional information was provided. The council did not approve the application. City response, in the case of a conditional use permit at Cultural Campus, the Planning Commission is responsible for holding the public hearing and the city council is responsible to be the decision maker. Follow-up question asked, why did Resurrection College Church have a hearing at the city council meeting before council voted and Culture Campus does not? My comment, this question was not answered and should have been before Planning Commission and city council voted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Rise, is there anyone else on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.2, the public comment period? No other comments at this time. You may continue. Thank you. Is there anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2, our public comment period? Can I get the overhead, please? Okay. Um, my name is uh, Andy Thule, 50 year resident of Bloomington. Um, Good evening, manager, <clears throat> mayor, and council. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I had a chance uh, actually to get uh, on the uh, strategic planning uh, team, and uh, I found some interesting things. I actually talked to Mr. Sable over here um, on the phone. One of my number one concerns is transparency and engagement that you guys adopted in the last strategic uh, thing. The whole entire um, strategic planning, I believe, should be actually videotaped, actually for me to preview, and maybe even for the public to actually look at. So this is a really, really big thing that we're laying out. We're probably spending quite a bit of money on the strategic plan. So Mr. Mike and I had had a, a friendly conversation. He actually called me at home, and I told him my stance on it is this should be publicly recorded. It's paid for with taxpayer dollars, and so that's one of my big concerns. So. I want to know in the next uh, public comment uh, manager why this is not actually being um, publicly taped or, or able to be reviewed you know, by the public. So I know council meetings are taped and whatnot, but I feel that it should be publicly available. Uh, the other thing, doing a simple um, Google search, I found out, I kind of found out that Transformation Systems is our consultant that is being used for the strategic plan under Teresa Arpin. 
So I Googled her name and I Googled the city manager's um, uh, name. And what I found is the city manager speaking on serving diverse populations, which I'm all for. But what I found is I found a strategic plan. Um, you guys got the overhead? Oh, it's over here. Um, I found a, a strategic plan that the city manager actually used under his uh, previous uh, employment with the Brooklyn Park, right? And eerily, if you look at this, the, 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 it's kind of hard to see, but there's, this, there's the delimiters, there's the strategies, and there's the core values. Um, and eerily, the plans at Brooklyn Park look very, very similar. Now, we use the same consultant, and we, we um, brought a core value team in here. Now, I tried to get on the core value team, and I was not able to get on. So I'm actually an input, a resident input through the strategic planning. So I find it very concerning that the two plans are, this is this current city ones, right? The current city one. So we look at this one. This is the mission um, in the cities. The strategies are identical. The core values are very similar. And the strategic objectives are, are slightly different. So if you look at the, uh, the, the, and the mission is obviously a little bit different. But I'm going to highlight here, I got another sheet with me that kind of shows the strategic delimiters that uh, was under the previous consultant and the city manager in Brooklyn Park. So if you look at the top here, it says, we will not adopt any new program or service unless it is consistent with our core values and contributes to our missions. The current one, which is a draft, we will not add any new program, project, policy, or service that is not consistent with our core values and aligned to our missions. Identical, right? Uh, we will not allow past practices to interfere with new ideas. Right now, we will not allow past practice to interfere with consideration of new ideas. They had one more in Brooklyn Park. We will not make decisions without soliciting and understanding the points of view of those affected by them. That would be the residents, right, being affected by, by this. But look, out, look at this. We left that one out. Uh, we left out the points of view of Bloomington residents, it looks like. That's kind of saddening to me. Um, so that's, that's a strategic del delimiter. You know? So the next one would be the core values. Now, when I looked at the core values, um, obviously we believe in diversity it enriches our community. If you look down in the 2022, we believe in diversity is embraced, the community is strengthened, right? Very similar in nature, right? A um, little bit of wordsmithing there, or uh, word salad. We believe that trust is the foundation for building a healthy community. We believe that safety and security are critical for a resilient and healthy community, right? So we kind of wordsmith there a little bit again. We believe that when a community supports its members, it thrives. We believe the community thrives when its members share responsibility for its well-being. So that's been wordsmithed a little bit. We believe that everyone has equal intrinsic value, that everyone benefits when there's equal access to opportunity. So those are kind of similar. Uh, we believe community thrives when each individual takes responsibility to contribute. And we believe that transformation will come through collective courage and willingness to take risks. So those core values are, are very, very similar in the, in, the, in the strategic plan. So when you look back at the, the Bloomington strategic plan, um, by 2030, our community members will feel connected to their, their neighbors, welcomed and valued by the community as a whole. And by 2030, the city of Bloomington will achieve significant improvement in the indices measuring the community's environment and individual health. And by 2030, Bloomington will achieve significant improvement in the indices measuring equitable economic growth. Mr. Thule? Yes. Your five minutes are up. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council for item 4.2, our public comment period? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Clark, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, City Council. Belated Happy New Year to you all. Um, I'm here tonight because I'm concerned about our youth in Bloomington. In fact, I'm concerned about a lot of people in Bloomington because of a product that they're consuming. Now, this product is legal. It's enjoyable. A lot of people enjoy it, but it's really bad for their health. I don't take this product. I don't allow my kids to take it. We, we rarely take it in our, in, or use it in our home but it's a product that's, that's at the core of a lot of health problems. And so I think we should just get rid of it. We should pass an ordinance to get rid of this product in the city of Bloomington. And of course, I'm talking about soft drinks, I'm talking about fountain beverages, 
which have high fructose corn syrup. Now, you probably think I'm crazy coming down here asking you to ban the sale of soft drinks in Bloomington, but that's something very similar to what the city of New York did just 10 years ago when they banned the sale of soft drinks in any beverage size larger than 16 ounces. They knew they couldn't get away with banning it outright, but they, they tried to limit the size of the container that people were, were purchasing their, their soft drink in. So you could not purchase anything later than, bigger than 16 ounces. A 20 ounce drink, 24, 32 ounce big gulps were prohibited, but you could buy two 16 ounce big gulps. And that so infuriated the population. And with the micromanagement and the and the, just the, the absurdity of that ordinance, that it came to typify what was known as the nanny state. And the nanny state, as you know, is, is a euphemism or a metaphor for government that micromanages people in an arbitrary and a capricious manner. In fact, those were the words that the state Supreme Court Justice, uh, Milton Tingling, used the very next year when he struck it down and said it was arbitrary and capricious. So now I wish I could say that that would happen in New York City trying to micromanage the size of a container that people could buy soft drinks was uh, just an aberration. It was an outlier. The mayor had a lapse in judgment. He, he, he lost his mind. He, he, he overreached. And despite his uh, well intentions, he decided to pass this ordinance. Um, and I wish I could say that that was an outlier, but it isn't. We see this across the country, and we see that in Bloomington as well. We see overreach, micromanagement, arbitrary and capricious ordinances time after time again here in our city. And what I'm, at, what I'm saying, Mr. Mayor, is that you know, we have a crisis in our city. It's not the ticking time bomb of the finances in this city, the tax and spend, although that'll come back to bite the city at some point. It's not the ticking time bomb in our schools or our service-based economy, the lost opportunities. No, the greatest the greatest crisis that we have in Bloomington today is a crisis of leadership. It's governance. It's governance. And we just had an election here in Bloomington where the population, where the residents sent a very strong message to the city council and to the city. Um, the, the, you know, elections obviously are there to elect leaders, but they're also a way to take the temperature of the public. And the public actually voted for the three council members that won, and congratulations, by the way, the three council members that won that election, more of the residents of Bloomington did not vote for you in the first round than did. That should be a sobering thought. Bloomington is very evenly divided ideologically. It does not give you license to, to govern from an extremist or a radical point of view. And yet that's what you keep doing time and time again. Um, in this political environment, Mayor Coulter has brought up recently that people tend to go to their corners and isolate themselves. Well, I'm, I'm not isolating myself. I'm coming down here and speaking to you. I'm meeting with the chair of the Human Rights Commission this week. I'm meeting with the leadership team at the Mall of America. I'm out talking to business owners who are telling me what the effects are of this latest ban that you did on the flavor tobacco. I'm out there talking to people. So I would invite you as well. You know how to get a hold of me. I'd love to sit down and talk through ways of governing our city in the centrist way that was... Um, put forth in the last election. The city was very clear that the city is balanced when it comes to ideology, and it doesn't pull to one extreme or the other. And if it pulled to the other extreme, I'd be right back here saying the same thing. So you know how to get a hold of me. I'd love to talk to you over a fountain beverage. I'd love to sit down and talk about ways how we can protect our youth and protect the rights of our parents at the same time, how we can protect youth from having access to flavored tobacco and the rights of adults to purchase a product that's legal, it's enjoyable, not to me, but I'm going to fight for their right to consume it. Um, find ways to protect kids in our parks without banning photography, which is a clear violation of the First Amendment. And so I would love to have that, that dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Anyone else wishing to speak to item 4.2? Items not on tonight's agenda? Riza, do we have anyone who has joined us on the phone who would like to speak to item 4.2? Owen wants to speak at the moment. Please continue. Thank you. Seeing no one coming forward, we will close tonight's public comment period, and we will move on in our agenda. We move on to item 5, which is our introductory items, and the first item is a proclamation for Black History Month. 
second. Let me come down to the front here. So uh, each year, of course, February is dedicated to Black History Month in the United States, and our Bloomington Human Rights Commission has requested once again that we issue a proclamation in honor of Black History Month here in Bloomington. The 2022 theme of Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness, and it highlights the contributions of black healthcare workers to the nation's healthcare system, as well as emphasizes the disparities in access to quality healthcare for black Americans and other minorities. So our proclamation tonight. City of Bloomington Proclamation for Black History Month, February 2022. Whereas, during Black History Month, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by black Americans to our nation's economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. And whereas, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, initiated Black History Week in 1926, during the second week of February, to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, as a way of highlighting the involvement and accomplishments of black Americans in the development of our nation's democracy. And whereas, as part of the nation's bicentennial, Black History Week was expanded to Black History Month in 1976. And whereas observing Black History Month provides us with an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of black history in the United States and to acknowledge the centuries of struggles for equality and freedom, as well as the achievements and successes. And whereas the annual Bloomington Pioneers and Changemakers Profile Series highlights local black leaders who have worked to advance civil rights and remove barriers to racial equity. And whereas these profiles are shared via the city's print and digital publications and honorees will be acknowledged during the February 28th City Council meeting. And now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim February 2022 as Black History Month in the city of Bloomington. And I urge all residents to celebrate the culture and contributions of black Americans and to commit to creating a world that is more just, peaceful, and prosperous for all. Dated the 7th day of February, 2022, signed by the Mayor Tim Bussey. So, uh, first of all, appreciate once again the, uh, uh, the bringing forward of this by our, uh, our Human Rights Commission that we want to once again make this proclamation. And secondly, hats off to our uh, Bloomington Communications staff and all of our staff working on the Bloomington Pioneers and, and Changemakers Profile Series, which if you have a chance, be sure to take a look at it because there's a lot of interesting and um, uh, very telling highlights of uh, leaders in the community here in the city of Bloomington. Uh, definitely worthwhile, and as I read, uh, we will be acknowledging those folks on February 28th here at the city council meeting. So, thank you all so very much. This is our Black History Month proclamation. Item 5.2 tonight is introduction of new employees. We've been doing this on a regular basis now, trying to make sure that we introduce our new employees, not only to the council, but to the members of the public, especially for folks who are gonna be interacting with the public. Uh, Mr. Sable, you're gonna help us out, kick this off tonight? Uh, I am, Mr. Mayor and council members. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce two new staff to the Human Resources Department. Uh, the first is, is Matthew Schultz. Matthew is a, a Bloomington resident and a recent graduate of the University of St. Thomas. Uh, he has, uh, Worked in a number of roles and positions in HR, including one at Toro and uh, at KDV, which is a, a partner of the city prior to this. Um, he has a background not only in a degree in HR, but also an affinity for linking technology and data. And uh, um, it was interesting, um, one of his references uh, highlighted his professionalism and keen intellect. And so both uh, really wonderful qualities. And so uh, we are excited to have him on board. And Matthew, would you uh, like to say a few words? Yeah, I, I was born and raised in Bloomington, so I'm really grateful to be working for the city that that I love so much. Um, and Mike highlighted a few aspects of my career where I started um, in IT and then moved into HR. Um, I love trying to be as innovative as possible to make sure to be as effective in my work and, you know, working for the city to make sure it's effective for the employees and also for the residents of Bloomington. Well, welcome aboard, uh, Matthew. Appreciate you having uh, you being with us tonight, and uh, and with the city in general. 
and I think this is a good example of why we do this, because I have seen you in the office, and I haven't had a chance to come and say hello to you. So now this is the introduction over, uh, over the, uh, the screen, but now next time uh, I see you, and if you see me first, uh, please do grab me. I'd like to meet you in person, face to face. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, it's also uh, my pleasure to introduce Nancy Steele. Nancy Steele joined the Human Resources team in November of this uh, past year. She has a master's in public administration from Metro State University and is a Society of Human Resource Managers certified, sorry, senior certified professional. Uh, a lot of acronyms there. But Nancy had previously worked for the city of Minneapolis, supporting the convention center for the past eight years, focusing on HR functions of leadership development, recruitment, hiring, facilitating training, employee events, developing strategic plans, and in programs to in increase employee engagement. She was also on the board for the Employee Resource Group for Women, co-chair of the City of Minneapolis Recognition Committee, and on the Racial Equity Committee. Uh, and she supports our community services, parks, police, fire, and admin department. Uh, and I will also say she's a founding member of the city's uh, administrative uh, race equity action team, uh, which is really trying to drive organizational change uh, in the organization. And we're excited for Nancy to join us. And I will also note a recent Bloomington resident. Nancy, if you'd say a few words. Thank you for that introduction. Mayor, council members, thanks for having me this evening. It's great to meet all of you. And it's great to be working for the city of Bloomington. I started just the end of um, November and I've really learned that it's such a great organization that's focused on learning and a really good cultural fit for myself. Um, I'm highly motivated by being a Bloomington resident and serving the community where I reside. I think our biggest assets are our employees and the better they're supported and hiring the right people provides an opportunity for us to better serve residents. Well, thank you for being with us tonight, Nancy. Uh, glad to have you on board and uh, more to come from the convention center of the city. That's That's gotta be a big change because that's a big operation that they have with the convention center in Minneapolis. Yes, I'm fortunate that it makes it a little bit more clear understanding for parks and recs department and also quite a bit of learning for some of the other departments that I support, but they've all been really great letting me ask all of my questions and sit side by side with them in some cases. Well, welcome aboard, and thank you for your work. Thanks for moving to Bloomington. We're always happy to have uh, have you moving to Bloomington, and uh, thanks for your your work, uh, especially with the with the racial equity teams that you're working on. Thank you so very much for that. So, thank you. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Thanks much. Thank you, Mr. Sable. Appreciate it. We will move on to item six on our agenda, which is our consent agenda tonight. Council Member Martin, I believe you have the consent agenda. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, at this point, I have not heard of any holds other than 6.4, but I'll go, out, uh, go ahead and put up another call for those. Okay, doke. Uh, seeing no additional, uh, I will move approval of items 6.1 through 3 and 6.5 through 14. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, a second by Councilmember Carter to accept tonight's consent agenda as stated. Hearing no further discussion, Mr. Brillert. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Item 6.4, Councilmember Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to take a second and highlight some uh, really tremendous generosity from uh, Bloomington residents. Uh, in particular, supporting uh, our animal control. We got a substantial contribution for uh, all of that work. Additionally, we got a couple of very generous contributions in support of the canine unit over at BPD. Uh, and we also got a very, very generous donation um, from Rosemary Townsend for our officer wellness program uh, that is going to go a long, long way towards making sure that uh, our officers are equipped and ready to go, uh, especially considering how stressful uh, that job can be. So just, uh, again, a, a huge thank you to everybody that contributed. Um, and I will go ahead uh, and motion uh, to accept the donations as listed. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, a second by Councilmember Carter to accept item 6.4. Council, any questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, if, uh, if Chief Hartley is willing to, I'd be thrilled to hear a little bit more about how we're going to use the generous donation that we got around wellness. I'm excited to hear about how we can support our officers. So if you have anything you can share with us, that would be great. 
Sure. Well, good evening. Good evening, Chief Friendly. Members of the council, council member D'Alessandro. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have the support of this community behind us. Um, this was a, a contact that we made uh, several years ago when we were in the early stages of creating our current officer wellness program, one that focuses uh, not just on the physical parts of the job, but also mental as well. Um, you know, and I'm going to give a shameless plug to my department whenever I can, but uh, they were in the last years of Mr. Townsend's life. Uh, the police were called several times on medicals there, and they were always impressed with the work that the men and women who responded, the compassion, the empathy they showed. And so as a way to say thank you, um, they approached us and said, look, we would like to make a contribution. Uh, how can you take and utilize this money? And it has been pivotal in uh, kicking off our checkup from the neck up program. And um, it continues to be a, a main source for keeping that program going. And we couldn't be more than, uh, we're, we're, I'm so thankful on behalf of the city, the police department, um, to the generosity of this family. Um, with that, I know that's a sizable donation, but I also wanna, as long as I'm up here, uh, again, thank publicly the other people that uh, may not have that kind of money, but still uh, dig into their pockets at a time where we're, we're all looking for a little extra and, and donate to the police department to help out the animal shelter, to help out the canine unit. So again, uh, to the public who, who, who supports this police department, thank you. Thank you, Chief Hartley. Council member, any further questions? Very good. We do have a motion by council member Martin and a second by council member Carter to accept item 6.4 on our consent agenda. No further council questions? Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item 7, which is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And as I said tonight, we've got five items under this heading. And our first is item 7.1, which is a public hearing regarding a high density motor vehicle redevelopment. And we're looking to re-guide, rezone, uh, do a preliminary and final development plan at Platt. And that of course is located at 7851 Normandale Boulevard. Nick Johnson from our planning department is gonna lead us through this. Mr. Johnson, good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Um, the application before you this evening was put forth by uh, United Properties uh, Development. <clears throat> Um, they've certainly done some work in uh, Bloomington community in the past, and you're familiar with some of those players. Um, I would say that they're submitting this application on behalf of a uh, major electrical ve uh, electric vehicle manufacturer and dealer. Um, just to note that the, the application materials themselves did not include uh, who that party is. Um, they're not required to by city code, uh, but just a, a note about that. But yes, you're correct. There are multiple actions uh, associated with this application. <clears throat> Here is a outline of the various applications that they're seeking, including the reguiding, rezoning, uh, the development plans, and then a plat action. Property that you referenced is located in the northwest portion of Bloomington, just in the, the northeast quadrant there of the 494 Highway 100 uh, interchange. Many of you are familiar with it. It's the former site of the Days Inn Hotel, uh, which has since been uh, demolished. Um, in terms of access and um, uh, kind of roadway configuration in this area, they do have access to Normandale Boulevard, which is an arterial road. Um, and this site is a quarter mile away from West 77th Street uh, on ramp to Highway 100. So this site is highly visible, <clears throat> excuse me, and has excellent access uh, in terms of uh, the ability to get here uh, easily. There is a, uh, I, th I think I mentioned it maybe, that there is a wetland on the so southern portion of this site, just to note that that is a uh, historic wetland that falls under the WACAR Wetland Conservation Act criteria. Uh, so this project does have to require uh, or provide required buffering to that. <clears throat> in terms of background, I mentioned that it was this, the Days Inn Hotel site, it's now vacant. Um, the city council took action on a privately initiated city code amendment that was submitted by United Properties in uh, November of 2021, and it created this new land use designation in our zoning code uh, known as motor vehicle sales high density. So this is the first uh, of these developments um, uh, put forth here. 
Uh, so a little bit of a, a landmark development in that respect, and that it is the, the, the first of this kind. Um, in terms of the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning action, you know, there's a lot of the same uh, criteria or considerations uh, to think about when it, with respect to a, a reguiding and a rezoning. Uh, in this case, they're proposing to reguide the subject property to the regional commercial designation. That's necessary because that's the only designation in the comp plan uh, that allows motor vehicle sales. Um, so that just a, a note about that. Um, in terms of the, the criteria that both of these uh, actions call for, you know, the, the regional commercial and both uh, that and the C3 zoning district, both of these zoning districts envision uh, highly visible sites with uh, quite a bit of intensity um, and excellent access to freeways uh, and arterial collector roads. So this site checks all that locational criteria. Um, in terms of the comp plan action, you would want to look at what, uh, in terms of how the project is uh, either meeting or not meeting various uh, goals within the city's comprehensive plan. In this case, this project is uh, helping to grow and diversify the local economy, uh, as well as citing uh, a development in an appropriate location in terms of using land use control. So this site does, uh, um, in the judgment of the Planning Commission and staff, uh, does meet the goals of the city's comprehensive plan. Um, another consideration, too, with respect to the rezoning action is that the, the site is currently zoned CS1. You know, this is a, a highly visible site, as I mentioned, and the CS1 zoning district, it's one of our older zoning districts. Uh, it currently does not have a minimum uh, floor area ratio, which is the, a standard measure of commercial or industrial uh, development intensity. Um, so, you know, it, it, removing this uh, property to a zoning district that does have minimum FARs uh, has that side benefit added to it. Uh, irrespective of um, uh, this development. Of course, they're rezoning it for this development, uh, but just to note that point about kind of the difference between some of our older zoning districts and our newer districts as we transition away from some of them. So uh, planning commission and staff are both uh, supportive of these actions. Um, like I said, it's not uh, like similar actions where you have specific findings that have to be met, but more so you would just look to a public benefits analysis associated with these actions and the development before you. And uh, in this case, it really uh, has to do with uh, the tremendous building value being offered here, um, uh, as well as uh, addition of uh, employment. I think uh, the United Properties mentioned 60 additional jobs associated with this uh, project. So those are the criteria. Um, Planning Commission and staff uh, are recommending approval of those actions. Getting to the site plan itself, the uh, four-story structure, it's a four-story building, 180,000 uh, uh, square feet in gross floor area. Uh, the structure will be located in the middle of the site. Uh, they have circulation uh, all the way around the building uh, with some surface parking areas uh, to the north and around uh, the south and west of the building. That's kind of uh, the main uh, retail uh, component uh, parking would be to the west um, by that main entrance there. Um, just to note, there are some existing uh, access and uh, shared parking easements with some of the sites to the north as well as to the east. Some of those conditions will continue. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some correspondence we received from a neighboring property owner as it pertains to, to access uh, in a later slide. Um, but the design before you in terms of the site plan is meant to honor or uh, provide those where it is appropriate or necessary, but they're providing the required circulation for um, fire and other emergency vehicles. Um, other things to consider, they are providing a sidewalk connection out to West, uh, out to Normandale Boulevard. Um, so that's ex certainly a positive. The city council does have the authority to waive sidewalk construction along public ways uh, when there's no sidewalk network in the area to connect to. So that is one of the uh, aspects of this application they are requesting. Um, as you can see on the screen, that wetland uh, is kind of hugs uh, Normandale Boulevard. Um, uh, and there's a little bit larger boulevard area there, but there's some great issues as well. So uh, constructing a sidewalk when it would not construct or not connect to other public uh, sidewalk in the area, uh, given the, in addition to the combination of this wetland in this area, staff uh, uh, thought it made sense to defer uh, the, con the construction of sidewalk along that, but they still are providing a sidewalk connection, uh, which may come valuable uh, uh, for to the north uh, at a later date, so that's positive. Um, the other aspects of this site plan, they're providing uh, a code compliant amount of parking. Per the definition of this use, they're limited on the amount of out, uh, uh, outside automobile inventory that they can provide 30 cars. 
um, can be outside. And so they have a pretty good uh, quantity of parking as it pertains to uh, meeting the code, but also having a little bit extra for uh, autom automobile inventory. Um, previously at the Planning Commission, they were requesting a deviation as it pertains to a stormwater pond setback here in the northwest portion of the site, but they have since provided an updated grading plan uh, showing that they no longer uh, are requesting that deviation. So just a heads up in that regard. Um, in terms of the building design, this is, these are some elevation uh, renderings and drawings provided by the architect. Uh, the building materials that they're providing are, uh, for the most part, metal panel and architectural concrete. And certainly you have a, a large amount of glazing and glass on the west side of the building, which is the primary uh, elevation. So all those materials, as long as they meet certain uh, standards in our code and policies, uh, are code compliant materials. Get into the floor plan itself, uh, you can see kind of the first floor broken down uh, by use on the west and north is to the left on this uh, diagram, but on the front side of the facility, it's more the showroom and lounge area with some offices. And then the, the majority of the first level has to do with the repair use. Uh, there's some part storage and there's some detailing wash areas on the north side of the building that just gives you a breakdown. And then levels two through four is all enclosed automobile uh, inventory storage. Getting to back to that definition uh, that you adopted in November, uh, there are some pretty um, strict or limiting uh, criteria that you had to meet in order to be qualified as one of these uses. And I just wanted to touch on the fact uh, that this facility is checking all of those boxes uh, with respect to it being fully enclosed, meeting the FAR requirements. Um, uh, in terms of limiting outdoor display, we do have a condition about that, um, uh, the amount of vehicle repair and overhead service stores. So I just want to circle back with the council that um, the definition that was developed for this uh, project, uh, they are meeting that criteria. I'm going to go one slide back. One thing I forgot to mention about the floor plan is that the only other uh, deviation associated with this project is they are requesting a very modest increase in floor area ratio above the maximum in the C3 district. Uh, the FAR of the C3 district maximum is 1.0, and this is a 3% increase to 1.03, so it's very modest. It equates to about 5,000 square feet of floor area, um, but it, it's just requested to provide a uniform uh, building footprint. Um, it just slightly went over on that fourth story. Just to note that, um, you know, one, one of the points about a conversation at the Planning Commission, we may have talked to this about council as well, is uh, in terms of whether to make this a conditional use or not. And that hasn't been the approach with uh, motor vehicle sales. And the reason for that is that we, the city has developed uh, a fair amount of operational uh, performance standards for this use. Um, so the city has existing performance standards uh, for all of these bullet items on the screen before you um, that really do a good job of trying to uh, kind of weed out uh, nuisance characteristics that can occur from motor vehicle sales um, with, uh, you know, not as great operators in some cases. So just a heads up about that. The plat itself is very simple. It is just uh, platting a meets and bounds parcel um, uh, to a platted lot with the same lot boundaries. So there's no changes uh, in the lot boundaries. Um, in terms of public correspondence, we did notify all of the adjacent jurisdictions, which is standard practice for the comprehensive plan amendment. We have not received any uh, concerns from the 16 jurisdictions that have responded to date. Uh, MnDOT provided us a comment letter which uh, just had to do with some of their ongoing work as it pertained to future uh, 494 uh, um, uh, projects and they did note that the development is not anticipated to impact any of their uh, future plans and just to note that any work in MnDOT right away would require a permit. And then we did receive a letter and subsequent email from the adjacent landowner to the north on the screen. On the right side, I have this uh, area outlined in the red. As I mentioned at the site plan, they have a shared access right now currently with that property. The current owner of that property bought that property and that was an existing condition at the time that he bought it. And so United Properties designed that in just to maintain the existing condition uh, as it were. And uh, that owner would no longer like to have that shared access. Um, and United Properties is fully supportive of that. They have no problem with that. Um, and the reason being is it's not access that is needed for their site. They were simply uh, maintaining a condition. However, that being said, there are some existing utilities that run through there uh, that serve uh, this property. And so um, they're working with the owner to extinguish the access aspect of the um, easement, but maintain the utility 
um, uh, aspect. So uh, from all the correspondence I've seen between the two parties, I think they're working it out privately, um, and that certainly suits us just fine. Um, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on January the 6th. Uh, one person spoke at the meeting. They were um, uh, more supportive of a previous development effort that was taking place at this site that unfortunately didn't come to fruition with respect to a uh, medical office. Um, but this is the project before you this evening, uh, and it does have uh, Planning Commission uh, and staff support. Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval uh, with a 6-0 vote back in January. So I'm happy to take any questions. There's actually five uh, recommended motions, um, uh, but hopefully, and I, I did not bring up a few other uh, slides that we typically do, um, but for the most part, the majority, the vast majority of this project is code compliant. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Johnson. Appreciate it. Council questions. Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, with regards to that easement with the neighbor that originally had concerns, but it sounds like it's being uh, worked out. Um, I noted that in the conditions, we didn't require that that is worked out. It was more suggested that they work that out. Should we be looking at a condition that requires them to come to some arrangement for that ingress and egress through that property so that something didn't fall apart there and then that still exists? Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Mayor Bussey, Council Member Nelson, thanks for that question. That's certainly a fair question. Uh, I certainly would welcome the city attorney's perspective as well, uh, not to call on her, but um, from my perspective, that's a civil matter. The development is not reliant upon uh, that access easement. Certainly it does have uh, utilities that are, are relevant. Um, and so I think it was at this point in time, the, the property owner's prerogative to kind of flag it as a concern of theirs that, you know, this is an opportunity or this site is being redeveloped and we don't uh, want this access. Um, but uh, from, from planning staff's perspective, it's a civil matter. It's not needed for the success or uh, performance of the development before you. Um, that being said, I understand why it would be of question. I would also encourage that uh, United Properties um, have the opportunity to, to speak to it because perhaps they have an update on that uh, front that I'm not aware of. I know that we do have uh, Mr. Strom from United Properties with us this evening. Yeah, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, evening. members of the council. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. We we continue to have conversations with uh, the adjacent property owner as of recent, uh, recently as of uh, the last couple of days here. So, you know, I think we're both working in, in good faith to uh, move that, you know, move the easement issue forward and uh, remove the access easement per uh, Mr. Larson's request, uh, but reserve a utility easement across the property. So, both of our legal teams are connected. I think we're aligned. He supports it and has given us direction to proceed with drafting a, a, a new easement over his property. Okay. As, yeah, it, but, you know, obviously I just want to make sure that ends up actually happening and um, that sort of thing. So uh, whatever staff recommends to do that. Um, my next question is um, kind of a multiple points, but how does this integrate? Because I believe Edina is just to the north of that. How does it integrate with their plans, their comp plan, their uh, zoning, that type of thing? There was some discussion of sidewalks and, uh, you know, how would those connect into it? I, I know that's probably not too far from the Nine Mile Creek uh, Trail uh, bikeway, that type of stuff. And I think, uh, Mr. Johnson, you mentioned that there was a kind of a deferred plan to do some of that. So just trying to make sure that this integrates um, because this probably would not be, uh, this may or may not be great next to residential. I think that was in our comments, but what is the plan for residential on the Edina side of it? And is it compatible with what they're thinking about doing there? So I guess those are my two points, the residential in particular in Edina, and the sidewalk trail network in connection with Edina. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, Mayor, thank you for the second question, Councilmember Nelson. Um, the, with respect to uh, the city of Dinah's kind of planning and zoning around this broader area, they certainly have taken a more uh, mixed use approach. So there is some residential development, uh, high density multifamily uh, that is being 
uh, incorporated into some of these areas north of Viking Drive and along with 77th. Um, so that uh, certainly is a factor um, with respect to how it integrates, uh, you know, this use. This use integrates very well with some of the existing uses that occur on the Bloomington side uh, of the jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, how land uses occur between jurisdictions certainly is going to be an ongoing uh, conversation with the city of Edina. Uh, I guess the one thing I would say is that they didn't uh, voice any concern with respect to our comprehensive plan amendments, so they did have access to these plans. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that some of those operational uh, performance standards that Bloomington has adopted uh, with respect to motor vehicle sales are specifically intended to make these uses uh, less of a nuisance or more compatible with uh, residential uses. So there are limitations about um, you know, when they can do, for example, loading and unloading of uh, automobile inventory, which tends to be a noisy operation, or, you know, where uh, test driving can occur, or, you know, the use of panic alarms and other noise kind of uh, issues. So those things are in place here, regardless of what um, Edina is doing. They are certainly doing some of that. What I was mentioning on the sidewalk, I can annotate on the screen here a little bit, is that uh, um, this is the old aerial, obviously, with the days in, but if they provide a sidewalk connection to their building here, um, I think at some point where there is value for sidewalks in this area, if, if Edina is moving forward with more of their residential and uh, mixed use, though there certainly could be some opportunities for commercial and retail and other services that you could access. Um, I think the most valuable connection will actually be over here to the north, um, uh, both to Viking and ultimately to West, uh, West 77th Street. Those don't fully exist yet today. Um, but in terms of where the more important uh, connection for sidewalks are for this area in the future, it's probably to the north and to the east, not to the south and to the west, uh, if that makes sense, where the wetland uh, creates a little bit more of a headache. So the deferment runs along uh, Normandale, um, but we're happy that they're providing that connection to the northwest because we think ultimately that's where it's going to be of greater value. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate the answers. You bet. Anything else, Councilmember Nelson? Councilmember Lowman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, Nick, uh, we're so with this, we're changing the um, uh, the zoning um, from one zoning code to another, and I'm kind of looking at you know that we've got this wetland that's there, and when it, when you look at uh, you know auto repair generally. Um, any concerns at all in terms of what that could mean long term? Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, no concerns from staff. You know, with the current uh, tenant, you know, that, that would uh, use that. I'm, I'm assuming that there isn't any concern. And then, are there any protections from a long term perspective if that change in use with respect from moving from uh, the zoning code that we had to what we have? You know, or, you know, we'd be able to utilize with this regional. Uh, uh, piece here. So I'm just kind of asking the long term question in terms of uh, if the use were to change there, can there be additional protection uh, for uh, that wetland area? <clears throat> Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Lohman, thanks for the question about the wetland. Uh, the the protections around the wetland uh, with respect to the new use um, are the same regardless of what zoning district this site is, as well as what land use ultimately gets developed. And the reason being is that it's governed by Wetland Conservation Act and the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District rules. So they have to meet minimum uh, um, wetland buffers, both minimums and averages is kind of how it's done. No, no less than 20 and typically an average of 40, depending on the type of wetland that it is. And so often what we see with stormwater management issues is that redevelopment in some respects can be a positive because in some, in some sites, uh, the existing condition isn't meeting current rules or isn't doesn't have the best practices per se um, uh, as it pertains to stormwater volume and treatment and rate and all those things. So um, they have to meet those buffer requirements with this new development. Um, our water resource staff does not have concern about the use in terms of, you know, the auto repair or that type of use, that aspect of this use. Um, you know, they have to have waste traps and they have to have procedures and practices that deal with uh, that kind of thing. I would mention as well that I think that because uh, because this is an electric vehicle uh, manufacturer and dealer, it probably has less um, waste and concern that could be detrimental to um, uh, a water body like this one. But um, no, the wetland buffering should uh, adequately protect that body. 
for sure. So in other words, we're doing all we can in terms of that respect uh, to be able to protect that wetland. Uh, that, that's what I'm hearing you, you say. Yeah, Nine Mile Creek won't issue a permit without it. And they have to enter into a maintenance plan, too, so that those uh, vegetated areas that basically serve as a filter. And before the water even gets to the water body, it's going to go through other pretreatment ponds, um, which is another thing to think about is that, you know, some of the stormwater on this site leaches, or I shouldn't use that term, but uh, flows towards this uh, pond um, uh, without very, uh, you know, good stormwater management practices. So that's why in some cases redevelopment can be a, a positive thing for a site like this and for that wetland. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Council, additional questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for following up on my questions about the, land, uh, the uh, wetlands as well earlier today. Um, I did have one follow-up question, but I think you might have answered it, so I'm just going to ask a clarification instead. Um, the uh, the follow-up that you re replied to that says uh, there's you know an audit and a management of that of that um, of that wetland property uh, is that done by us as a city item or is that done by Nine Mile Creek or how how does that actually work if you know? Mr. Johnson, Mayor, thank you. Nice, yep, Councilmember Del Center, nice to meet you. Um, the I don't know how routine or how active Nine Mile Creek is in their inspections, but what I do know is that they have to enter into a, they have to enter into maintenance agreements both with Nine Mile Creek and with uh, City of Bloomington. I do know on uh, Bloomington Water Resource staff, I don't believe, and I don't want to speak for um, engineering, but I but I don't believe that they have every site or new facility on a uh, say like an annual inspection what they do is that they get notified of if there is a stormwater management problem happening at a particular site if they receive notification or if they encounter it just while they're out and about in the community or if they uh, discover it one way or another that is when they go uh, and implement uh, or enforce against the maintenance plan that those property owners um, uh, did record against the property um, so that's generally how it works. It's not a, uh, it's not on a time basis, but it's more on reacting to uh, conditions that uh, call for action. Any further questions, council member? You're good. Thank you. So, Mr. Johnson, I have a question, just kind of a, a broader context question, uh, hoping that you can kind of fill in some blanks for me. So, in your discussions with United Properties. Uh, did, did, did you discuss what this property is and could be and should be? And I ask it from this perspective. I mean, this is, this is an important entryway into the city of Bloomington, and uh, it's a very highly visible intersection at 100 Normandale Boulevard. And redevelopment was obviously absolutely necessary, and God knows we lived with the days in for decades. Uh, but was there consideration or discussion with United Properties about something other than a, a car dealership on this site? Yeah, Mayor Bussey, uh, thanks for the question. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question, uh, but I'll take a stab from being around uh, the process generally uh, in that um, they, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that there was the potential for a uh, medical office uh, to be seen as a potential use here. And I think that United in uh, consultation with our uh, Bloomington HRA staff, the Bloomington HRA um, is the one who has been working with United in terms of looking at different uh, development ideas and potential. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, um, happened with respect to the medical office use is a couple things happened is one is the um, the pandemic greatly shook uh, a lot of the um, kind of medical uh, market um, in terms of their finances and ability and, and, and some other things. And I think ultimately the user they were looking at uh, just either selected a different site or hit the pause button. Uh, I don't fully recall. Um, but another thing, too, is that I believe that, uh, you know, some of it has to do with also uh, aspects of softening suburban office market. You know, I, I, we would love to be delivering a... Um, uh, I shouldn't say we, it would be, I think, a, a big win for the city if you were looking at something along the lines of a office tower. Suburban office towers are um, becoming exceedingly more difficult uh, to, to develop in uh, suburban communities um, for a variety of reasons, just market trends in that respect. Um, so I think that's another consideration. 
And another consideration too is I think it also has to do with um, with respect to um, you know what what would the city be willing to um, support financially with respect to um, certain economic development incentives. And uh, I guess what I would say and um, is that I know that this project does not come to you with any of that public uh, you know devices or strategies or supports. Um, it's a market rate uh, project. So I think that's some of the thought process that went into it. I, again, I'm not, I wasn't fully involved in all of those discussions, but that's what I can offer from being in the, in the, the next door room, if you will. All, all good points, uh, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate that. Mr. Strom, anything to, to add to Mr. Johnson's points? Uh, yeah, I think it, <clears throat> Keith Alstead, uh, I think, is on the call, our, our senior uh, developer here on the team who's been with this project since its inception uh, many years ago before we sold it to the HRA. So if uh, Nick, Nick encapsulated most of, of my thoughts, but Keith, if you're on, uh, if you have anything else to add, I'd welcome that. Mr. Elstead, are you with us? I am, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Welcome. Staff, um, thanks for having us this evening, too. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank uh, Nick. I think he's done a very thorough uh, presentation here on our behalf and uh, not a lot to add. I guess the one thing, uh, your, your question's a good one. I mean, we, we got into this property with the HRA uh, six years ago now, and you know, our, our, uh, the bullseye at the time, our, our objective for pursuing it was uh, for a medical office development in response to a, uh, an RFP from a big health system. Um, things kind of gradually kind of unraveled uh, one thread at a time since then, a nurse's strike, um, a change in direction of uh, um, some, you know, the, the, the C-suite at that uh, uh, that health uh, uh, concern, and then you know, COVID hits, and and we decided to go, you know, multi-tenant instead of um, one big tenant, and you know, ran into several stumbling blocks there. You know, we'd get we'd get users that were ex excited about the site, and then said, "Well, we really can't, we really can't commit because we don't know what the future looks like. Are we going to have to have individual waiting rooms instead of group waiting rooms? Are we going to have to make sure that?" You know, incoming patients don't cross paths with outgoing patients. The list just kept growing and growing, and growing, and and and, and frankly, um, um, you know, it, as Nick kind of touched on, you know, this the 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 peer office, not medical office, is 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 not viable at this location. Uh, won't be for the foreseeable future. Um, medical uh, is not immediate, and you know. We we even entertained for a while a a, a multifamily component, and you know it, we kind of came to the conclusion after um, doing a lot of searching at, in the market and uh, at what works and what doesn't that that housing you know doesn't want to be at the intersection of two freeways. It wants to be near them. It wants to be in a. It wants to have access to them, but it doesn't want to be parked on it and not have walk you know listen to freeway noise and and look at freeway views and um frankly um you know we have come to uh, while we consider this a win it it is been a little bit of a process of elimination over a long period of time and as uh as staff pointed out we've we've kind of changed our ask here when this was medical office or uh you know we had a we had a pretty big uh uh, TIF component in there to make it all work. Um, this is not that. Uh, we're we're trying to kind of comply with all the constraints of the of the site and the city's um, um, prerogatives as far as you know density and and operational standards. But we're not asking for um, um, city participation because we understand that that this has to stand on its own. So it's uh, maybe a more long-winded answer than you wanted, but. Uh, we are where we are because this is what we think uh, the site will support and will make work and we can actually uh, achieve in the next, um, you know, through the next business cycle. I appreciate the insight, Mr. Olstead. I really do. And, and I want to be clear, I mean, you said you consider this a win. I think we all consider this a win, especially in light of what it's replacing on that very important corner here in Bloomington. So. 
uh, don't don't take my comments as is any way derogatory toward what you're bringing forward. I do think I'm I'm excited about this and uh, looking forward to seeing this move forward. Um, I guess my other big concern is that normally, typically on the north side of 494, people think that's Edina. So if we could have the big sign say, you know, major electric vehicle producer of Bloomington, if you could work on that for us, um, it would be a good thing. Just something to think about. Good idea. We're on it. <laughs> I didn't hear a lot of enthusiasm there. but. <laughs> <laughs> Council, any additional questions? Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, Mayor, I'm just wondering if we can make that a condition. <laughs> I think uh, Ms. Mandershad just spilled her coffee when she heard that, so I don't know if we can do that. Council, questions? I do not see any additional hands up. So what I would like to do now is open the public hearing. This is a public hearing on item 7.1, and I would like to open it now. This is a public hearing on a high-density motor vehicle redevelopment. We're considering re-guide, rezone, a preliminary and final development plan, and the plat for 7851 Normandale Boulevard. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak on item 7.1 as part of the public hearing? I see no one coming forward. Riza, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.1, part of the public hearing? No. No one is on the line. Please continue. Last call for anybody in the chambers. Seeing no one coming forward, Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 7.1. So moved. So moved. Got a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro and a second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 7.1. No further council discussion, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Council discussion on this. Uh, as I said, the question that I brought forward to Mr. Uh, Olstead uh, and Mr. Strom was in no way diminishing my enthusiasm for this project. I want to be clear about this. This is uh, a, an absolute upgrade to what was there, and I think uh, Mr. Olstead said it very well. This is, I think, from a process of elimination, which you could easily follow the, the logic that he followed, this is where they ended up, and I think it is going to be uh, an outstanding addition to the uh, city of Bloomington and, and enthusiastic about it and um, very supportive of what we're seeing here. Councilmember Nelson, and then Councilmember Carter. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I. I support this based on the information that we've been provided here. I do have uh, just one question for staff. I know the HRA has been involved in this, and if I could just get a refresher on what our involvement was and what the impact this will have to city finances, um, I would appreciate that. Mr. Johnson, are you able to answer that? Oh boy, I'd, I'd, uh, I don't know if I'd serve you well on that uh, effort, Councilmember Nelson or Mayor Bussey. I, I should probably pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to Mr. Verbrugge. Any, any insights, Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm kind of with Nick on this one, Councilmember Nelson. I'm sorry, you're right. We have historically been involved in this parcel. I don't have the details of the, uh, of the participation that we've had uh, over the last couple of years. So. Uh, if it's something that you, you think is pertinent to the action being taken tonight, um, you know, we could either try to get that or we could uh, hold this item for a week. Otherwise, we'll follow up and uh, report to council and, and let you know. I saw Mr. Markegaard jump on as well. Mr. Markegaard, do you have an answer for us on this? Sure, Mayor Busey, council members, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I, I have a little knowledge and uh, I'll talk about that, but uh, basically the HRA acquired ownership of the property. They're still legally the owner and they had an agreement uh, with United Properties uh, for redevelopment. And uh, Mr. Allstead talked about kind of the history of that, how it's evolved uh, from medical office to this use. As I understand it, the property would change hands. There would be a sale of the property at market rates and uh, no financial participation in the new uh, land use. So that's kind of the extent of my knowledge on it. And I think 
Mayor, from my standpoint, that satisfies me. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't um, some write down or something like that that was anticipated in this. It sounds like they're buying it back, which was my understanding of the original agreement at um, uh, at least what we paid for it or market rates. And then um, we're not using TIF or anything else to support it. So um, honestly, I think it's a good spot for a car dealership given the confluence of two um, freeways there. We know that we have a number of uh, locations along 494 that on both the Bloomington side and I think primarily the Richfield side that have uh, these types of locations on there and excited about a, a electric car dealership there. So um, that's, I just want to make sure that we were kind of getting our money back. Cause I know that's why we took mayor. You mentioned the issues that were at the days at days in there. And uh, I'm glad to see that go away and something much, much better come along. Absolutely. And I see that, uh, our HRA administrator, Eric Coleman, is on as well. Um, Ms. Coleman, can you add anything to this? Or maybe I spoke out of turn. Maybe she's not on. Uh, well, council member, if, if you're, if you're. She is, I think we're trying to get her promoted up into the presentation. Got it. Okay. Why don't we move on to council member carter's questions and if we need to we'll double back to this council member carter thank you mayor i don't have any questions i just have some comments um so some of you may recall that i was actually not supportive of adding the allowance for high density motor vehicles um, when we took this vote back in december was it um because i just in general didn't want to see more car dealerships in the city um, but I have to say that I am very excited about the fact um, that this is an electric vehicle dealership from a sustainability standpoint. Um, and then, as was mentioned, you know, when I look at this site at the intersection of two major roadways, um, and as Mr. Olstead mentioned earlier, I don't think it's a good spot for residential. Um, when you look at the current surrounding properties, um, when you think about the fact that electric cars are going to only continue to become a bigger part of our reality, um, good jobs, no public dollars, no residential impacts. Um, I mean, I just, I can't find a reason why I wouldn't want to be supportive of this. So um, I just wanted to share those comments and ensure that I'm very excited. Thank you, Council Member. I think I saw Council Member Coulter with his hand Mr. up. Mr. Mayor and Council yeah. Members, uh, if I can just jump back in between, uh, between our HRA administrator and our CFO, uh, they confirm the previous comments. So, so we have a lease revenue bond on this property. Uh, this would cap out the bonds and there is no write down involved in the project. Very good. Thank you for that clarification. Council Member Coulter, I saw your hand up earlier. Did your question get answered? I was, um, thank you, Mayor. I was just gonna basically respond with what has been already discussed as far as the HRA's involvement, so. Very good. Council, any additional questions, comments on this? If not, uh, we have closed the public hearing. Council, I would look for motion on item 7.1. Mayor, I'd be happy to <coughs> put forth a motion. Council Member Lohman. Mayor, I'd move in case PL 2021-251 to adopt a resolution approving comprehensive plan amendment to re-guide 7851 Normandale Boulevard from community commercial to regional commercial. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Carter to adopt a resolution approving a comprehensive plan amendment to re-guide 7851 Normandale Boulevard. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman? Mayor, in case PL 2021-251, I'll move to adopt an ordinance approving the rezoning of 7851 Normandale Boulevard from CS-1 to C-3 plan development. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to 
adopt an ordinance rezoning 7851 Normandale Boulevard from CS1 to C3PD. No further council discussion on this? Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lowman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lowman? Mayor, in case, uh, I moved in case PL 2021-251 to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance rezoning 7851 Normandale Boulevard from CS-1 to C-3PD. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter for summary publication of the resolution authorizing the ordinance rezoning. No further questions? No further comments? Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Councilmember Lohman, you got a couple more in you? Yeah, wow, this is rough. Councilman you know, Loma. <laughs> I just need a bag. <laughs> in case uh, PL 2021-251, have you been able to make the required findings to approve preliminary and final development plans for a four-story high-density motor vehicle sales facility located at 7851 Normandale Boulevard, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report? Second. Motion by Councilmember Loma, second by Councilmember Carter to approve preliminary and final development plans. No further council questions or comments? Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. And Councilmember Lohman, bring us on home. All right. Mayor, I'll move in the case of PL 2021-251, having been able to make the required findings to approve preliminary plat and adopt a resolution approving the final plat of Bloomington Crossroads addition subject to the conditions and code requirements listed in the resolution. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to approve the preliminary plat and final plat of Bloomington Crossroads addition. No further council comments on this? No further questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro, yes. I was just curious as to whether or not we know, Mr. Mayor, uh, when this will get underway. We will get to that. Let's get through this, and then we will ask our, our uh, developer friends what the timeline would be. Anything further? Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Congratulations, Mr. Allstead, Mr. Strom. Uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro had the question when, what, what's the timeline on this? What's, what are the next steps and what do we expect for a timeline here? Uh, yeah, good, uh, good question. Uh, first of all, thank you, Council uh, and staff. Appreciate all, all the guidance uh, over the last several months. Um, our anticipated uh, start date uh, is this April. So, Pretty quick. That is pretty quick. Well, glad to hear that. Very good. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for your work with the HRA and riding this out through what I know was a long time period. I think when we first talked about this, uh, if my memory served, it was shortly before the Super Bowl or the summer before the Super Bowl because it was a matter of whether or not the Days Inn was going to stay open for the Super Bowl, if I recall. So, so it has been a while that you've been working on this, and I appreciate your seeing it through to completion like this. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you. We'll move on on our agenda to item 7.2, which is a discussion of our time of sale inspection evaluation ordinance. We had this discussion last week, and we actually decided to hold this over until this week to get more feedback and to learn a bit more. Uh, I would like to uh, hear from our staff here. Uh, Duke Johnson and Bernadette Gillespie are going to talk to us, as well as Carla Henderson. They're going to lead us off on this. And then, as I said earlier, I would like to open a, a bit of public comment to get some feedback from folks, just uh, in general, because uh, I know there is a lot of interest in this and a lot of folks who have a lot to bring forward. So, Ms. Henderson, good evening. Welcome. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak about time of sale. Um, we have a brief presentation. Uh, we did, um, we'll share some of our engagement efforts, some uh, revisions that we made as a result of what we heard, as well as just last week, identifying um, a life safety hazard that was not identified in the time of sale inspection. And we just wanna share. Um, so I wanna start off by saying again, appreciate this opportunity. So you may recall that we've been talking about this for quite some time. And um, the next slide is, we just wanna remind everybody and those watching at home that you know our goal is to provide an equitable and consistent program, aligning what we're doing with our private evaluators, as well as having a more transparent and efficient program um, and holding our inspectors accountable. So that's the main goals. Right off the bat, I just want to address um, what I know a lot of the re realtors were talking about is response time. And so we looked at, we actually believe and know that response time will perhaps be increased with this new program. Uh, with three and a half city inspectors and 15 private evaluators dedicated to the time of sale program, I just wanted to remind council and the public that we also have eight current inspectors that are all licensed to perform these duties as backup. So when we looked at the data, it became clear that between 75 and 80% of all time of sale inspections are done by currently by city staff and the top 15 private evaluators. We have a pool of 35 private evaluators, but really the chunk of the inspections are done by the top 15. Hence why we wanted to bring 15 kind of into our new program. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bernadette. She's gonna talk about the public engagement and outreach and some responses. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, council. So I'm just here to highlight some of those public engagement and outreach um, uh, options that we had for the time of sale ordinance since our previous council meeting on the 24th. So first we created a Let's Talk Bloomington project page. And on that project page, we included all of the information, documents, links that we had presented to council, um, and then drafts of those ordinances. On that page, there was also a survey for residents, um, evaluators, and realtors. And those survey results were included in the packet this evening. And then a few highlights. So a total of 289 visits were received on that page. And 119 of those visitors viewed the various information pieces on that page. So the different documents and items, we were able to track that. And then 76 individuals participated in that survey, 69 who were residents, three realtors, and five evaluators. Additionally, we held virtual meetings. And so um, that's where we really got the bulk of our engagement and outreach with the realtors and the inspectors. And so with those Zoom sessions, we were able to um, present the information, have discussion, gain feedback. And so we did make some changes regarding that. Uh, let's see, feedback, yep, sorry. Feedback and results regarding um, some of the feedback from that engagement. Next slide. So regarding um, accountability, so we did receive some feedback on that. Um, we will continue to have a written policy and procedure for disciplinary, disciplinary action. Um, and that information will be part of the RFP process and presented to the inspectors shall they um, apply for that. There was a concern regarding the number of inspectors available. Like Carla previously stated, we feel that we have more than enough inspectors that will be on this new list as well as city inspectors to perform those inspections. Concern regarding online scheduling and after hours inspection. So the city is going to be providing an after hours voicemail They'll be able to request those inspections online via email. And then also there'll be an online scheduling option um, for go live of April 1st. And then feedback on allowing applicants to choose their own evaluator. This was a kind of a big ticket item with the evaluators. They wanted to still be able to have those realtors who have that relationship with them to be able to choose them if we're unable to perform those um, inspections for them. So we did change that and we would allow them to choose their own evaluator from that list. And then the fee consistency. So we are going to have a set fee of $250 per inspection, and that would be consistent across the board. 
oh, sorry. <laughs> Regarding the additional $100 fee for after hours, um, that fee was removed from the fee schedule. And so we will be providing a part-time city inspector um, who will work those after hours, early mornings and weekends to perform those evaluations. And then Duke Johnson is here to go over an example of that um, missed life safety hazard from last week. Good morning, or good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Um, what I wanted to talk about was uh, um, an example of a life safety hazard, and it's probably a little difficult to view that picture and try to understand what it is, but first I'm gonna read from our housing standard and evaluator guidelines that everybody's supposed to follow, and it says item 12, <clears throat> And what that states is vending systems of heating plants and water heaters. Uh, item B, the evaluator shall check the vent system for rust holes, back pitch, open joints, and that the vent is tightly sealed to the chimney. Well, in, in this uh, evaluation, you can see that we had a private independent inspection happen in 2017 a private in, uh, TOS inspection in 2021. Both of those private uh, independent TOS inspectors missed this hazard. And what the hazard is, um, if you can imagine hot gases and smoke in a furnace, water heater, they have to go up and out in this case and a back pitch causes CO or carbon monoxide to uh, kind of spill out. And it can spill out uh, very, very little uh, if it's a tight system, and eventually most of it get out. And in the case of this uh, life safety hazard, after it was found um, by our city inspector, uh, the homeowner was quite upset, uh, found uh, that uh, the past hazard or the past inspector did not find it. Uh, we gave her the information for the TOS evaluator's insurance. Uh, she filed a claim. Uh, I went out there personally to uh, kind of verify everything. Uh, HVAC licensed contractor went out there, did find that uh, they agreed with our evaluator that it was back pitch. They did a CO check. They found that there was CO in the air, not to the levels that would kick off the CO detector. And they are in the process now of uh, pulling a permit and fixing that hazard. These are the type of hazards that, are, if they are not caught over time, can cause, let's say, harm or even death. And it's a kind of a scary word to use here, but that's possible. So this is, this is one of the examples, and, and we have others that we could allude to, but this one just kind of jumped out at me the other day to, to run into this so quickly after we discussed it last time that we want to kind of clean this up. We want to make sure these types of things aren't missed and have a little bit more oversight on the inspectors, uh, not only the private, but our own, so that these things aren't missed. Um, the, the homeowner now is, is uh, kind of understanding and, and uh, I believe this is all gonna be fixed rather soon, so that's a good thing. So we, um no, we've talked about this program. We wanted to share the feedback that we got, the adjustments we made. And the next slide, just again, is our timeline, our next steps. Um, I know, Mr. Mayor, you talked about wanting to take public comment, so we will stand. But if you want questions now or afterwards, be happy to entertain at your pleasure. Why don't we uh, see if the council has any questions now specific to this, and then we can uh, maybe listen to the questions from any of the public comment and then call you back up to answer those questions as well, if we could do that. So, Council, questions on this? Council Member Lohman. Um, Mayor, yeah, could we go back to that example of the hazard uh, piece there? Um, because one of the things that I, I had with regard to the, the, the missing hazard, um, so what I'm, I thought I heard, I heard you say, but I just want to make sure I, I didn't miss it, is that not only are we seeing that the private sector is missing these items, but some some of our own inspectors are missing this? No. Or, or did I miss, miss hear that? Uh, Council member, no. I, I was alluding to the fact that two private TOS inspectors missed it. And when we, uh, when the homeowner called and had the city inspector do it, that's when this hazard was found. 
Okay. So what I'm hearing you say is that, that uh, how would we know if our own staff missed any of these items or does that just not happen? Is there, is there a check on, on the, on the, on our public side of the, the house? Um, how do we know if, if we were, if we missed uh, on this and I, and I'm very supportive of this change, but I just want to make sure I understand uh, how, how that is, how, how we got to this particular, uh, uh, you know, this example. Um, and is there an equal chance to, to catch it on the other end? Mr. Johnson? Yes. Um, I would have to say that we have our HVAC inspectors who are experts in installation of furnaces, water heaters. And so if we ever came to a questionable call, we would call them in uh, to look at that specific example. Uh, per the guidelines, this one was pretty hard not to miss. I know that's a bad picture. That was a pretty tight spot. I'm not a skinny guy anymore, but I was able to get back there and take that picture and, and, and evaluate it as all evalu evaluators should have. So it, to me, this was just a prime example of something we don't want to miss, and, and, and hopefully we won't. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, the resident, this, we brought this uh, because it just happened Wednesday when we got the email from the resident and we have been having a lot of discussion about the time of sale. Um, and the email we received from the homeowner said that she was told like any ex inspector should have been able to find this. And um, so for us, I think it drove home the point that um, we want some consistency and uh, we want some better oversight over this program as well. Maybe I'll ask the question in a different way. So, um, so we were able to, we were able to catch this particular uh, example. Is there an audit for, for the uh, private sector that our, that our uh, city staff go through and audit them? And, and then once we change this process, will there be an audit of our inspection? I, I am, I'm certain that we are experts in this, but help me to understand how that process works and operates in terms of auditing and that type of thing. So is it just one person that goes through this and then, and then, and then, uh, that's the one check. How, how does, how do, how do our folks get checked, uh, on their work? So you're, uh, Mr. Mayor, council member Loman. So you're just asking how the city is making sure that we're providing consistent service on the city side. Is that correct? And I think, well, yeah, I mean, I, my, what I'm hearing, yeah, Council Member Loman, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Council Member, Council Member Loman, I think what I've heard you say is, what's the quality control, right? Do we have anybody going into the houses to uh, to ascertain if private inspectors are consistently evaluating things, and do we have anybody going in to ascertain if our own inspectors are uh, making the the proper evaluations? So it's a it's a quality control question, and. I think the answer is no, but I'm going to talk to ask Duke to talk about um, you know what we do have to ensure that our inspectors especially are uh, making sure they're they're following code and that they're catching these things. Not only are they our council members or mayor and council members, they're constantly educating themselves through our continued education. Uh, starting with this new program, we're going to bring back online our test house. Uh, for education for not only the privates, but for ourselves to make sure that we're keeping up with the standards in our guidelines and that everybody is following the same guidelines. So Mr. Mayor, if I can just follow up real quickly, do we do not go back into a house once it's been inspected either by our own or by the privates to verify uh, or to um, essentially quality check the inspection that's done? Uh, city manager, uh, Yes, we do if there's hazards. Um, our other right. eight TOS inspectors do reevaluate the hazards that were called out not only by the privates, but by our own inspectors. At that time, I haven't, we haven't run into it with our own, but we've ran into it with privates where we've gone in to reevaluate hazards and have requested that the TOS private evaluators file what's called an amended report. And that, that happens probably 20 to 30% of the time that we're requesting 
that private TOS evaluators amend their report to be consistent with our housing standard and evaluator guidelines. Thanks for that clarification, uh, because that, that was a piece that I, I wasn't quite following in terms of the uh, of the quality uh, check uh, uh, of, of the process. So it sounds like we, we, we have new standards that are coming, but uh, there isn't a, a wholesale go back and, and, and check it uh, of both 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 the public and the private. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, quick question with regards to one of the comments there that um, this is being addressed by insurance of the TOS inspector. Um, what happens if a city inspector misses something? Is the uh, property owner, the buyer, covered by insurance from the city? Is the city liable for that uh, repair, or how does that work? Mayor Councilman Johnson Nelson. It is very similar in that if we were to do something similar to this and the homeowner wanted to file a claim, they would go through our insurance and file a claim very similar to how this individual had to do it for the private. That's why we collect the insurance information and the licensing information for the privates. I can tell you that we haven't had a claim against the city of Bloomington inspection division in the last, how long has this been? 20 something years. Council, additional questions? So I, I appreciate you bringing this forward, this example forward. We heard, we, we heard the examples last week that so many times it's simply a matter of batteries in a smoke detector. Uh, and, but this is obviously a dramatic departure from that type of thing. In, in your work, can you, can you characterize the, what it would break down to, the minor things versus the major things? Um, obviously, missing a major thing like this is incredibly dangerous, and that's not, that's not acceptable at any level. But just from a, a, a percentages, a, a general, you know, how often you see something like this or something perhaps not to this level, but something that is more than simply there's no batteries in the smoke detector. Mr. Mayor, I, I would have to say that a lot of the things that we look at, uh, we may never know that, you know, if we call it a hazard um, such as this and it's fixed, we would never know that there was a problem later on. It would possibly save lives. That's part of uh, what we started this program for, TOS, was to make sure that the home that you bought here in the city of Bloomington, when you bought it, it was safe to move into. Um, as far as, you know, the, let's call it a major hazard to a minor hazard, I would say we probably have Two percent or three percent of the the time, it's going to be a major life safety hazard like this. But by catching this, we potentially have saved somebody. So you know, being it's a small percentage, it's it's hard to quantify. If you save one person's life because of this, you know, nobody's going to know that. But I'm glad we did, kind of thing. So I would say it's a very small percentage that these missed let's call them major life safety items. Uh, yes, uh, majority of the other ones, smoke detectors, uh, backflow prevention, um, bare wires, uh, some minor hazards. Yeah, th those are quite significant, and I would say they're 30 to 40% of the time, that's what those are. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, no, that, that's helpful perspective on that, thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you. Um, just a couple follow-up questions that I thought of here while, while we're going through it. Would this um, thing that you're showing, would that have been inspected when it was installed? Councilmember Nelson, uh, yes. And uh, I knew that question was going to come. Um, my guess is there was some reconfiguring to create some additional storage space 
Uh, when that happened, uh, I do not know, possibly 10, 15 years ago. Uh, could have been as, as many as, you know, a little bit more. But the reconfiguring was done to create some more space behind the furnace. Um, if I was to go back and look into our system, I probably would find that we did issue a permit, we did issue a final, which would have checked for that type of um, back pitch. If it was there, it would have been corrected. Okay. Um, the second question, are we aware of any cases where someone has actually been injured uh, due to a missed inspection item? Mayor, council member, um, we have not had any um, actual um, injuries reported to us. Um, we have had to go out after private evaluators have not condemned decks and we've had to condemn um, the deck because it's not structurally safe. We've had um, beams in the basement that are being held up by posts, um, uh, screw screw posts that don't have a footing underneath, um, insufficiently sized. Um, so we do have a lot of um, background on very unsafe uh, situations where we've had to go back in and, and have a structural engineer go in um, and provide an evaluation report to the city on how that would be fixed. And we have had to condemn certain structural components of houses that have been missed, but we have not had any injuries. Well, it's good to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So, I mean, that does, that isn't everything. I mean, the fact that we haven't doesn't mean there isn't a risk. So don't, don't get me wrong there. Um, the last question I have is, you know, we are one of, I believe, 13 cities that has this time of sale inspection out of, I believe, 90 cities in the metro, at least I think from Metro League of Metro Cities. Um, so we're, you know, I mean, the vast majority of cities don't do this. Are our houses, do we have any data that demonstrates our houses are safer because of this program than communities that don't do this? And, and you know, some of those communities are like Edina and Eden Prairie and, um, you know, uh, Hopkins and, you know, the older houses similar to what we have um, and they're good communities, people, you know. The desire to live there. They're, they're not bad places. They're not as great as Bloomington, obviously, but, um, you know, I'm just, is there any data to demonstrate that this actually improves our housing stock for, for our residents? And, and, uh, I guess that's my question. Uh, Mayor, council member Nelson. So we, um, we don't have hard data, um, I do, I am on the Minnesota Building Permit Tech Association, and so I do speak to a lot of the, the um, employees of those differing cities, and some of them have gone away from the time of sale program. Um, one of the big components that a lot of us were kind of talking about now was the waiving of buyer's inspections and why maybe time of sale inspections are an important um, part of this process and why we should continue, and maybe some of those cities um, are may be discussing bringing some of those items back. Um, personal experience, I live in Eden Prairie. I um, bought my home three years ago and I had one smoke detector in my entire house. So uh, smoke detectors, although I know we're trying to say, you know, batteries and smoke detectors or non-working non smoke detectors, um, I think that's a, another life safety component as well. And sometimes when people move in, especially if it's someone who is lower income, they might not be able to afford smoke detectors. So having those available and installed um, is an important part of that home. So uh, thank you, I appreciate that answer. And I 100% agree with you on smoke detectors. I think they're one of the biggest things we can do uh, when you look at the data in order to, from the fire, state fire marshal and stuff like that uh, to protect people's lives. And I'm a big proponent of wirelessly interconnected one in existing houses because, um, you know, it's hard to hardwire those together like you can in new construction. But I could go on for way too long on smoke detectors. So <laughs> I'll step back on that, but I appreciate you bringing that up. I think that is a, a huge issue and I think it's extraordinarily important that people have those. They, those have definitely been proven to save lives. 
Thank you, Council Member. Council, any additional questions? I'm not seeing any hands go up. As I said, I, I don't want to call this officially a public hearing. I would like it to be more of a public comment opportunity for folks. I think we'll limit folks to uh, two or five minutes. And, and if you could, uh, anybody, I think we, we see some folks here who are probably willing or, or looking forward to, it, to having a minute to, to talk to the council. Uh, I, I would re request, we, we did have a public hearing last time on this, and I would request uh, information you bring forward if you could uh, continue to move the conversation forward as opposed to rehashing what we've heard in the past, and uh, because we have seen quite a bit of information on all of this. So thank you all. Don't go far, because I'm sure we're going to have some questions that are going to come up here that we will uh, require some answers to. So thank you. Please come forward. If you could, if you if you could sign in, just so we have you officially, and tell us who you are, and um, you can go to it. Thank you. I apologize. My email address is long. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. Um, I'll try to, I did attend, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the first um, public hearing, um, and I found out about this through, uh, my name is Steve Castellan. There you go, I'm that's sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm a 38-year resident of Bloomington. Um, I'm a licensed real estate agent with REMAX Results, uh, and have been, this is my 18th year. Um, I do a significant amount of business in Bloomington uh, and in the metro area um, in other cities that have uh, Truth and Housings as well. So I did join one of the Zoom meetings. Um, I did email each and every single council member, including Mayor Bussey, um, the secretary. I thank the four of the council members who did reply to my email um, and have some specific questions that I replied and answered to as well. So I'll I won't reiterate those comments that I've already shared, but on some of the comments that were tonight, and, and this is with all due respect to Bloomington staff, um, but there were some things that were said that that I just kind of have a rebuttal back to, um, and, and uh, Council Member Nelson brought up a good point when he inquired about the other cities, uh, there being 13 and three that have reverted back, um, and, and the reasons why they have are because of issues um, that that arise in truth and housing and the biggest fault with truth and housing and this kind of goes back to the question that council member Loman kept asking and in my opinion didn't really get a definitive answer on is is there a follow-up or a way to audit or check city inspectors and the answer to that really is yes but it's when a buyer hires a private inspector to come in and do a full inspection. You can follow the money. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if you buy a $35,000 car, it's going to be nicer than a $10,000 car. If you pay $250 for an inspection versus one that's $450 or $500, that $450 inspection is going to be more comprehensive. So what happens in cities where you have time of sale requirements, if there's 50 outlets in a house, they may test 10 of them. Um, they may test 15 of them. If there's a couch in a way, they're not going to move it. They don't go up in the attic. They don't go up on the roof and check the shingles. They don't, it's, it's just not a comprehensive report. And so what happens is buyers spend the 450 to $500 dollars to have a full inspection done. And then that's where items, in my opinion, such as that, uh, reverse venting or lowing vent that was shown, uh, by Mr. Johnson. Um, so that's how these get caught is by private inspection. So in essence, you're putting an extra burden on a homeowner already from a financial standpoint to have an inspection that really doesn't bear a whole lot of weight. Um, we talk about health issues, life-saving issues. I find it really, really ironic that a backflow preventer missing on an exterior faucet in Bloomington is a hazardous item, but isn't in most other cities or any of the other cities that have, have time and sale. And yet, if you're missing a carbon monoxide detector in the city of Bloomington, it's a comment. It's not a hazardous item. Well, it's a state law that you have to have a carbon monoxide detector within 10 feet of sleeping quarters. In Bloomington, it's a comment. It's not a hazardous item, yet a backflow preventer is. The, to me, you're, adding, uh, you're, you're fixing a problem that doesn't exist. You're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and you're adding, to me, a huge liability to city employees. If a city employee goes in and does the time of sale, 
and then a buyer's inspector comes and does a more comprehensive inspection and finds items that the city inspectors missed, and they're human, and they can, who does that onus go on to? The city of Bloomington. Um, it's just not items that, that are, uh, not to mention the delays, and it's, from when I first heard about this, there was going to be one and a half inspectors, then it went to three, now this evening it's three and a half. You know, I asked the question, when it's three inspectors, uh, if one of them gets COVID or is sick, you just lost one third of your inspectors. Um, with a 30 to 40 list that they currently have, getting somebody in on a timely fashion is extremely important in this business. And any kind of delays whatsoever, I would think, make a huge problem. And I know I'm running out of time, so one thing I'm looking for clarification on, because originally you weren't going to be allowed to choose your own inspector. Now tonight I thought I heard Bernadette, uh, or one of them anyway, say that they would allow sellers to choose their own inspector. I'd look for clarification on that. And then I would like to know how those 15, now it's up to 15 private inspectors, how are they going to be chosen? Um, the inspector that I use or inspectors that I use do everything to ASHI standards, American Society of Home uh, inspectors. Will Bloomington inspectors do it to the same? So um, I got three seconds. I appreciate your time. I would beg you to look long and hard at this um, and not just rubber stamp it because I think it's a huge mistake. Bloomington would be far more better served if they did an inflow and infiltration like Golden Valley and West St. Paul, if they really truly cared about residents and big costs and require a homeowner to look at the sewer line from the house to the street than they do these things that we're talking about here tonight. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Anyone else? Don't steal the pen. Oh, hi. Yeah, don't. <laughs> I come up with my own. It has my uh, name and phone number on it. Um, I, I was concerned, actually, last time I talked that well, there if, would you be, just, if you could just identify yourself. I'm sorry. Ronald time. Staley, American Central Inspections. Um, I was a little concerned that there would be a Willie Horton um, moment here, and I'm not sure who's old enough to know that. <laughs> I've been dissuaded from using that example, but I think it's appropriate here. We're talking about a hazard uh, in a situation that, one, we know there was a modification, so we're not sure when that hazard happened. Second, there have been three sales, apparently, of this home, which, mean, which would mean that there would be probably two buyer's inspections. So the homeowners would have been told that there was a problem with the venting at that time, and if it was a hazard, it would have been repaired. And we don't know when the modifications from the the code uh, and the original city inspection was made in order to create this hazard. It could actually have happened between one inspection and the other, if in fact you could just modify that in a way that would create that hazard. Um, I also have some concerns about, as, as the other gentleman mentioned, um, th about that you're able to choose your own evaluator. Because that seems to be a very slippery sort of, well, they're just telling the realtors that. And I attended, all of the Zoom meetings, and yeah, they're saying to the realtors, yeah, you can still keep your inspector. So now it's gonna be calling the city, having, tell, having to tell the city in writing that you want your own inspector, then you have to call your own inspector, and then, so it's, it's not streamlining the process. Also, I'd like to say, oh, sorry, that um, if the city controlled all the gas stations in the, in the city, the price of gas would be consistent throughout the city. But that doesn't necessarily help the, the residents of the city get the best deal. And I mean, just as an example, I was uh, driving to an inspection the other day and I uh, got a phone call and a neighbor was like a block and a half away wanted to get a truth in housing. And I was able to discount severely to get them their truth in housing because there's no getting in the car cost. And I'm already there. And that opportunity would be lost to Bloomington residents. And again, I think this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, I, if, if they want fewer evaluators, they need to call the herd however they need to do it. But just sort of throwing everybody out and going, well, we'll take some of you back and then we'll have this you know, weird process to try to get to an evaluator to do some marketing. And there is no marketing on cost anymore or price or um, service 
or anything else. It's all, it, it's like, again, like I said, a, a problem, in, or, excuse me, a solution in search of a problem. They had a problem with the computer. Apparently that's fixed. We're not even talking about what the 15 evaluators are going to have to do in order to input these six additional pieces of information, which seemed to be the big deal two weeks ago. The big deal was, oh, my God, we don't know how to make the computer work. Now we're not even talking about that anymore. So apparently the problem that, that spawned this solution has gone away. And now we're having different problems all of a sudden out of nowhere. Because everyone said, well, you added energy, so we have to do this, and we can't do this with private evaluators, so here we are. So I'm actually going to leave you with a minute 30 for someone else. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. My name is Bryce Staley. I had an opportunity to talk to you last week. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, uh, I guess I would like to say that um, I think that uh, back pitches on water heaters should be called out as hazards. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, and again, we don't know the condition of the property when the first guy went through. Um, there was an alteration made, uh, you know, I mean, and the thing is, is that stuff did, does get moved around, um, and it sh if, if it went through a city permit process, many, some water heaters are put in without a permit. They're just not. They, they throw them in, they don't pull a permit, they're never looked at. Uh, some of them are flat pitched, but vent okay, and some of them are negatively pitched, and then in North Minneapolis, some of them are installed with no venting at all. <laughs> just zero vent, just no vent. I've actually walked in on uh, no houses in Bloomington, uh, but in Minneapolis, there were water heaters installed just venting into the atmosphere um, of, the, uh, of the home. So that, I mean, that can kill somebody. Um, so I think that um, again, and I had an opportunity to talk to Bernadette and, and um, Duke, and uh, I think that the, I, I would just like to, you to consider that, um, that licensing has a certain amount of prestige. Being a licensed evaluator with the city of Bloomington carries with it um, you know, some prestige in the marketplace, and um, having the license go away um, is, is I think, a problem. And if there are gentlemen who need to lose their licenses or need to be called to task for things that they're not doing in the field, then we need to call them to task. Um, and, you know, and let that process play out. But I think to throw everybody out and say, well, we'll again, we'll take you back, um, you know, without sort of knowing where I stand, <laughs> that scares me a little bit. Um, and we, I, I just think that, uh, um, I think that there is, I think that there are ways to solve these problems. Bringing the test house back, great idea. I mean, just spectacular idea. Get us in a room together, get us talking about what's important. Um, you know, every now and then, uh, you know, I've had, in my career, I've had three phone calls with first John Aaron and then Dean and one with Duke. Um, and that's it. So these things are easily solved um, through communication, through bulletin. Um, and I, I just, I, again, I just think that, um, I think that these problems can be solved outside of, of getting rid of private evaluators. And uh, again, I submit myself to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sticking to the five minute time frame when we didn't even have the timer running. So I appreciate that. Did, did I hit the number right on the you, head? You hit it exactly. Well done. Council, any questions or clarifications from the folks that we heard from tonight? Riza, by chance, is there anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.2, our time of sale inspection evaluation ordinance? Again, if you would like to join the public comment, please press star 1. 
We have Cliff Car Carlson on the line. Your line is open. Good evening. Hello. Hello, are you with us? Yes, I am. Um, I was just wondering. It, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I've excuse been me. In this house excuse for me. 40 years now. E excuse me one second. And I'm sure. Excuse me. My insulation isn't good. Now, are they going to come in and drill holes all in this thing and looking through for more insulation? Or, and then I'm going to have to fix those holes too? Or, and the other question I've got is if they say something's wrong with the house, do I have to fix it before I sell it? Or do it just get noted on the truth and housing thing that, or, you know, that the buyer comes in? Because I'm thinking I'm probably going to have to sell it to a flipper anyhow. But that's my questions. Thank you. Uh, if you could, I, I think we missed your name when you, you came on. Could you identify yourself for us, please? Clifford Carlson. Clifford, thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate it. We'll get, we'll get answers here as we get through the, uh, the rest of this uh, public comment period. We'll get answers for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Riza, is there anyone else on the line wishing to speak to item 7.2? Yes, we have Kent Bolson on the line. Your line is open. Hi, uh, this is Kent Bolson, uh, 83rd Street and Johnson Circle in Bloomington here. And I just want to comment from the perspective of someone who's sort of looking at this across the transaction process. I, I purchased this property in Bloomington four plus years ago, previously uh, Richfield, Minneapolis, Philadelphia resident. But um, as I purchased this property, Property. I had a private inspector who came in, reviewed the property, identified issues that I needed to consider in my purchase. And I think that is a primary thing that needs to be a purchaser's responsibility. But as I look ahead to the day when I may sell this property, I also may bring in an inspector to come in and tell me, what do I need to do to improve this property, to correct this property before it's ready for sale? And that's a seller's responsibility. And, and, and then the city comes in as sort of an arbitrary. So you have those three. You've got a purchaser's responsibility, a seller's responsibility, a city responsibility. And I'm really concerned about the integration of those three pieces. How do we have a common set of standards that all three of those inspectors are working against so that the buyer, the seller, the city are all working against the same rules and the same standards so we have a single set of rules that everybody works against? So that's my primary concern. And what I'd really like to see is some kind of an integration of that. And if that's a public-private partnership where I could actually have a, you know, a, uh, an inspector who can cover multiple roles and can look at it from multiple perspectives, or if that's three separate inspections, that's really my concern of integrating those three views. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Riza, anyone else wishing to speak to item 7.2? We have Eric Mayers on the line. Your line is open. Hi, um, Eric Myers, Director of Government Affairs for the Minneapolis Area Realtors. Um, we became aware of this issue about three days prior to the January 24th meeting, uh, very short notice. Um, we have forwarded our letter with our uh, enumerated concerns, number one through five. Uh, we, we have heard some answers tonight that answer some questions for us. Um, I, I, I would hope that Bernadette and the staff would come back up and give us the and, and give us the opportunity so that she could answer and tell us um, exactly how uh, you know what's the criteria for the 15 that are going to be selected. What's how is it that the realtors are going to be able to continue to choose their inspectors? Uh, we, we need a lot of details on that. Uh, Blooming is. Clinton is obviously, as you know, the third largest city in the state. Um, 1,500 uh, listed properties every single year. We are really, we're really concerned that uh, 1,500 properties 
may not be able to be serviced by three staff plus 15. Um, specifically, since it's about 30 to 45 inspectors right now in the private market, um, I think a couple of our points at the bottom there with regards to this could be handled through licensing or remediation of problems with problem inspectors, bulletins, um, and, and you could address it one-on-one. -on -one. I, I find it really hard to believe that an entire third of the current inspectors are, you know, 30, you're, you're attempting to throw out 20 inspectors uh, and, and, and it's being sold here that these are the ones that routinely have trouble. That's, I mean, that's a very large statistical problem. Uh, we have a real hard time believing that that's currently the case, um, specifically since uh, no one has been hurt. There hasn't been any life safety issues. And as it was previously stated, the vast majority of cities in the metro do not have this, uh, this ordinance. Um, and private inspections are really the gold standard and uh, I will also finally mention that the city's own ordinance on point of sale actually includes indemnification language. And so, yes, you may be insured, and yes, you may be able to find, file a claim with the city. I doubt anyone's ever been able to successfully do that because in the ordinance language itself, there's indemnification clauses. Every single one in the Twin Cities that has a point of sale ordinance and every city mandates these inspections through the city and then provides an indemnification for themselves. I just wanted to point that out too. So if we could get some answers, I, I have 10,000 realtors to update on these changes. These changes came out of nowhere and I've had realtors calling me every single day since before the 24th asking me if their transactions are gonna be delayed in Bloomington. And I'd just like to be able to get them the cleanest and clearest information possible we look to the city of Bloomington. Uh, we, we expect realtors are on the ground selling the city every day, and we just anticipate being the best possible partner we can. Uh, so I just need uh, the clearest information to hand out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Riza, anyone else on for item 7.2? No further commentators. Please stick. Please continue. So we've got no one else on the line, and I think we've heard from everyone in the chambers who wishes to speak on this. Appreciate that. So I will uh, close our, our public comment on this. And um, if we could get the uh, city staff back up, just answer some of the questions that we did here, that would be helpful, I think. And council, help me fill in here. Here are the questions that I heard. Um, uh, so there was a question about Sellers choosing their own inspectors. This was that, that was a change, I, I believe, or it, it was a change after the uh, the public input that you received at the different venues that you had. Yes, Mayor, City Council. Um, so, if in the event that when they call the city, they are unable to get that inspection within a forty-eight hour time frame of the time that they request, we would then provide them with that list so that they could choose their own inspector. And a, a second question about how the inspectors will be chosen. So that is through our RFP process. Um, there will be an RFP application process with specific criteria regarding education, um, experience, um, years of uh, holding a time of sale license. And so those will be items that will be weighted. And then uh, there will be a panel of city staff that will interview the candidates for that process. Uh, the one caller had questions about, uh, I think it was the, the home energy inspections, and he, he was asking about how they will inspect the inspection insulation. insulation. And I think I remember hearing about this, about um, uh, an out-of-the-way exterior wall where you could drill a single hole to take a look at what the exterior insulation would be, but I'm sure you can explain it better than I can. Correct. So they, <clears throat> the inspector would choose, and when the, the seller or applicant calls, our city staff would explain the new process to them. Um, and that it's a very minimal size hole. I believe it's less than two inches. They would find an inconspicuous um, exterior wall, hopefully located in a closet, and then they would drill that hole and then um, verify the insulation. And then we also have plugs that we uh, would insert into that so that it's kind of um, seamless with the wall. 
Got it. So, I, and then the, the the caller asked the follow up questions about uh, would these issues need to be corrected before sales? And I think there's a difference between the time of sale inspection and our energy audit inspection about requirements or, Correct. or corrections that are necessary. Yes. Expand on so that. with the time of sale um, inspection without the energy disclosure portion, if there are hazards found, the owner can either uh, fix those hazards or the buyer can assume the hazard. So they sign a hazard assumption stating that they understand those hazards. We have them speak with one of our plan reviewers to explain the different type of hazards and what that would mean as far as permitting or um, any other requirements. And then they would assume those hazards and sign that saying that they acknowledge that responsibility as a buyer. Um, and then with the energy disclosure, that's just fully disclosure. Nothing's required to be fixed. That, that's what I thought. So thank you for clarifying that. And then a kind of a, a general broader question from a caller, how to ensure consistency or integration of these public and private inspections, whether it's time of sale, time of purchase, uh, city inspections, that type of thing. Thoughts on that? So I believe that, especially now with the way that the market is, a lot of, like I stated previously, um, buyers are waiving this inspection, their buyer's inspection, so they're relying on the time of sale inspection. Um, which is why I think it's a very important program to continue, um, and as well as providing consistency to those buyers um, and sellers. So um, as far as the private buyer's inspections and what those inspectors are required as far as education requirements, I'm not 100% familiar. Um, but our inspectors do continuing education every year. They're limited building officials with the state of Minnesota, so they have to continue to keep updated on code requirements. All right, and then just one final thing uh, that we heard from uh, the Realtors Association. Um, how, how um, I won't say upsetting, how, 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 what, will this be, what will the impact be on realtors in terms of how they're able to do their jobs? Will this just put them completely on their ear if we make this change, or, or what, what's your interpretation on that? Um, based on the number of inspections that the city currently does, so we have one full-time time of sale inspector and, sorry, Mayor City Council, and a part-time um, inspector. So he's a full-time inspector, but he does time of sale part-time for us. Um, they're doing about a third currently of the total number of inspections. So, um, and then like Carla had stated before, about 75% of the remaining um, evaluations are completed by the top 15 and the, doing the bulk of that. So we're more than adequately prepared with those numbers to continue in the same manner that we are today, if not providing a faster service, um, if that answers that question. And I think so, because we did receive a number of uh, basically the same email from a lot yeah. of realtors basically saying they're worried about timeliness on this. And it, it's your contention that uh, it wouldn't necessarily affect timeliness and couldn't even in some ways improve, but it, it wouldn't affect timeliness of of when they were, when we were able to get out, when an inspector would be able to get out and inspect a home that is uh, is up for sale. Correct. And I did receive um, a lot of those emails directly, and I did reach out to those realtors via phone. And once they realized that it wasn't just you know one and a half inspectors that we were adding for the program, or three inspectors, that we had eight additional inspectors with the city who were backup inspectors. If someone does get COVID and they call in on Monday, we have someone who could fill in for those inspections. Those inspections aren't getting canceled. Um, or rescheduled. And then with the 15 private evaluators that we would still be licensing, um, and we would still require them to be licensed with the city, so they would still be a licensed evaluator. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did I catch everything from the questions standpoint from our public commentary? I think I did, if I didn't, please let me know. I see a couple of hands up. I see Council Member Nelson and then Council Member Lohman. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, I think one of the other questions from uh, Mr. Myers from the Realtors was regarding indemnification of the city. Uh, can we get clarification on that? Are we indemnified against a claim if we miss something? And does that put residents, buyers in an awkward or negative position? I would defer to our uh, city attorney regarding that language. Ms. Mandershad, thoughts on this? Uh, Mayor members, I'm looking through the ordinance in the packet. I don't see the indemnification language there. It wouldn't um, 
I can certainly go and check on uh, in the code online and see if we have that language in the code. Um, typically, when someone makes a claim, they submit, they, they speak with our risk and litigation manager and they receive a, a claim form um, that they that they submit and then it's submitted to our in, um, insurance coverage provider. But I'll go jump on the, um, on the city code's website and see if I can track down that language if it exists. Why don't you go through the code and we'll, uh, we'll push forward and double back to you if that's okay. Councilmember Nelson, anything additional? Um, I did have a question for if there were any of the uh, energy inspectors still in the room, um, but I don't know if they've left. Um, my question, I know a lot of this came from the uh, energy audit portion of this uh, that, that we want to do here. And I'm just wondering if they are doing those in Minneapolis and if they're in a position to uh, do them in Bloomington as well, similar to the, what they're doing in Minneapolis. Please come on forward. Uh, are, are they doing the energy audits or energy inspections in Minneapolis? Are, do yes. you do those? I do do energy audits in Minneapolis. It's a pretty simple system. Uh, there are a couple, there are like six or eight data points depending on uh, number of storm windows, uh, pick a location for the hole, drill the hole. Uh, we have a, uh, Amazon or some, I don't know who the, provider is but a cap that goes over that we take in gear to um, clean up after ourselves so it's a pretty uninvasive process the one detriment to that is is that um, you're only looking in that one location so if they didn't dense pack that location or or you know there could be lots of insulation over there but you're just looking in this one spot so it's it's sort of one data point um but that was to that was done to mitigate um basically concerns over you know drilling a bunch of holes so um it's pretty simple it's a pretty easy process it integrates into what we're already doing fairly well so that part is the energy audit part is the one thing that the realtors are really happy about because they can go market on it and the idea is is that uh, if we develop a cafe standard, like you know, fuel for for cars, if we can give you an accurate picture of what the house is going to use for energy, they can market on it. So that's been sort of a boon for for the Minneapolis program is filing finding that 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 energy piece, um, and I just think that evaluators. Most evaluators are licensed in Bloomington, are licensed in Minneapolis and other cities. So we're ready to do that on day one. Great. Thank you. And that, that was my question. So thank you very much. Councilmember Lohman. I just had a question if there's any of those uh, folks that are, are out there. You put the put it out there, Mayor, and I wanted to just see um, uh, when we're trying to compare cities uh, from a uh, from a safety perspective, um, I wanted to just hear it from the realtors that may be there. Uh, how would how would you go about doing that if you were in the industry in terms of uh, you know the, the standards and the process by which that, uh, uh, that that you follow? So I'd be curious if, if there's anybody else out there. I'm not sure if Ronald's out there or, or who's uh, still left, but I'd be curious to kind of as I'm trying to figure out my mind. Uh, uh, you know, how do we how do we evaluate safety uh, for we're trying to look at these different uh, at these different cities? Um, Council member member Lohman, that's part of the issue with the truth in housing is the varying degrees. Like in for instance, in St. Paul, they're what we call a non code compliant city, so they require the homeowner to do an, a truth in housing inspection, um, but any of the hazardous items that show up are not required to be re the buyer doesn't have to assume them the seller doesn't have to fix them there's only one requirement in st paul you have to have one hardwired smoke detector on the level with the most bedrooms you know then you go to another city um you know i touched on it earlier as far as you know bloomington having the backflow preventers as a hazardous items other cities they're not um, and so you have buyers who are looking in multi, especially in this kind of a market, I have buyers who are looking in Bloomington, Richfield, Eden Prairie, Chaska, Lakeville, because the inventory is so low. And then you're going and you're trying to educate them and you're going from city to city. And then you're telling them in advance, you know, that, you know, well, this city, because it doesn't have a backflow preventer, that's a hazardous item. And 
you, you know, Bernadette touched on with people waiving inspections um, in this kind of a market and that the truth in housing, you know, is kind of a safety net or catch to that. I think it's quite the opposite. First and foremost, there we have a form with Remax where you, our buyers sign it saying that we not only tell them, you know, you should have a, a, a buyer's inspection done, um, they have to sign it. We have it in every file. Um, so for any agent to suggest to a buyer to waive a home inspection or to suggest, or a city for that matter, to imply that a truth in housing inspection makes up for a buyer's inspection is ludicrous. And, and I mean, I would never do it. I would never recommend that the city do it. I would never even market it as an implication as that that might be something that might make up for, for you know, to, to not do a buyer's inspection. Does, does that answer your question? I, I don't, I hope I did. Well, yeah, I gave me more uh, points. I appreciate uh, that because I'm trying to look at this, this issue of consistency. Uh, that, that's, that's really where I'm trying to get at. So, uh, uh, you know, and the only way to do that is to evaluate safety or some other kind of piece. So I appreciate uh, that. that Correct. The, the real consistency is in the buyer's inspections. I mean, the buyer's inspectors that go into these homes, uh, I would say they're very consistent. Um, it's in the truth in housing through the 13 cities where the inconsistencies lie. Uh, that, that might be a better answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're going to move on to uh, Ms. Manderscheid, I think, has a, a question, an answer for the question about indemnification. Ms. Manderscheid? Uh, Mayor, members, in the, in the time provided, I was able to find um, only a reference in the relevant division um, that contains the time of sale provisions. I was able to con find some language that talked about how there are no uh, guarantees or warranties that the dwelling meets all minimum maintenance, housing, and building standards. That's in 14.532. Um, in a statement about the evaluations conducted pursuant to this division are made to improve the overall housing stock um, and, you know, are not intended to be a special benefit for any individual, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't find indemnification language. I did do a kind of a general search and um, I don't find any reference to the word um, in, in the relevant provisions related to time of sale. All right, thank you. Council, additional questions on this? Any more information that we need before we start a discussion? Council Member Lohman. One last question uh, for staff. Um, you know, um, it was asked earlier um, if you were to try to compare uh, different cities' uh, processes. I'm just curious how you would go about doing that. When we talk about consistency and accuracy, um, let's say you're trying to compare Edina, Eden Prairie, uh, in terms of this process piece. Uh, and if we, you know, if we were to say, and I always want to believe that Bloomington's process is always the best, uh, born, raised here, haven't left here. Uh, how would I go about trying to do that? that comparison uh, or, or, or is it just a gut check, right? I, I looked at my professionals that are, are, that are in the, in, in the office and you guys say, Hey, this is what we believe we need to go because of my expertise and my experience in working in this industry. So that, that's, that's sort of what my question is. Cause I'm trying to look at that, you know, cause our argument is you put, you put forward uh, in the presentation, those two points. Um, and so, you know, either there's, you know, a quantitative data that, that supports that conclusion or there's qualitative data it says, yep, we're going to go down this process. And so that's what I'm trying to evaluate in my mind, how you started off the presentation with those two points. Um, so if you could help me to understand that, that would be helpful. Councilmember, uh, Minneapolis about probably 15 years ago, uh, reached out to the city of Bloomington to try to mimic uh, a little bit of what we do. And uh, I believe they call them R&R &R there, right? R&R yep. &R there and to and that was to fix and replace and they used a little bit of the the city of bloomington as a guideline so i, I took that as a compliment uh, other cities such as south st paul uh, took our program in full our guidelines in full and and so there is starting to be a little bit more consistency but uh to try to get 13 cities to all agree on their point of sale time of sale truth in housing 
is very dif difficult at best. But I, I'd like to say that the city of Bloomington stands pretty tall when it comes to our consistency. I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, I, I think for the other council member asked the question maybe better. I mean, I'll put it in a different way here. If I'm trying to compare, and you did give me some examples there, okay. those cities are using uh, using us as a standard. So that to me means that what we're doing is above and beyond what they're doing. That's what I'm hearing you say. You did say that that uh, uh, straight out. But uh, if I, as a as a council member, trying to evaluate this program, you know that you're putting forward, um, how would I compare this to other cities and know that we we are we have a we have a, a better uh, program uh, than what another city has. Uh, council member, I just, I think you referred to it. I, it's more of a gut check. Uh, there is no, uh, let's say, uh, facts or figures or, uh, or has anybody ever audited all the cities to try to put a comparison together? Not to my knowledge anyways. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my last question, and it's just a, it's a thing I brought up on other issues because, you know, I want to make sure the process is robust and I appreciate staff reaching out to the realtors and the inspectors and the community on this issue. Um, my specific question is, was this on a work plan for any specific department to come with these recommendations? And, and or did this go through the planning commission? How robust was this process before getting to the council? Mayor, council member Nelson, uh, this was not on a work plan regarding the change in the program. The energy disclosure portion was on um, the sustainability commission's work plan. Um, and um, like we had previously stated, um, during that process, we started to pull data points to see the information that we could get on single family homes, duplexes, um, the quantity, starting to think about the fee change, how much extra time that would be in the home, et cetera. And during that evaluation, we started to come up with a lot of inconsistencies, such as hazards found internally by city inspectors being uh, considerably higher than external inspectors. And so at that point, we were, uh, because of moving forward this way and already changing the code with the time of sale energy disclosure ordinance, we figured let's bring it all forward and let's do um, all of the changes together versus piecemealing it to the council. Um, and we didn't want to um, hold a, a test house and train 40 or 35 evaluators if maybe in six months Later, once we brought this new process forward, we were going to change the program altogether. Thank you. Thank you. Council, if there's no further questions, Council Member Carter. Um, so I just wanna make sure for people who are listening tonight, because this has been an ongoing conversation, um, I just wanna make sure we clarify that this relates to time of sale, this doesn't mean that there can't be other inspectors in the city and it doesn't impact buyer, like the inspections that buyers would hire private inspectors for. Correct. Correct, okay. I just wanted to clarify that because I don't want people listening thinking that we're not allowing any inspectors in the city for all kinds of inspections. It's really related to this time of sale piece. Thank you. And to add on to that, this time of sale piece and who does it is an entirely separate issue from the energy inspection, the energy audit that we approved on the council, trying to make sure that home buyers have a good understanding of what the energy efficiency, quality, um, worth of the home that they would be looking at buying, whether it's windows, insulation, furnace, or so on, they have a better understanding of that. And that's an entirely separate issue to all of this. Would be done as part of this, but an entirely different separate issue. Correct. So just wanted to clarify that. So, Council, thank you all very much. Thank you. We, um, we laid this over until tonight because there were some Council questions and concerns about uh, outreach and engagement and, and awareness, public awareness, and 
uh, industry awareness of what this was and what, what it would entail and so on. Um, and we had additional questions also. We asked staff to look into, um, or we, we asked staff to conduct that engagement and to do as much information and engagement as possible. Uh, they, they came back and, and showed what they did and changes that were made. And I think the clarification was there uh, in terms of some of the, a lot of the questions that were there. But so I ask you then, Council, have those questions been answered? Do we understand, are we at a position now where we, we understand exactly what has been done? Are we satisfied with the engagement work that has been done? And are we to a point where we can look at this objectively and decide one way or another uh, where we want to go with this? And frankly, I hope we're to that point because goodness knows there's been a lot of information that has been flying around for the past couple of weeks. So, anyone like to kick this off? Anyone like to start our discussion? Councilmember Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. Never shy about kicking it off. So, um, yeah, I, uh, on the one hand, yeah, I think that we have got enough information in my mind. Um, you know, I would not support this as recommended right now. I think the energy portion makes a ton of sense. Um, I'm hearing that um, my dog is very upset at me. Um, sorry about that. It's dinner. Um, and I'm going to trust you. Maybe someone else can go for a second while I deal with my dog. Apologies. The dog ate his comments. I, my dog ran away, so okay. <laughs> the only one that speaks more than I do in the household. So, um, you know, my concern about it is one, I do have the one unanswered question about indemnification. I appreciate uh, our city attorney looking into that quickly. I uh, would like more information about that. But I, I'm just not seeing the need for the change in the system. The energy portion of it makes absolute sense. But the, um, uh, sorry, my wife is trying to get the dog. <laughs> cool. The, um, you know, in my opinion, the uh, reason this originally came up was with regards to energy. And it sounds to me like the private inspectors are already doing the energy portion in Minneapolis. And they're well positioned to do that and to continue to do that. Um, if there are these issues um, that have been brought forward, I personally, you know, think that we should take a more holistic look. We should go back and ask Planning Commission if it's something that they want to put on their work plan to take a look at. Um, candidly, based on the number of communities that don't have these, I question whether or not we have a time of sale inspection at all with this one caveat. I absolutely believe in the energy portion of it, as I heard the realtors do. And I think it's a great market-based system. I've seen it in the private marketplace work. I absolutely believe in that. Um, but you know, I, I could see this being a program that was, as an alternative to a buyer's inspection, you would have to do this on the back end, um, as opposed to requiring everyone to do it on the front end. And then, you know, whatever percentage, if it's 50, 80, 90, I mean, I got a whole range of uh, information from people. Uh, doing it on the back end, doing a full buyer's inspection, you know, just make this an alternative. If if you don't get a buyer's inspection, then you have to get the time of sale inspection from the city or something of that line. I, like, I'm just, I just don't see the need to change the program right now to get the energy portion of it, which I think is what most of us want to get in there. And if there are other issues, I think there should be a more robust process to get those answered. So that's where I'm at right now. Thank you, Councilmember Sorry, Nelson. Dog. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, does it make sense to at least get a motion out there so we know what we're talking about? I, I think we're still in discussion for him here, but if you want to throw a motion out there to, to have the discussion revolve around that, please do. Yeah, let's just get this a little clearer. So I think what we've got here for 7.2 is uh, let's move. I'll move to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 14 of the City Code related to the time of sale housing evaluations. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second, Martin. Got a motion by Councilmember Lohman and a second by Councilmember Martin. So we have a motion on the table to uh, to adopt the ordinance amending Chapter 14 of the City Code related to the time of sale housing evaluation. So thank you for that, for Councilmember Lohman. Do you want to follow up uh, your motion with any comments? 
Well, since you've asked me, Mary, I won't, I won't waste the, the time with, with that. Um, um, I'll go ahead and comment now. So I, I think there were some really good um, uh, items that were really raised here uh, this evening. And um, I think this is just an example of, you know, and I've said this to the mayor or to the manager many a times, uh, where we try to make uh, you know, kind of policy changes right in the middle of a, of a, um, you know, of, of doing the budget. It just doesn't, I don't think it just, it doesn't make for a good uh, uh, policy experience uh, for the public. And I think also for this body and, and for staff. And, um, you know, I do think there are some great opportunities here for the private sector uh, to play a role uh, in this. Uh, uh, and I certainly uh, see the change that, that staff is putting forward. But I think a lot of this, the, the problem that we're kind of dealing with from a policy perspective is, is the process by which that we follow from a, from a staffing perspective uh, of how this came, uh, came to uh, the council. I think that if this was uh, presented in, in, a, in a different way and, uh, and it was uh, a much smoother policy uh, process, I think I would feel differently about that. Now, Given how I feel about how the process works, if we look at the information that is uh, before us, um, I, I do think I, I can see, and I support what, what Councilmember Nelson says in terms of expanding this process or creating a way in which once we have established consistency, kind of moving forward, uh, that folks could bypass this process, allowing us to get the same results. But I think that is gonna take some time. Um, I think, the process by which the staff has put forward today allows us to move forward with the time of sale uh, process on the April 1st uh, deadline. Uh, now, while I have uh, serious concerns um, about how this was, was done and put together, uh, I'm supportive of uh, what staff has put forward in terms of you know, their, their background and their experience in this area. Uh, we are leaders in this particular area. Uh, you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul, as uh, uh, Inspector Duke put forward, uh, made the statement that, uh, you know, many of these cities use what we have uh, put forward. And we're trying to establish consistency. Now, I got to be honest with you, I don't I, I don't buy the hazard thing uh, uh, or the, the moment that the, the, the guy uh, talked about the uh, uh, I think it was uh, Ronald brought forward that the staff brought forward from a hazard perspective. But I am belief, I do believe, and I do trust staff that if they say that we've got a hazard problem um, and that they want to fix those consistencies, um, I, I, I trust staff to, to, to say this is the process by which we fall forward. But I would push staff to be innovative in terms of trying to find ways in which to, to bring the private sector into the process uh, going forward, um, that this not be just a, a single step. But I, I am reluctantly willing to support this as it is written today with the uh, with the idea that moving forward, that we'd have an improvement going forward. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, first of all, I want to echo Council Member Loman's um, comments sort of about the, the policy process here. And I, I think ultimately what happened is we, you know, we got into the, the, um, the energy disclosure requirements and, and just sort of fell into the process this way. And, that, and that's, um, you know, whether we can sort of have the argument about whether or not this is a needed change. Um, I think that's not that's not really the best way to sort of get into these kinds of policy discussions. So um, I would also add, you know, I, I think to Council Member Nelson's point, I think it's a it's a, a good one. And, you know, perhaps at some point, as as Council Member Loman suggested, at some point in the future, um, we could discuss the need for for the the time of sale inspection in, in its entirety or or some sort of process um you know that that being said um and i i also want to be clear someone it, it sounded to me like one of the commenters i heard earlier questioned whether city staff had had altered an image or or something like that and i just um i want to be very careful about making sort of uh uh implications like that um but these you know these are not small things that that city city staff has been finding these are these are significant i mean that was that image was one example but these are not insignificant um uh things that city staff have been missing and um that that is concerning to me and and 
you know, as, as Mr. Johnson mentioned, um, it, it can be hard to quantify lives saved. It can be hard to quantify what didn't happen. Um, and I, you know, what I would say as well that um, I think staff did a, a good job of incorporating um, some of the feedback that, that they heard from the private inspectors. And I, I think there is a, a significant place for private inspectors um, such that, you know, to, you know, to the extent that this, that this is a change, um, I, it does accommodate private inspectors and I don't think it will be um, detrimental to folks looking to have these kinds of inspections. Um, and I would I would just add, you know, I, I think again to the point that I sort of started with, um, I actually heard from from a realtor who who I know who lives in Bloomington, who um, attended one of the um, the uh, uh, pub, the feedback sessions with staff, was initially opposed to it, um, and then contacted me afterward to say, you know, having gotten my questions answered, having heard the information. Um, I think this is a good move. I think this is this is a, a smart direction for the city to go in. So, you know, we certainly, um, when you have a lot of folks with a lot of experience and a lot of expertise, there are bound to be um, differences of opinion. I'm, I'm certainly not questioning anyone's desire to do what's right for folks in the city of Bloomington, um, but I think this is a, a good direction to go. It, it could be better, absolutely. Um, but I, I think this is a good direction to go and I will be supporting it. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, just real briefly, I, I don't want to go over territory that's it's just been covered here, but I just want to get these inspections moving. I, I mean, especially look at the east side of the community. You've got first generation folks in, in some of these smaller ramblers that, that we're really seeing seismic turnover in some of the ownership in these neighborhoods. And I was just looking at a National Association of Realtors put out a report just a few months ago saying almost 20% of home buyers waived their inspections because the market's so competitive right now. So especially if we're trying to encourage uh, first time home buyers to come in in this really competitive market, absolutely nobody would recommend, and certainly the association didn't recommend waiving that inspection, but almost one out of five are, are doing it right now. And I wanna make sure we've got at, at least this basic level of coverage put in place. Uh, I, I agree that the process here was was kind of the tail waving the dog of how we arrived at this, but I, I do think staff did a great job reaching out to interested parties and stakeholders. And the fact that now we are more confident there won't be a backlog because we are able to provide this list of preferred private parties uh, answered a lot of the lingering concerns I had. So I, whichever way we go with this, I'm gonna support moving forward to the right now, just because I want these inspections to get moving. Uh, and whatever we do tonight, I, I just hope it's not uh, punting this any further. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so I, uh, I'll say first and foremost, um, uh, yes, these energy audits are critical and we absolutely have to have as much data as we can. And I want for the realtors who uh, got in touch with us, Thank you for that, but you have to help us reach our goals, right? The the I'm, I'm hoping that we can come up with, um, I think as uh, Mr. Myers put it, the best possible partners in making sure that we uh, raise the energy efficiency of our housing stock. So I'm excited about the partnership that we might have in that regard. Um, so uh, to, to the staff, um, I think you're doing you're trying to do the right thing by the residents. You always do. And I believe that high quality inspectors should be something that we all want to ensure housing stock uh, here for sale and for lease. And I am concerned about the problems that you've identified around inconsistency of data collection and the potentially low, uh, you know, that we should, we should make sure that potentially low quality inspections um, are a problem that we work on as a city. And um, so, you know, I think as Ms. Henderson said it, oversight in that in is a good thing. I also wanna thank you all for the kind of empowered and, and um, innovative approach here. I, I don't think, um, I know we talked a little bit about the, the idea of, of 
this going through a program and a policy and coming through planning and all this other stuff. But I also want to encourage people to be innovative and, 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 and dynamic in their approach to serving our residents. And so I want to commend that as a, pol a part of this. Do I, do I feel like it ended up being a little messy? Sure, but I don't think I don't think it was for anything other than because we're trying to do we're trying to quickly manage in a, in an efficient way. So I, I want to commend that and say thank you for doing that. And don't stop right that that we want to. I personally at least want to see that kind of thing happening. Um, ultimately, I believe that there are lots of ways to go about uh, uh, solving the problems that have been identified today. And I I personally don't know that that ever includes or should always include or the first idea we have should be that we should do it ourselves. Um, and so without the data that I was looking for to comprehensively understand that this has got to be the only solution that we come up with, I'm hesitant to move this under city control exclusively. I, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't feel like the right move for us here, so I won't be supporting this tonight. But I do wanna say this, regardless, I'm excited about you coming back to us in six months or so and giving us that data and helping us understand how whatever direction we choose tonight is doing towards this end, because I think that that's, um, that's in, gonna be an important piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So first I wanna thank all of those from the public who have reached out and weighed in, who have sat through hours and hours of council meeting now and, and weighed in and provided your own expertise and input. And I also want to echo our thanks, or thank my thanks to city staff for all of the work um, that has gone into this. I also um, echo what my colleagues have said around the process. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like this is it's made this a much harder policy decision for me because of the process, which I think others have alluded to. Um, and and I think because that because of that, it was a lot harder for me to get to a point where I wanted to support this proposal. Um, with that said, I am going to reluctantly, in, in many ways, support. Um, for me, the most important critical piece of this is excellent customer service for our residents. And to me, this is part of a solution to really increase those performance standards that we expect of, in, of inspectors. And so I, I would hope then, um, as we move this forward and as city staff move this forward, um, assuming it mo is moving forward, that we have, we, we, continue, we put that front and center, that we have extremely high performance standards around customer service, timeliness, and that when we're not meeting those standards, um, that, we can, that we revisit what we're doing and we make sure that, you know, if we have to go back to the previous model, whatever it is, we need to be humble enough to admit that either we need to, um, that we may need to do th things a little bit differently. Um, I also would encourage you to expand the number of inspectors uh, that you are considering. Um, I, know, I know we've ta been talking about 15. Um, I don't know where that number came from exactly other than 15 inspectors currently are doing most of the private inspectors in the city, but if we could expand that number, it would make me feel a lot better. Um, and again, just really wanna emphasize that resident-centered um, and then performance-based uh, system. So again, I'll be, I'll be supporting this tonight, um, but I do wanna emphasize that um, I, am very, I, I, I am very dissatisfied with the process and how this came about um, and the way that we had the conversations as council um, and the way that the community engagement happened. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I do, I do understand your point too about the nimbleness and, and being able to come up with solutions. So, thank you. Thank you, council member. So the way I looked at this, when we came out of last week, the two big questions that I had were um, whether or not we had a compelling reason to do this type of thing. And then the questions that were raised about timeliness. And, uh, and when I say compelling reasons, I, I mean, the, the, the back pitched flu, I think is a compelling reason. I'm wondering if there are additional compelling reasons. My guess is there probably are. If, there, if, if this was something happening, there are probably other examples as well. And uh, that, that concerns me because, uh, you know, what's our acceptable margin of error in this type of thing? And I just, I, I think uh, they may not be all as dramatic or all as big ticket, but I think it is a compelling reason to move forward. And then just the timeliness of everything, just looking at, um, you know, doing some quick back of the envelope math here, you know, um, if, 
hold on one second, I'm going to pull it up again. If we were talking about, uh, you know, in, in the peak of April and May with, it, with the inspections being like 150 to 200 a day or so, and that's 50 inspections a week, that's about three in a day for an inspector, and then to do re-inspects, I mean, that's a very manageable type of thing. I honestly believe that uh, the plan that is laid out, both in terms of staffing and in terms of the backups from uh, the private inspectors, that we do have the sp staffing in place to, to meet the timeliness demands that come about. And frankly, I get it, we have timely demands right now because the housing market is so hot, but at the same time, we don't have a whole lot of stock for sale right now. Nobody has a whole lot of stock for sale. So there's not like there is a huge number out there that, that is turning over very quickly. So uh, I, I do think with those questions answered, I'll, I'll echo, I was not thrilled with the, uh, the process here, but uh, I do think the ultimate goal of trying to ensure the housing stock in the city of Bloomington is a, is a, a, a reason to move this forward. Uh, seeing some compelling examples of where this might be necessary and that we can meet the timeliness demanded by realtors, I think it's, it's worth moving this forward. Councilmember Nelson, a question, one more thing to add? Yeah, just one quick question. Does this have to move forward in order to implement the energy portion that we talked about? Uh, Councilmember, I do not believe so because I think we have already approved that. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, can you correct me one way or another? Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, it does not have to move forward. The the change in the TOS inspections to uh, allow for the the um, energy audits to go into place April 1st. Uh, just coming back around to where we started this, though, that staff feels that this is the most effective way for us to implement that program. Okay, and I guess uh, just to follow up, so Mike, is this in order to implement that program or is this to address other concerns? Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Nelson, uh, that's a really good question. The, the reason that we uh, arrived at this place uh, in large part was due to the, uh, the quality concerns that uh, we evaluated once we started digging into how to do the energy audit. I think in retrospect, if you were to ask me if we weren't doing the energy audit, would this be best practice? I would say that we would want to have that conversation because I do believe that, you know, our objective is to have the the highest um, life safety inspections that we possibly can, uh, and um, I think that there's an argument that we should be doing it um, in this way for that purpose. And I understand that that's not the conversation we're having, but I think that's the question you're asking, right? So would we be doing this if it weren't for the energy audit? I would make an argument that um, for the for the benefit of the of the residents and for the quality uh, control that we're seeking, I would say uh, we would want to we would want to pursue that. Yes. Yeah. You no, know, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. City Manager. And um, it just my only point is that we don't need to do this to do the energy audit. And if this is something that we think is overall beneficial, I think again it should. There is no drastic need today to move this forward. Um, in order to do the energy portion of it. And in my opinion, everyone's voiced concerns about the process. And I think we should just follow our normal process if we think there's a problem that needs to be solved. So just, again, I, I, I can count noses. I'm probably gonna be on the wrong side of this one, but um, just wanna put that out there. Thank you, Council Member Nelson. Council additional conversation discussion. I do want to say, uh, others have brought it up as well, thank you to the folks who have spent time on this and who have looked into this and who are the experts in the field. And I, I respect what you have to say and what you have to bring forward. I honestly uh, know that it's, it's an important part of this whole discussion in the same way that the city experts who have been working on this decades as well, uh, bringing forward what they believe to be true and, and what they believe to be the best practice to move forward. So thank you much for for your input on all this. Councilmember Carter, anything else to add? You know, I guess I was just going to ask um, to Councilmember Nelson's request. I mean, if we did say we wanted to dig deeper, or we wanted more information, or we wanted to have more conversations and reconsider or consider this more broadly, like what would that look like? Because um, I feel like we, I, I'm open-minded to that, but I also feel like we've had quite a bit of conversation now about this. And so I'm, wondering what, um, despite my 
concerns and frustration with the process, we have gotten a lot of information. And so what additional information would we be getting um, by moving it, pushing it out, I guess? Councilmember D'Alessandro? If, if I may, Mr. Please. Mayor, uh, the, the information that I think is still, I hate to say it this way because I don't really know how else to say it, so I apologize. I don't mean to be flippant about this at all, but it still feels very much like a qualitative or a he said, he said, she said, she said kind of conversation as opposed to data-driven. And what I think we would, could potentially benefit from if we took more time would be that we'd actually gather data. Um, and what I mean by that is a rigid, you know, a regimented process by which there was deep analysis done of all the inspections. That audit thing that we've talked about that doesn't really exist, well, we do that for a while and we see what we actually learn. It, you know, and I don't mean that's that's not in that's not to be inconsistent with the um with the with the obvious expertise of the people that we have working for us and I appreciate the qualitative nature of that and obviously many of you feel like that's good enough and I get that I, the only th I'm just adding that like for me the thing that would help me understand the value of this the change not not that there shouldn't be consistency there should be not that we should guarantee the housing stock in a, if we can in Bloomington be of a certain quality we should um, but I think you do that by understanding where the problems actually exist and solving those problems. And I am just in the position of saying we're, we're not actually, I don't know if this actually solves those problems yet or not, because I don't know what data points, wh where we're deficient and where this will, I don't either. Is it me? Oh, okay. All right, fair enough, sorry. I, I don't understand, I still to this day don't understand exactly where, where the process today is deficient and how we're going to get better and then how we're going to measure that, which is why I said at the end of my comments, I'd like to be sure that we come back in six months regardless of how this goes and we look at the actual data. So yeah, I, I hope that helps. Councilmember Nelson, last word on this? Oh, oh Councilmember Loman, I just see oh, your hand up to go too. Councilmember Nelson. All right, thank you. Uh, in my mind, what what would uh, change or uh, through that process is taking a look at other municipalities, what they're doing, why out of the 90 metro cities, only 13 are doing this and what's going on in those communities. Um, are there other alternatives making our inspection an alternative to a buyer's inspection if they're opting out? So at least there was a requirement that there is some. I heard that that was an important component to our staff members. Um, the indemnification part of it. Um, and overall, I think that, you know, the reality in my mind is to not, this is candidly, I don't think something we should be doing at the city council level. You know, I think that this is something at the planning commission or something else that should be wrestling with these, thinking through these, what are the alternatives? How does this work? What are the pros and cons? Talking to all the stakeholders and then bringing forward a completely thought through thing. And we're trying to sit here from the dais and think these things through. And I just fundamentally think we should respect the people on our staff, in the public, on our planning commission, on our other commissions to do what they're supposed to do and to wrestle with these questions and bring it, you know, at least mostly fully baked to us. And there is, you know, again, I just point out, there is no need to pass this tonight to do the energy part. I think we all, we all have voted for it, I believe. Um, you know, we all want that to go forward. I think it's great. Even the, you know, even the realtors support that. I mean, it's, it's a great thing that we're doing. This doesn't have to happen tonight. Um, we can actually do this right. We can do it in the process we do with almost everything else we do in the city. There's no reason to do it this way. Um, so, uh, so in summary, I think there's a lot of specific information, but I think it's those other voices that would come into play in the process that would make this a better system in my mind. And I think that's what's absolutely critical. Councilmember Lohman. So Mayor, I just wonder, does it make some sense to, as a part of this motion, is what I'm hearing from uh, a large group of uh, folks, a need for uh, what we've done in the past, uh, an evaluation of services. I wonder if staff could uh, 
could you know could could bake that into this and we come back to this um you know after we you know if, presumably if we pass this tonight uh and do a, a more thorough uh review and move forward with with this and then do that do that accounting as a part of it i don't know if there's support for that uh if that makes sense to move this forward tonight uh i don't know mayor what you think well here's what i think we have we have a motion and a second on the table and if we decide to go that route, as, as you described, and we can do that at any time. We can give staff direction in that way at any time and, and move forward with that type of thing. Um, so that, that, that's what I think. And, and I think, uh, as I said, with the motion and a second on the table, um, frankly, folks, I, I think we're to the point where it's time to vote one way or another. And if we, if we decide to move forward, great. If we don't, we do not. So Councilmember Carter, short one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, Council Member Lohman just brought up an evaluation of service, but um, I'm just wondering if you could talk or if Mr. Verberge could talk a little bit about, about what that is in the city. Mr. Verberge, I'm going to take a shot at uh, are the service evaluations that we've done in a variety of departments over the past couple of years. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, the... The city did embark a number of years ago on, on doing several uh, focused evaluations every year. Um, we currently have one in process for uh, our HRA and for um, uh, facility services. Uh, council will remember that we did uh, our fleet uh, uh, fleet maintenance recently. Uh, we've looked at human services and public health and uh, IT. Um, so if that, uh, you know, I think it's probably a good idea to have a conversation early in the year here about what uh, evaluations the council would like to uh, do going forward too, but that's uh, if, if the question council member Carter is one just for uh, uh, everybody's understanding what we're talking about, especially people who may be watching that don't follow us all the time. Uh, that's that's what it is. We do a deeper dive into our operations uh, to make sure that we are answering answering those uh, critical questions of uh, who we're serving and and to what level of expectation and if we're meeting those expectations and if they're are uh, better or more efficient ways to do them, or even if we should continue to do them. Those are the kinds so, of questions we ask when we're doing service evaluations. Thank you for that. Um, and so, so then I would assume that we've not done one in the inspections area, and that, and I, I mean, I agree. Maybe our first step should be doing a servant service evaluation, and then if this comes out as being a a solution or recommendation. And it's backed up by that service evaluation. Because um, I, I mean, I feel like we could do that. We could pass this motion and then we could do it, but we're changing a whole system and then we're evaluating it. It makes se more sense to me to evaluate it and then make changes. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. Folks, I'm going to call the question here. We have a motion and a second on the table to adopt an ordinance amending chapter 14 of the city code related to the time of sale housing evaluations. Mr. Brillard. Carter. No. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Nay. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson? Nay. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries four to three. Thank you much for the discussion. This was a good discussion. It uh, and, and was a good, um, a good consideration of a lot of different possibilities here. And I, I firmly agree, yes, it's, if, it's, if it's not done, we need to come back and take a look at it. We need to evaluate it. We need to make sure that this is the right way to do it. And if not, if we, make, if we continue to make changes on this to try to improve it, um, to make things better in the inspections world in the city of Bloomington, then we should do that. So I agree with that completely. But thank you for the conversation. Thank you all for your input on this as well. Greatly appreciate it. We will move. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mayor, me. we have summary publication thank on Thank you. That. Just saw that, Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you very much. Do we have a motion Mayor for Mayor summary Mayor. publication on this? Mayor, be happy to make that motion. Council Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance amending chapter 14 of city code related to time of sale housing evaluation. 
Second, Martin. We have a motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin for summary publication. No further discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Item 7.3 on our agenda is another public hearing uh, related to this most recent one. This is on the time of sale housing evaluations and fees amendment. Ms. Gillespie. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. So um, in regards to the time of sale fee schedule, um, next slide, please. So the city currently charges $190 for the time of sale inspection. Um, as part of the energy disclosure um, presentation that Emma had given back in September, um, we had proposed or she had stated that obviously a fee increase would be um, moving forward with the extra time that city staff would be uh, being in the home, equipment that needs to be purchased, maintenance of that equipment and ongoing supply costs as a re result of that time of sale disclosure requirement. So in addition to those city costs as part of that $60 increase, there is a $5 fee uh, report, fee per report for the Center for Energy and Environment. And so they are going to be um, housing all of that um, inter information on their database and uh, providing reports back to the Sustainability Commission based off of the um, energy disclosure um, part of the time of sale. So currently the city is one of the lowest cost programs with other municipalities, um, as you could see by the slide here, um, they do not currently perform the energy audit. So this would bring our costs into alignment with those cities. And also we would still be providing the energy audit um, as part of our time of sale inspection. Next slide. Any questions? Council questions on this? I'm not seeing everybody on the screen, so if you have a question, please give a shout. No questions? No clarifications? All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Carter. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I noticed that other c cities um, have a fee for duplexes, and we're proposing just one fee. Uh, is there a reason why we wouldn't want to have a fee for duplexes, a different fee. I don't totally know why those other cities have separate fees, so um, I guess I'm just curious about Mayor, that. Mayor, council member, um, we currently provide just a single cost. So when someone is selling a duplex, um, we do do it for kind of a discounted price, um, similar to what the private inspectors were saying. We're kind of already on site. We're not having to make that extra trip. We're not taking that extra call. So we're um, just providing it at the same cost. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And again, I'm not seeing everybody on screen. If you've got a question, please chime in. All right, hearing none. This is a public hearing. I'd like to open the public hearing now for item 7.3, public hearing on the time of sale, housing evaluations and fees amendment. Anyone in the council? Chambers wish to speak on item 7.3. Riza, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to item 7.3? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Riza has dropped off of a meeting under the assumption that there were no callers on the phone. Okay. Um, we at least have one more, two more public hearings, so I wonder if we have to get her back here. Um, last call for anybody in the chambers? Ten seconds. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I do have Riza on the line again. Oh, okay. I'll Thank you. you. Riza, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to item 7.3? Join the public comment, please press. If you, join to, if you wish to join the public comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. No one has pressed star one on their telephone keypad. Please continue. Thank you. 
quick bite at the apple here? Not, not that I want to bring them. Okay, so the reason that we charge more for duplexes is there's more to look at. There's another kitchen. There's usually another furnace. Um, there's their bigger properties and their investment properties. So while we want to keep costs low for the citizen, citizenry from an inspection standpoint, um, there is more to look at. You do spend more time on a duplex than you do on a single-family home. And um, from the RFP process, you know, that, that may be something that you want to look at, adding 10 or 20 bucks to a duplex. I don't think it's going to hurt anybody, and you'll recoup some costs on that. Um, but there's no, you know, I, I can understand why you would want to keep the fee the same. So I really have no dog in that fight. <laughs> Thank you for the extra information. It's appreciated. Anyone else wishing to speak to item 7.3? Seeing no one coming forward, Council, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved, Martin. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 7.3. No further council discussion. Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Public hearing on item 7.3 is closed. Council, any questions, comments, concerns on item 7.3? Any unanswered questions you're looking to have clarified? Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. I think the only thing that I would uh, ask that uh, staff do uh, kind of going forward, and, and maybe we will uh, do this going forward, is if there's a way to, as we look at equity, um, as part of this, I know that that's how we sort of got to where we're, we're at today. But uh, if there's additional ways to uh, uh, look at uh, sliding the scale on this uh, for those folks, um, um, I hope that we will consider that um, kind of going forward. I kind of uh, push that innovative uh, button for, for staff. So um, that's all uh, that I push forward with that. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Additional questions, comments? Seeing none, Council, I look for action on item 7.3. Mayor, I'm happy to make that motion. Council Member Martin. Uh, Mayor, I move that we adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the City Code related to time of sale housing evaluations and fees. Second, Coulter. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Coulter to adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the City Code related to time of sale housing evaluation and fees. No further council discussion on this. Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Council Member Martin, uh, summary publication. Uh, Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance amending Appendix A of the City Code related to time of sale housing evaluations and fees. Second, Coulter. We have a motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Coulter for summary publication on item 7.3. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Item 7.4 on our agenda. Our, our next public hearing is for targeted residential picketing ordinance. And I believe uh, Mr. Verbrugge, Ms. Manderscheid, I can't remember in my notes exactly which one of you two was going to take this one, so... Uh, Mayor, members, uh, it was a bit of a group effort. Um, okay. uh, City Manager, do you want to do you want to say anything before I get started on the PowerPoint? You go ahead and roll. Okay. Um, so um, one of the benefits of the Office 360 rollout was this fancy new PowerPoint slides. So um, at another time when we have more time, yeah, welcome some feedback on this fancy new 
PowerPoint slide situation. But in any case, um, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about targeted residential picketing in Minnesota. And um, this is a topic that was raised to uh, the legal department's attention, um, I think it was over a year ago. And um, back in sort of the late fall, um, it was brought to our attention again, uh, and we were asked to uh, get organized and uh, you know, sort of notice the public hearing and do, start doing the research in earnest. And so we're here to here before you tonight uh, to discuss this ordinance. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to provide a little bit of background as to what targeted residential picketing is in Minnesota. It's been around, um, the ordinance regulation of it has been around since 1990. Uh, uh, Rose, a lot of this, uh, uh, White Bear Township is my understanding. A lot of the people left, but one person stayed. And, and the, the... Excuse me, Ms. Mandershine? Melissa? ...and says being constitutional. Uh, constitution Melissa, you're chopping in and out. Maybe if you turned your camera off. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sure, I'll try that. Try that. Thank you. The court found that it was a constitutional. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what's been happening. I've been trying lots of different connections tonight. Um, so the key things that the court found um, on appeal was that the ordinance was content neutral, na narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest, and left open ample alternative channels of communication. That's the standard test um, for this type of constitutional challenge. Um, and so those are the key elements that we look for, we look for as we're putting together um, ordinances like this targeted residential picketing. Next slide. I thought it would also be helpful for you all to have an understanding of, of how widespread um, the use of the targeted residential picketing ordinances are. Um, I organized them roughly in chronological order, and um, you'll see here in 1990, you have the White Bear Township, Vadness Heights shortly thereafter. There were a couple in the 90s, and the bulk of them have been in 2020 and 2021. A couple of them, I wasn't able to find the exact dates of the passage, and so I didn't list them exactly. Next slide. I think it's also helpful to know that state law regulates um, and defines targeted residential picketing. It's actually one of the types of behaviors that is uh, falls within the definition of harassment uh, in state law. Uh, the difference um, with the harassment approach as compared to what we have here tonight that we're considering uh, is that in the state law context, the victim of the harassment has to apply for the restraining order, and that order would come from the courts. Next slide. I thought it would be helpful to get a little bit more information um, in front of you about sort of the differences between the state law um, HRO approach and the ordinance approach. Under the HRO uh, approach that would arise out of a state law um, harassment uh, remedy, in that case, the victim has to draft the application to the court. They have to uh, prepare uh, the affidavits. They have to obtain the witness statements. They have to pull together all the paperwork and then file it with the courts. And this... Um, they also have to pay a, a filing fee. Uh, it can be waived, but again, you have to file additional paperwork in order to ask the courts to waive that fee. And then you also need to coordinate and appear in court uh, and be present uh, in order to make that request. The court um, then uh, provides the uh, requester, the applicant, with uh, an order if it's granted. And then the victim has to serve that order on uh, the person that is subject to the harassment restraining order. So again, as you can see, the burden is on the injured party in this instance. Uh, and when you have, it's a, it's a person by person endeavor. So if you have a, a situation where there are lots of people that are, um, that you're trying to get a harassment restraining order for, you could potentially have different outcomes for a large group of people if under the HRO approach. 
The other thing is that um, the H a violation of a harassment restraining order has a shall arrest requirement, whereas under the ordinance violation, uh, it's a misdemeanor and, and violators could be cited and released. And um, the police chief can get into the details of that in greater de uh, as we proceed in this um, presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so Bloomington's specific ordinance is broken into several different sections. Uh, it largely follows the same approach that has been taken uh, in, the, in 2020 and 2021 by a lot of other cities. In the beginning, we have findings and a purpose statement. Those statements um, reflect back to the court opinions that have been delivered on this topic. The overwhelming right that the courts are trying to protect is the well-being, tranquility, and privacy of residents in their resident residence. Uh, you'll you'll see, you'll see the court talk about um, how this type of uh, picketing in front of one's residence causes emotional distress. It can ob obstruct and interfere with the homeowner and the occupant's right to leave and return to their home uh, and also has a harassing uh, effect. The other thing that the courts talk about is this type of a regulation doesn't prohibit all kinds of speech and expression. There are other ways to communicate um, and express in, and use your right of freedom of speech that does not have this impact on individual residents. So we defined uh, this type of residential picketing in a way that very similarly mimics how state law defines it. Many other cities uh, have a three-part definition. In Bloomington's uh, approach proposed for your consideration tonight, we took a two-part uh, approach uh, in for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to, uh, as much as possible, be similar to state law, but also because we wanted it uh, to be uh, something that could be as easy as possible uh, defined and understood by our law enforcement community. Then it moves on to the next section, which is the just general prohibition statement, and then the penalty statement. We also included a severability clause, which basically is fairly standard in our language when we're uh, tackling uh, constitutional issues. And that says if any part of this is, is found to be invalid, um, the rest of it still stands. So for example, if a part A or part B of the definition was found to be invalid, the, the balance of it would be left there. Next slide. Uh, in talking with um, the police chief and the city manager, we thought it would be helpful to provide some examples of the types of behaviors that would run afoul of this particular ordinance. And the um, police chief can get into some more details as we uh, get into the discussion portion. Real briefly, uh, under A, you'll see it is has to be directed at a particular dwelling. It's not a generalized uh, effort. It's a it's a directed, particularized uh, effort. Activity is what the, the word that the courts have used. It has to be an active activity. So marching, standing, patrolling, or similar type behavior. And then there has to be an adverse effect on the occupant of the dwelling. So the adverse effect that the courts have recognized is safety, security, or privacy of the occupants of that dwelling. It's not a generalized concern. It's a particularized concern. It's a particularized effect. It's also a, an effect that's unique to the folks that are living and to the occupants that are living in that dwelling. So for example, we thought, uh, and some of these things are, are, you know, pointing a laser pointer into somebody's residence is already a, a violation of the law. Uh, the other thing that we talked about that would be a potential uh, violation of A is entering the, the curtilage of somebody's residential dwelling. And that generally, that's a legal term, but it's generally thought of as the type of area immediately around your dwelling. Um, it counts as a, a home for legal for purposes, and we use that term under the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. Uh, it's um, 
it's oftentimes if someone has a fence sort of within that fenced area, it's the area around your house that you intend to keep private uh, and you intend to have a, a heightened sense of privacy and security and safety in that space. The second under B, um, it's uh, the examples that we came up it would be, for example, if the protesters were standing in front of the driveway uh, ingress and egress to a particular residential dwelling, either preventing the occupants of the house from leaving or from returning. Um, similarly, if they had access um, on their sidewalk and they were prevented that access point as well. Um, it is relevant to think about uh, and to discuss adjacent property owners. And I want to note that that's a different analysis for adjacent property owners. This is the particularized analysis for the occupants of the dwelling that is the target of the activities. So there may be other uh, criminal violations or code violations that are occurring um, on the adjacent property owners' properties, um, but it would probably not be targeted residential picketing. Next slide, please. So with regard to the process and next steps, as you, as you recall, uh, we had this notice for public hearing uh, at our last meeting. The public hearing was opened and the matter was continued to tonight. So my request and recommendation would be that you take public testimony this evening. Um, when that's concluded, you would close the public hearing and then consider action on the proposed ordinance and summary publication resolution. With that, we're ready for questions. And I know that we've got the police chief and uh, the city manager available as well. Thank you much. Council, questions on this? No questions, Council? Council Member Lohman. Well, I'll get started. <laughs> um, so one question that I just have is, um, uh, in terms of people wanting to protest public officials. Uh, so for example, uh, if they want to, you know, I, I take a vote on something uh, and they want to come in front of my house and uh, as long as they're not blocking my driveway and they're out in front of it, uh, does this ordinance prevent that from happening? Uh, does this chill their speech? Help me understand uh, what can and can't happen uh, if we pass this thing tonight. Ms. Mandershed? Uh, Mayor members, it does apply to public officials. It applies to anyone, uh, any occupant of a dwelling. So my question is, can they protest in front of my house? Again, Mayor and members, it's the activities that are being undertaken. Um, it's not the, simply the fact that there's somebody out in front of your house. Um, if you look at the definition um, in the ordinance that's in the packet, uh, page 192, I believe. Um, it needs to be marching, standing, patrolling, or other similar activities that are targeted and that make the occupants feel that their safety, security, and privacy um, are adversely affected or that their ingress and egress is being hindered by the activity that's occurring in front of or you know directed at the residential dwelling. So if it's just somebody walking on the sidewalk, up and down on the sidewalk, walking their dog, that's not gonna be a violation of a targeted residential picketing ordinance. If they're um, engaging in other activities and the, for example, occupant calls 911 and says, I'm afraid, dot, 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 then that could arguably be a violation of this ordinance. So what I'm hearing, hearing being stated here is that it's it's possible when somebody comes, as long as you are the occupant of it, regardless whether or not you are a public official or not, uh, this applies to residential uh, property anywhere. Uh, it, it, the standard is the the occupant just needs to feel threatened, and that's enough to uh, make it so that uh, you wouldn't be able to protest in front of a. Uh, of, of my house. Uh, Mayor members, so what would happen typically, you know, the, someone would typically call 911. Um, the police would, uh, they, they, they take uh, 9 the 911 operator would, would receive the information 
and um, likely dispatch the police. The police would likely come in and talk to the uh, occupants of the home and engage in a conversation about what they're feeling, uh, what are the adverse impacts that they're having, and um, and that would be how they would collect the police report and the information um, that would be used to decide whether there has been a violation of the ordinance. You know, for example, by comparison, it it is uh, if somebody was standing out, a whole bunch of people were standing outside of your house with get well soon signs because you just got home from the hospital and you had been in the hospital recovering from some sort of surgery. That, that would be people potentially standing in front of your house, but they're, if they're holding get well soon signs and that doesn't adversely affect your safety, security, or privacy, or ingress and egress, that's not going to be a violation of the ordinance. Oh, but it's up to the it's up to the individual that's inside of the house, whether or not they feel that that particular, whatever they're doing outside is the, uh, the reason why I wanted to establish that is that... Uh, Part of my reluctance in this and the thing that I'm concerned about is that under open meeting law, uh, and we've talked about this, um, and I know that we're not under open meeting law now, we're under some other uh, type of uh, piece, uh, you know, our representatives, you know, we have to publish our, our addresses uh, where we're at so people can come, you know, if they have something that they're, they're concerned about, they want to address us and talk to us. Um, I, I want you to kind of opine on that um, because I'm a little bit concerned about that. You know, now I'm in my, my residency now because we have a we have a health crisis that makes total sense. But if we then pass this tonight, it feels like if I don't agree with the speech that they they are making outside, uh, even if I can get out of my driveway and I feel threatened, um, I can shut down that protest in front of my house or my neighbors could. You know, if if it was you know uh, adjacent to my house, is that what we're saying? Help me if I'm not I'm not understanding this correctly. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor members, when you when you say shut down the protest, um, I think it might be helpful to hear from the police chief about sort of what that process would look like, um, and then just to kind of round out the description that you're making about the open meeting law. So um, for those of you listening at home, um, we, typically um, during non-pandemic times, we're gathered in the chambers. And um, there is a there is a, a provision under the open meeting law where the um, the members of the elected body or appointed body that's subject to the open meeting law would be appearing from a location that is not their home. And in that case, the address of that location, the address has to be published uh, in the packet um, of the meet in the meeting notice. And in that case, that location has to be open and accessible to the public. So um, you would not be appearing from your dwelling in that instance because your dwelling is not open and accessible to the public. Now, what we're under right now is um, a different provision of state law in that it allows us to appear um, without providing all of our addresses and we can appear anywhere. We can be calling in from anywhere um, and we don't need to provide those addresses um, and it's related to the pandemic. If you recall, um, we were struggling with the COVID outbreaks and that people were unable, we were unable to get quorums. And so there is this provision under the law between people quarantining and um, having symptoms and not wanting to expose people. It didn't make sense. Um, and it, uh, and the law allows us to meet how we're meeting now. So with regard to that small type of time um, and provision of the open meeting law that allows you to appear in a in a location that's open to the public and accessible that would not be this it would not fall under this targeted pick residential picketing because your home is not open and accessible to the public chief hartley anything any thoughts on that uh, if not i've got a couple of questions for you okay let me just uh i'll uh mr mayor uh members of the Council, Council Member Lohman. Um, let me just kind of give a little bit of a, a perspective of kind of how we um, how we go about currently addressing protests, whether they be on uh, at City Hall, Civic Plaza here, whether it be on private businesses um, or in a residential neighborhood. We've we've got recent history of all 
all of those three. Um, currently, what we'll do is we'll respond, we'll respect property rights, we'll stand by, and if we see a violation, uh, we do address it. But we address it in a measured response so that, you know, just because it's something that may be minor, we have to take into account how many police officers are on scene. And we don't, if it's something that we can just, you know, obviously we have discretion in those types of circumstances. Um, you know, in this, in this targeted residential picketing uh, ordinance proposal, you hear well-being, tranquility, privacy. These are all things that we're trying to assist currently under current state statute and local ordinance. Um, the examples of the lasers and entering the curtilage, um, as, as the city attorney alluded to, uh, those are already covered under state statute. We could take enforcement action against those. Um, the concern that, that I have and I want to make the council uh, aware of is that um, I just, my, my, my initial response or, or concern would be is the gray in this ordinance. And I'm, I'm, I think you're alluding it to it, Council Member Lohman, with um, this, this kind of walking the tight line of a First Amendment right. And, you know, I, I just, I've talked with command staff about this this afternoon, got their input. Um, but the concern that I have is we're putting a police officer into a real a predicament here because if they go out, and to your point, it's, it's whether you feel your definition of threatened. And everybody may feel threatened in different levels. Now, by no means, you know, dis diminishing the, a person who feels threat. But um, if you go out and under the the, the current, um, you know, the current current wording of this, uh, you're insistent on the police taking action on a group that's in front of your house, simply walking, marching, patrolling. They're 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 doing nothing other than just assembling. Um, but they do it under the current proposal, they would be violating a city ordinance. Um, you know, we would again use discretion, but my fear would be having to ultimately go down and disperse that group and then having to potentially, because it's always there, use force on that group. You're, you're asking the police police officers be put again, we've, we've got a history, we've got experience working protests. This is just a little different because um, in the past, we've got violations that we've seen. This here would simply be, I'm just standing. Now I'm protesting in front of Mike Hartley's house, but I'm not threatening. I'm not just because he says he's threatened. I think there's a lot of gray there. My concern is that if we ultimately had to use force, it would look terrible that, um, that there's people exercising their First Amendment rights and you have a police department that is using levels of force upon them. So um, I just, again, those are the concerns that I have. And um, I just, I, I'm, it's, my, it's my job to make sure that we're not putting our officers in a situation that is a no-win situation for them. So with that, I will take additional questions. Councilmember D'Alessandro. So I, ha I have one other question. Uh, for uh, Ms. Manderscheid, but since, if you don't mind, um, Chief, um, I guess the, the may, maybe this is for both of you, I apologize. Um, it explicitly says affects the safety, security, or privacy of an occupant of the dwelling. And to me, those things feel fairly um, objective, uh, that it's a dis a something that you could discern. So, you know, for example, safety might be that I'm standing in the middle of, of a group of people and they won't let me leave, right? Um, uh, security would be that, you know, they're shining bright lights in my house, which like you said is maybe already covered. Privacy being that, you know, they're standing at my ring doorbell and they're pressing it over and over again and I can't even like watch the television program I have inside. I mean, those things to me feel objective and, and I'm, I'm curious about whether or not there's a standard of objectivity uh, or an observant objectivity that you would bring as a as a, uh, a uh, an officer observing the behavior and being able to to say objectively, I believe that this was a safety privacy you know whatever violation. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, member of the council, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, that's a great example. Um, that's a little bit more clear because if they're up at your at, uh, within your curtilage on your front steps, ringing your doorbell. 
um, you would have every right under current state statute to say, I don't want them on my property. And if we were there assisting, as we have done in the past in residential uh, protests, uh, we could take action. We would give them a warning, tell them they're not allowed on the property, issue that trespass warning, and then if they continue to violate, then you could take uh, action against that individual that's choosing to violate that that that's that statute or ordinance. Um, I think you're you're spot on with the 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 subjectivity of 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 what people fear, you know. And again, um, I don't want no offense. I mean, I I don't want anybody out in front of my house because I feel bad for my neighbors. I mean, I I you know as long as they're letting me come and go and. But um, I think that would is what kind of getting to a point where you have a clear look. You know, you like like the city manager said, you would go up, you would talk to the homeowner, you'd get a sense of where they're, you know, what has happened, what they've observed, especially if we weren't already on scene, uh, and you would have to make kind of a game day decision at that point based on the factors. Um, and again, it's it makes it tougher when you know if the officer was to say well you know mr homeowner i i don't necessarily see that there's a safety issue here well what do you mean my privacy i'm I, you know they're in front of my house well it, it's they're they're standing out there but not necessarily there are no laser pointers I, again it's it's there's 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 a lot of gray there we we operate in this profession for for you know centuries on discretion there is discretion there but having to tell that homeowner who is is pleading that they are in fear that you don't think it rises to that level and we're just going to pack up and go um, because the alternative is to go down and tell the group to disperse and when they say no um, that that's again that's getting back to my my initial concern do you mind if i ask the thank oh, you please please so the original question that i had thank you for that chief uh the original question i had was um that it um was um, a, a funk and Ms. Manishai, you can clarify this for me. Um, it looks to me like, um, there's multiple things that have to be true, right? In, in a given, in a given piece. So first off, they have to take a particular action. And second of all, that action needs to be deemed by the individual, uh, to be violating or affecting adversely the safety, security, or privacy of the occupant. Um, it, th those have to be in combination. Uh, do I have that right? Uh, Mayor members, I would say that the activity that's being undertaken by one or more people directed at uh, the occupant is a, is what's adversely affecting the occupant. Okay, okay. So, it, it, again, is that does that in your mind result in some uh, ob objectivity? Meaning, meaning, it would be clear from an observer that. For example, uh, there are six cars lined up and I can't get out of my driveway or um, that it's 10 o'clock at night and bright lights are being shined into my house um, and anybody who is glancing by would see that, for example. Um, what, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to be sure I understand is that um, we, we are we aren't trying to address issues of he said, she said. In, in other words, we're not we're not saying, you know, I as a public official, I know that I have I've, I take on a certain responsibility to be accessible to the public. Th th so that might mean that I would step out of my house to try to address the crowd of people that would be there. For example, that might be a, a thing I do. Um, it, it's it has to be, uh, I guess, um, does it have to be to rise above that, I guess, in a way that a, a person from a third party perspective would be, it would be easy to see that that was, in fact, at least on a subjective basis, you could say, yep, that's a violation or that's not. And I'm asking this question because there's lots of, you know, I think to Chief's perspective, there's lots of interpretation in the law, right? So, for example, a woman could, a woman could, claim that she's being beaten by her husband, but because we don't have any evidence, you can't do anything to that person. And then it escalates and escalates. The next thing you know, you have, uh, you know, that happens a lot in domestic violence cases, right? And there's a subjectivity there. Um, likewise, you have a situation with stand your ground where by the time that the person decides that they have 
stood their ground, there's a major problem or, you know, there's somebody's dead maybe. And, and the decision hasn't been, has, has been removed from the objective or third party, right? Because the action already happened. And so I'm, 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 I'm trying to use these kind of hyperbolic examples to understand like, is it one of these, I know it when I see it type things, or is it something that we have to be very, very clear about? I hope that, I hope I didn't convolute that too badly. I apologize. Uh, Mayor members, the um, I think you you raise a very good point. Um, the chief and I talked to him, have been talking for a couple of weeks about this ordinance. Uh, there are certainly things where they they are already uh, crimes. They're already violations. Those are clear. Um, those are those are not uh, at all subjective. Uh, they are objective. Um, however, um, there are other there are within that subjectivity um, is essentially uh, what this is all about in that some people are not going to be bothered by certain behaviors and other people are going to be dramatically impacted by them and in um, there so there's sort of two at least two aspects um, playing in my mind about this particular sort of subjectivity. There is the recipient, the the occupant's experience, um, and for them that's very real. Um, it's the other people who have a subjective opinion about it, um, and so that's sort of one part. The other part is um, the the police when they arrive because they're relying on the statements of the of the occupant um they're making evaluations on the scene um you know they have they are trying to be a, as objective as possible but again they're evaluating the scene and they're probably not they're probably not there with firsthand um observations in many instances so um there is there is Within this type, within this body of law, there is a level of uh, subjectiveness to it, but that's essentially the nature of it. Um, if you look back to the state law and to the harassment element, sometimes, you know, if somebody um, if somebody sends you a letter in the mail, some people might, you know, and it's a very kind of scary letter, um, some people might find that to be a harassing behavior. Um, and not obviously regulated by this. In other cases, if the person walks up and hand delivers that letter to you, that same letter, that's going to cross the line for somebody. So um, there is a, an inherent level of subjectivity to this because of what it is. Councilmember Martin and then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember Martin. I thank you very much. And this might be. Well, I guess kind of two things. My second getting more to maybe the philosophy behind the drafting of this. Uh, so if I'm understanding this correctly, most of what I would be picturing as somebody coming into a neighborhood and raising heck in protest on the front of my property would get covered by existing law. If they're leaning on car horns, that might be a noise issue or completely blocking access to the street, things like that, it would be covered. So. In my understanding, what is added to this is the ingress egress to the property itself and the uh, admittedly kind of subjective or moving target emotional distress of that specific property owner. Is that is the way I'm kind of conceptualizing that right? Uh, Mayor and members, uh, B is um, the, the part B of the definition um, is uh, you know, it's blocking someone's ingress and egress, right? Um, it is um, black. Yeah, on its face, it looks black and white. Um, I think you, you know, there's bound to be arguments with subjectivity within that as well. Like I was backing out, and then they, you know, I mean, people are going to create all kinds of scenarios. Um, these are not like calm times, right? Um, when this type of behavior is happening outside of your house. Um, now within a um there are there are criminal violations i think it's important to separate those criminal violations from what this is this is a, a violation of the city code which is a misdemeanor um it's it is it's also being um the penalty is a misdemeanor but it's different from for example going and getting a harassment restraining order it's a totally different process um and so 
uh, the court ev is going to evaluate a request by a victim um, in a in a way that is not too dissimilar from what's happening here. It's just the process that's so different. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Well, and I, I guess I'm, I'm just coming at this from the angle of, and it was mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, are there municipalities that have tackled this from the angle of saying there's a whole lot of neighbors around here? that would probably be just as freaked out with a street full of people, even if they're not blocking the end of their driveway, even if their protest isn't targeted at them. Uh, maybe they've got a family member in the house for whom that's very traumatic, or they got animals freaking out for hours because they don't know what's going on outside. Is, is there, are there municipalities that have taken that from the angle of injurious or deleterious to the surrounding neighborhood, not just reliant on the emotional distress of the one person whose house is being targeted? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mayor members, there there is there are not a lot of cases cases about this. Um, I did find some cases that talked about um, like that it was too broad to block off people from the entire neighborhood. That that was too much. That was that was going too far. Um, you couldn't. Um, there was another one that another case about a setting up a certain distance from the house so that it would capture a couple of other properties or to say the target and the adjacent houses. The, uh, the court was not comfortable with that either. So uh, the case law that we have indicates that it's when it's targeted to a particular property and to the occupants of that property. That's the case law we have. Now, what would a court do if we changed our particular approach here and it was challenged um, it's it's not clear we do know that it needs to be narrowly tailored we do know that it needs to be content neutral we do know that it needs to leave out other it needs to have other ample channels of communication we know that to be true um, but how far the court is willing to go um, is 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 not known at this time without without a specific challenge the other thing um, is that the world is different than it was in 1990, in 1993, when things were happening in White Bear Township. You know, people didn't have um, cell phones. Everybody didn't have cell phones. Everybody didn't have, you know, a ring cameras and things like that. We have so much more video data now. Um, and so uh, the world is just a very different place um, than, you know, than, the, than how the court, um, the facts that the court had at the time in 1990 or 93 in Wiper Lake. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I will say, I'll add one other thing. Um, I did in preparation um, for the putting these materials together, I did reach out to the League of Minnesota Cities and asked if they um, were aware of any particular challenges or had any um, guidance with regard to drafting. Um, and they were not aware of any other challenges. There are, have been cities that have had um, specific instances of, um, of these types of activities in front of certain people's homes. Uh, and those cities have um, either proactively or um, afterwards adopted ordinances such as this. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. So I've got a question for you. Um, uh, uh, Chief Hartley, uh, I want to give you a couple of examples here because I'm looking at the uh, at, at the uh, particular ordinance here, A and B, when it talks about home and dwelling and feeling of well-being, tranquility, and privacy. And then it kind of goes into this B piece in terms of emotional distress to a dwelling or a operative. So here's, a, here's an example of something that was shared with me. This gentleman uh, happened to be uh, uh, running for office and they consider themselves to be a person of color. And so they were walking up and down the street and uh, they knocked on a door um, and then the police were immediately called. Um, so I want you to kind of walk me through if this particular ordinance was passed and the person felt that that person, we're using the lens of equity, um, how would the police department handle this type of situation? Mr. Mayor, Members of the council, council member Lohman, uh, with every call, it's its uh, own set of facts. And uh, I would imagine that you'd go out and you would ascertain pretty quickly that a person who was canvassing a neighborhood, knocking on doors, probably wasn't specifically targeting one house. So if 
if you're you're asking a question of would this apply, I, I think the fact that you're not targeting your, you know, the, the call would come in as unfortunate as it would be that somebody would call on someone who's running for office, but um, that you well, would, I beg to differ. I beg to differ with you. If you are canvassing, you are targeting certain homes. Yeah, but only by knocking on the door. And I think once somebody would tell you that I'm not interested, I don't vote in city elections. Again, it's kind of a hypothetical, and I know my answer is hypothetical. But I think an officer would would figure out very quickly that. And I, I'm familiar with the with the call that you're citing. I was involved in that. You and I spoke on the phone over that. And I think uh, I think it would be very quickly figured out that uh, this ordinance would not apply. Um, and that really there was no law broke at all by somebody who's simply going up and um, knocking on doors. By, by the letter of this, though, if you walked across the street, I mean, you're still within their purview. So I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Two folks come, next next one, two folks come to your house. Uh, they, they knock on your door. They've got red hats on. And uh, they're knocking on your door. Then they you know, they, they back back away from your house. Um, uh you know, and they're out there and they're, you know, just, you know, you tell them to back up, they back off. They're, they're on the, they're not on the, uh, on your, your egress. They are standing on the street and they're just out there, um, just out there talking. Um, and then the folks that are inside of the, uh, uh, uh of, of their house say, you know what? I feel threatened. Uh, they're out in front of my house. They're not on my property, but they're out in front. I feel threatened. Feels like a protest to me. You know, Chief Hartley, I want you to get those folks out of here. They got a red hats on. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, council member Loman, I, I don't disagree that this is, uh, there are some challenges with this proposal. Um, under that circumstance, I would imagine that the officers would respond. Uh, they would talk to the homeowner. They would figure out what sense of, you know, fear that they're, they're having. Uh, they would try to, you know, figure out whether a crime has been committed, and I, I agree. If uh, if they are, if that homeowner is aware of this ordinance and they want to try to define that as a protest or people who are standing, uh, trolling, uh, walking back and forth, um, I could just tell you that I don't know that you're going to get a lot of the BPD officers that are going to probably buy into that, and take enforcement action. Um, but again, that was the that was the reason why I brought up the concerns that I have from a police department standpoint. Well, I guess I guess my concern is is that uh, from an equity standpoint, depending on who those people are outside, you know, this could be construed. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, so I guess my question would be if if the police department decided not to enforce this, then now what does that put us in legal uh, situation? So these are the things that I, I have questions about uh, with this. Um, in spirit, I don't have a problem with this, but in practice, in terms of how you execute this, this could be used uh, uh, for uh, disturbing ways. And I'm trying to understand this in my head, how this works. Yeah, uh, Council Member Lohman, I, I don't disagree. Um, you know, we use discretion on a daily basis in enforcing, uh, you know, whether it be state and local state laws, local ordinances, and um, you know, I I, I would. I would hope that there wouldn't be bias in how we go about, but uh, you know, anytime you have some vagueness or some some gray in anything, uh, it can be interpreted a number of different ways. But I think to the, the city attorney's uh, point is that you'd have to, you know, have a have a good conversation, clear and understand that that complainant who's calling the police in the first place, and try to ascertain what particular elements are there that. Uh, lend support to the fact that they feel threatened or, um, you know, they're, they're adversely, their, their safety is adversely affected by the actions of those people standing out front. So I think we've established here that this, it, it's subjective in terms of the homeowner or the person being picketed, in terms of the police as they respond. It's, it's subjective based on the circumstances and the set of facts there at that time. And, and Frankly, we can come up with we could come up with uh, an endless amount of hypotheticals on this, and I don't uh, don't disagree that it's interesting to to kind of mine into this a little bit and try and figure out exactly what the possibilities are. But what I'd like to do is try and uh, get some specific questions about this ordinance to move the conversation along to see if we can get to a point where we then can have a public hearing and then have the discussion on it uh, as as we move forward. So, um, I see Councilmember 
Nelson and Councilmember uh, Coulter, but I saw um, Mr. Verbrugge, you jumped in. Uh, was there a specific thing that you wanted to, to comment on as well? I did, Mr. Mayor, and I, I appreciate your comments. You know, rather than um, you know focusing on specific behaviors that might trigger lists, I, I just want to go back to sort of the beginning, which is this is basically, not exactly, but basically matching state law. So, you know, if somebody uh, was experiencing this today under state law without a city ordinance, the, the, the remedy that they have is to seek a restraining order, which does nothing to address the issue at the point in time. What we're saying with this ordinance is that this behavior, if it indeed reaches that threshold where given police discretion, is something that violates people's safety, security, or privacy, or is preventing ingress or egress, uh, allows that behavior to be cited with a misdemeanor citation. It allows for more immediate resolution for the person who is being targeted if indeed the behavior is going beyond First Amendment expression into something that violates either of those two clauses. That's the distinction between what's in state law and what's being proposed for city ordinance. It's the remedy for the person being targeted. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is with regards to that subjectivity of it. I mean, I think there's oftentimes two sides of things, uh, maybe more than that, but I don't see anywhere in this language where it says that someone feels threatened. And I know that's come up several times in comments. The language seems to be that it adversely affects the safety, security, or privacy, which in my mind would take some type of overt activity to adversely affect one of those three things. It's not just like, oh, I'm worried that they might do something or I am scared of them or anything like that. Am I missing something here? Or am I misunderstanding that? Ms. Manderstein? Uh, Mayor members, uh, you, you are correct. It's an activity um, and or a, a behavior uh, and something that's happening uh, and that has the effect of making the occupants of the dwelling have concerns uh, about negative uh, effects on their safety, security, and privacy. Uh, that's that's what it is. Um, that's what state law uses in its definition uh, as well. Uh, you know, it talks about um, at a particular residential building in a manner that adversely affects the safety, security, or privacy of an occupant of the building. Um, it's it is an inherently subjective standard. Uh, it is in the, it's in the eyes of the recipient of the behaviors. Uh, you know, when you go to court and you seek a harassment restraining order, you put in evidence, you put in affidavits, you put in exp what you are experiencing, and then you try to convince the judge that uh, it's making you feel this way. It's adversely affecting your safety, security, and privacy. That's, that is a process that's out there. I can tell you it, it, it takes uh, weeks um, in some cases uh to get all of that pulled together because once you actually get the restraining order from the court, you've got to find the person and serve them with it. And then they violate, and then if they violate it, then you, then you call the police. And so it's like, if you do that times 30, um, I can see why that is an unsatisfactory remedy. My second question is, um, and I appreciate what you said, mayor about not getting into too many hypotheticals and questions, but, is there a hypothetical or a situation in which somebody adversely affects the safety, security, whatever, all those things were, those three things, that they aren't violating some other law? Well, I think... It they in many cases might be violating some other type of law. Um, you know, maybe like it's a noise ordinance violation, mayor members, um, or, um, uh, 
you know, having a, having, I don't know, I mean, having a fire in the middle of the street, I mean, it really depends on what they're doing. There's probably, in many cases, another uh, behavior that's being undertaken that would be uh, a violation of the criminal code. Um, but but I, I'm, there's probably instances where, the, where that's not the case either. Um, you know, it depends on where they're standing and how much traffic is on the street and are they really stopping traffic and it's really a fact specific but i guess you know maybe to some of the other comments you know i'm hard pressed to see a situation in which people are standing in the street saying things that that is a legitimate safety concern for me now i can totally understand if they're blocking my driveway but that seems to be covered by other laws um i would assume so i'm just trying to figure out a scenario in which there aren't other laws that could just be enforced um, without this. Oh. Wait, was, was that a rhetorical or was that a, a specific question, Councilmember Nelson? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just sort of quickly, you brushed past it a bit. It's been a while now. Um, could you remind me what, um, so if this ordinance were to go through and someone were, um, uh, sorry, uh, someone were um, charged with this, what would be the, what would be the penalty? I mean, they're, they're guilty of a misdemeanor, but what is the penalty? Ms. Mattershein? Uh, Mayor members, it's a it's a misdemeanor. The the penalty for a misdemeanor is um, up to ninety days in jail, up to a thousand dollars fine. Um, that's that's what if you look up misdemeanor under state law, that's what that means. Okay, and that would that would be subject to the judicial process, or mm -hmm. so yes. if we were okay. So there would there would be. If someone were were charged with with um, targeted residential picketing, they this would go through the judicial process. They would have due process, right to an attorney, and and all of that to to plead their case and make their argument that they are not guilty of this. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then um, to a point that was made earlier, I you know every word that I read in this ordinance. I mean, even just the name itself, targeted residential picketing, to me, that, that sounds like it's referring to one residence, a, a single residence. If someone were, I mean, it would seem to me sort of by definition, if someone were approaching multiple residences in a given neighborhood, that would that would not be targeted. Am I am I just off base with that or uh, Mayor members, I think there's a dissolu uh, uh, dissolution of the adversely effects, you know, probably. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of a scenario where somebody would be very upset with multiple adjacent properties. Um, I guess maybe if they were held in common ownership and they were really upset about the common owner um, of those properties and, um, you know, maybe that common owner was a very bad property manager, you know, company or something like that. Um, but in that case, the occupant, you know, the owner of the property isn't the occupant in many of those cases. So I don't know. Is, I, I'm, I can keep thinking about it, but it's not, I'm not thinking of a scenario right now. Well, I, uh, I mean, I, I guess some, Go ahead. Sorry, I guess to to sort of Councilmember Loman's point earlier about this this instance where someone was going to someone was 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 door knocking they were campaigning for elective office. Um, I mean, I'm I guess my point is that something like that, whether or not the intent is to adversely affect, um, say we should just have it like written out so we can all remember the three things: safety, security, or privacy. Um, that it that that the the purpose of this ordinance is that it it's directed at a single residence rather than multiple 
residences. Am I, I mean, if, if, if somebody were just, I, you know, again, I want to be careful about hypotheticals, but if, if somebody were performing an activity, it, it, that, it, that adversely affected those three things for one individual. And if they were doing that to multiple houses, whatever the, or residences, I should say, whatever the reasoning that would, I mean, that would not be what this ordinance is getting at because this, this ordinance specifically refers to the targeting of one residence. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, mayor members, I think the, I think that, you know, occupant a house, a occupant, a may have a different it's because it's because it, if, it has to do with the person inside. They may have a different response than the person in house B, occupant B, um, based on the same behavior, um, or maybe not. Maybe they would have the same. But it's a it's a house. It's a dwelling by dwelling analysis. That's okay. That's that's what I was getting at. Is that it, it's it's based on the the reaction of the individuals within each individual residence, rather than a, a just by virtue of it being a collective. An, an action on multiple residences. Um, so each each individual residence may or may not have that same perception, but that would not be material. Am I understanding that correctly? Mayor members, I believe so. I believe so, Councilmember Coulter. That's a perfectly fair answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mandershad, you put up the list of the cities that have this type of um, uh, this type of ordinance. And I'm assuming that uh, some don't conform so closely to state laws. Some have more more bite to them, to be honest, and, and are a little bit more strict in what they do. Um, wondering, I, I think you had mentioned, has have there been challenges to these other local ordinances in terms of what they can do and how they can do it? And is there any indication uh, of what the courts might rule in terms of uh, – how these are written and how these are enforced at a local level. Mm -hmm. So mayor members, there was a slide in the PowerPoint. I didn't add up the cities, but I think uh, the city manager said there were around 30. It's 33. 33. <clears throat> now this isn't an exhaustive list. I came up with this list based on my searching. I got some sample ordinances from the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, and then when I was trying to find the specific ordinances for the cities that were rec that were sort of given to me as samples i inevitably came upon news articles uh in community newspapers that mentioned eight other cities that were acting on it also oftentimes it was there was a clustering that was happening and so then i'd go out and look for those cities ordinances and see um, what year they were adopted and um so i didn't look at every single one of the ordinances um, of the cities on this list. I will say that the ones, um, some of them are as simple as a statement, um, just a prohibition on targeted residential picketing. Um, others of them, for example, the White Bear Township um, is, um, I have a copy of that one. Um, it's, it does not look like what we have um, before you today. Um, essentially, the essence of it is there. Um, the the activity, the content neutrality, the um, the uh, um, narrowly tailored, those elements are there. If you look at the ordinances that have been adopted more recently, they look very similar um, to what you're looking at tonight. Um, I, I grabbed a lot of them um, when I was looking through, and I'm just going to look at one of them here quickly. The, um, the element um, that is a not a part of our um, definition of targeted residential picketing is um, standing, marching, patrolling, or picketing by one or more persons focused in front of or adjacent to particular dwellings without the consent of the occupant. Um, that's the one that a lot of other cities have that we did not specifically include here. Um, if you'd like us to go out and you know add that to it or do some more research on that, we certainly can. Um, it was our opinion, um, my opinion, frankly, when we were drafting this based on my research that um, there were more, um, by adding that third um, element of it, there was uh, 
not greater clarity as to what the definition was and I didn't felt that it didn't feel that it added all that much more to the definition and uh, I also found there to be value um, based on past experiences in in following the the approach definitionally in state law so that was why I made the recommendation that I did thank you Councilmember Loman Thanks. So I just wanted to just be clear. So in my head, in my head, so I understand um, uh, what is written in here. So I see that on page 191 uh, in the packet, it says that the city council finds that and then under A, it says that the city of Bloomington has an interest in safeguarding the rights of residential to enjoy their home dwelling and a feeling of well-being. So that that's a piece that's in there. And if I jump down to B, um, targeted residential picketing in front of or about residential dwellings cause emotional distress to the dwelling occupants. So when I make those two findings, uh, with respect to um, what's it actually written in the ordinance, which is on page 192, the safety, security, and privacy, how am I as an officer looking at that in terms of trying to enforce the law. And so, for example, when I have the um, something like loitering, you know, that that's that has long historical uh, uh, case law that's related to that. And I would think that those are the same standards by which that are utilized for loitering, for example. And so that's what I'm trying to understand what the difference is between a loitering statute and what we're doing here. Ms. Mandershad, any thoughts? Um, well, I, I don't have the statute pulled up, Mayor members. I don't have the, the, the um, criminal case, a criminal statute on loitering pulled up, but the harassment statute has been around, the one in, that's in our state law has been around since 1990. So there's a great deal of case law about what harassment is and what stalking is and what some of these behaviors are that would be very, uh, which would be used in any sort of a challenge. Um, when I was doing my research in preparation for this, a lot of the cases that I pulled up were harassment cases. Um, related to this particular provision in state law. So those, the case law around harassment is relevant and it's not a, a, a sort of newfangled uh, criminal uh, citation. Uh, harassment and stalking have been around for a long time. I think, you know, those laws related to laser pointers and those that are a little bit more, you know, new and no, uh, novel are, are younger. Sure. And so I guess that that's, that's where I'm trying to, trying to get a good understanding. And so um, I, I go back to the police chief in terms of how you, how would you, uh, with loitering, how is that different than, than this, this piece here? Am, am I looking at that in a different way? Am I, what, how am I, am I looking at this the wrong way? No, I, I think. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, council member Lohman, I, 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 I think you're, you're spot on. I, I think that's, you're making the point that um, there are current, I mean, when we've dealt with protests in the past or loitering, we go out, uh, we look for elements of the crime, and then we act on those. We either send people and say, look, you're loitering, leave, or you could be arrested, and, and thank goodness most people scurry off. I think the difference with this is that you have you know, when someone's loitering, which again is, I, I just, if you, if you look through our citations, you're probably not going to see a ton of, a ton of, you know, where we've actually arrested or cited somebody for loitering. But, um, you know, this to me is more targeted. It's, it's conduct out front. It's, it's specific to a, 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 a resident. Um, you know, maybe you're, you, there's signage that says, the police chief is, uh, you know, an idiot and you're back, you know, back and forth in front of the house. So I think that's the, the, the way I see the difference between a loitering, uh, the, 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 the elements of that, that crime and what's proposed here is it's just, it's simply a targeting of a residential in a, and, and again, the, the standing patrolling or, or marching, um, 
and having an adverse effect on you know someone's sense of security, privacy, or um, safety. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, I, just, I just want to make sure I'm not enshrining. Uh, and some folks have said that loitering is a, is uh, you know from an equity standpoint is a uh, is a real problem and uh, that we need to look at those laws. So I just want to make sure I'm not replacing loitering and enshrining something new that does the same thing. So uh, mm-hmm. thank you. That's all my my question. So. Mm-hmm. I'd add just one sort of characteristic mayor and members prior to consideration. So for example, if people are holding signs that say you can't hide, uh, you can't, you know, and they, and they name you or they say we're watching you and then they name you or they name your position, that's going to have a different impact on you. There is an intent to make you feel insecure in your in your residential dwelling where you live and the court has recognized that you that you have a right to tranquility and retreat and safety and security in your own home and so that's the balance that's one of the balances that the court is trying to strike here and um, one of the values that they're seeking to uphold they're balancing that as you know and as you've been discussing with those other rights right the right of free speech um, the court is recognizing both of those and trying to strike a balance. Councilmember do Alessandro? I, I do actually have a question, Mayor, about the content, I promise. Perfect, let's do it. No hypotheticals. Although, I, as a, as a, I, could, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that loitering is the exact opposite of what we're talking about here, right? Loitering is standing in a public place without a purpose. This is standing in a residential place with a specific purpose. So I think they're very different. That's my personal opinion. I've, um, so my question is, you mentioned in in this that there's a remedy, meaning that there are places where people can go to, there are enough other ways to communicate that this should be a communication that shouldn't happen kind of thing, right? So um, I can see that in the case of public officials. So people can come here, for example, and they can, uh, they can protest our public meeting. Um, uh, they can uh, contact me via my public you know, publicly provided information. When it's a an individual resident that is not a member of the public sphere, um, what are the other remedies that they that are proposed that uh, that people would have for which this then is not the appropriate remedy? Do, do, do I make my? Is that a clear question? I'm sorry if that sounded convoluted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mayor members, I, it is a bit of a hypothetical, uh, but I will say there are um, there are other ways. You know, they can say, like you said, they can send you a letter. They can send the city manager a letter. They can send me a letter. They can call me. They can show up at the city hall. They I, can. I, I, pardon uh, for interrupting you, Ms. Manishite. I'm I'm specifically saying if I'm not a public individual. Oh, I see. If I'm see. not, so so mm-hmm. I totally get all of those, right? I guess what yeah. I'm saying is, how does somebody who's a resident here call the the police force saying, "Hey, I am being targeted for this"? What what is the what is the what is the standard for? Oh, those people had a b- million other ways to get a hold of that person uh, and protest them, and that and you know that's what I'm trying to understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, may I remember is- you know, they could they could send the person. I guess they could send the person a letter. They could um, buy a billboard. They could uh, write a letter to the newspaper. They could create a blog. They could do all of these other things that are that are not against the law. Um, okay, so that, all of those all of those general communication functions count towards that standard. Mm-hmm. They could use you know Facebook. Yep. Okay, I appreciate. It. Thank you. Council, do we have other questions? So here's what I'm going to propose as we've hit 10.30 now tonight. Um, I, I would like to just kind of plow through this and get this done. And But I would like to also, um, then that, that's going to require our appointments, our commission appointments. Uh, we're going to have to push those off at least by a week to, to be able to get this done, I think. We might even still go past 11. So um, why don't we, uh, if everybody's cool with it, I'd like to open the public hearing and we'll get into uh, the public discussion on this. Um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, do you think it would be prudent now to simply move to adjust the um, agenda to move our organizational business, items 8.1 through 8.6, 
to take well, Mr. Mayor, if that's uh, you know a nodding head concurrence, then uh, we can let staff know. And I've already communicated with staff that there's a high likelihood that would happen. So uh, the the schedule for appointments of commissioners is not dependent on that being acted upon tonight. Uh, so next Monday will be just fine for that item. Council, then I would move that uh, we uh, we table eight, items 8.1 to 8.6 until our next meeting, which is uh, February 14th. Do you need a second, second on that? Okay. Got a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro. Just got ahead of you, Councilmember Lohman. Sorry. Um, any further discussion on that? That would allow us then to release staff and, and let those folks move on with their world. Hearing no further discussion, Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. So we will move items 8.1 through 8.6 to our February 14th meeting, which is a week from tonight. With that, uh, with council offering a number of questions, uh, we're going to move on to the public hearing for item 7.4. At this point, I would like to open the public hearing on item 7.4 the targeted residential picketing ordinance. We have no one here in the council chambers that I can see would want to come forward, and the chief's going to check for me to be sure. Nope, we do not. <laughs> so I would ask uh, Riza, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.4 tonight, uh, the public hearing on targeted residential picketing? Yes, we have Becky Mayor on the line. Your line is open. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm calling tonight to voice my opinion on the city council rewriting the city code to shield themselves from not only the consequences of their own unpopular and unwanted public policy, but to also shield their friend, Sheriff Dave Hutchinson, who is a Bloomington resident and friend of the council. Lawmakers and residents across both parties have called for his resignation due to his egregious DUI and criminal behavior on December 8th. Hutch is arrogantly refusing to resign, despite the damage he's doing to his constituents and fellow law enforcement officers. With police accountability being a very hot issue right now, it's important our officers are being held to the highest standards. I suspect that the immediate need to change this ordinance is likely some sort of quid pro quo between Councilmember Carter and Sheriff Hutchinson. In 2019, Sheriff Hutch broke HCSO policy 1058.4.1 by campaigning for Jenna and giving her an unauthorized endorsement as Hennepin County Sheriff. It only makes sense that Jenna would now use her power on the city council to help him out. But that's just speculation. Although you claim it's been in the works since fall, it's rather questionable why this will be up for vote when it originally was at the last meeting. I was going to say that it's not exactly protest season, but BLM and Antifa just started up in Minneapolis. And over the weekend, the executive director of CARE Minnesota called for people to target elected officials in their homes and even at the grocery store. So I do understand that recent threat. Now it seems more relevant, but when this item was originally brought to the council, there was no discussion or pending plans of any home protests in Bloomington or Minneapolis. The bulk of the other cities who have enacted this ordinance did it after BLM and Antifa targeted Bob Kroll's home in Hugo, threatening his neighbors and calling for violent attacks. Those situations aren't peaceful protesting. They are meant to intimidate and scare people. The only time I know of a protest going to someone's home here in Bloomington was nearly two years ago when myself and a group of residents went to Mayor Bussey's house while he was raking on a Saturday afternoon. After numerous attempts at communication were ignored, we felt it was our only way to be heard. He immediately called Chief Potts, BPD came quickly, and then stayed to monitor the situation. It was not scary, it was not violent, nor was it destructive or even loud. We stood on the opposite side of the street from his house and had about an hour-long conversation about crime in Bloomington and supporting our police. We even moved for cars that drove by. This is all well documented on the Bloomington Patriots YouTube page if anybody wants to watch. Many of us walked away feeling like it was a productive conversation, but it would have been much better for the mayor to address our concerns before we were interrupting his yard work on a Saturday afternoon. Unfortunately, when emails are being ignored and public meetings are being held in private homes, there aren't many other ways to exercise our First Amendment rights. Some of you are completely inaccessible to the constituents you are sworn to serve. As someone who has been targeted, stalked, and harassed by Antifa multiple times in my home, I know how firsthand these unnerving these situations can be. My concerns about this have been communicated to the city council in the past, and my concerns have continually fallen on deaf ears. The Bloomington police have always been responsive and helpful, as they were to the mayor when he needed them, and they have always helped me navigate the proper legal remedies to address that harassment. 
I look forward to the security this ordinance change could provide, but I wish you would have put more consideration into it when people like myself were actually being targeted, not when you or your friends are worried about a threat that doesn't exist or when you want to ignore constituents you don't agree with. Although I strongly disagree with anybody participating in the type of targeted harassment I have experienced in my home, I am a private citizen where you are public servants. If you are conducting public business, it needs to be in a public location where you are accessible to the people you serve. When you don't respond to emails and you virtually attend meetings from your private home, the public is left with very few options to be heard. Some of you let us all into your private home every meeting while you discuss public business virtually, but then want to tell the public that your home is private when it's convenient for you. At this point, there's no reason that anybody should be virtually attending council meetings. You belong at Civic Plaza where you can be accessible to the people you were elected to serve. I appreciate the council members who have provided thoughtful insight tonight on this issue, and my hope would be that you all use this opportunity to return to the dais and bring public business back to Civic Plaza. Everyone's homes should remain private, but at the same time, constituents should feel heard and properly represented represented by the people they elected. Thank you. Thank you. Riza, do we have anyone else on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.4? Um, we have someone dialing in at the moment. Should we wait for him? Yes, if we could, we'll just wait one moment here. Okay. I will let you know if he goes to the room. Any luck, Riza? I think they're getting, the operator is getting his name. Please press star 1 on your telephone keypad if you wish to join the public comment. We have Natalie Maros on the line. Good evening, Ms. Maros. Good evening. Thank you. I won't be long. I just wanted to say that I agree with what the previous caller, Becky, had to say. And I believe that we have laws already in place that to all of us, including uh, the elected people that we have serving us. If you wish to join the public comment. Hello? Becky, are you still with us? I mean, uh, Natalie, are you still with us? I am. Were you able to hear me? Yes, I think we had a little call. Good Bleed onto the other calls. I apologize. Riza, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, I think your call is bleeding onto our caller's call. So I don't know if somebody needs to turn something down or, or not. I'm sorry, Ms. Moros, sorry. please. Start. I think it's the line of Miss Natalie. Thank you. Ms. Moros, if you could, why don't, why don't you start again if you could, Natalie? Okay, thank you. My name again is Natalie Morose, and I'm calling because I agree with what um, the previous caller, Becky, had to say. I think that we already have laws in place that protect each of us in Bloomington, and I think that includes our elected officials. Um, I had not planned on calling in, but I think it's important that we know that the laws get enforced and that we're safe. I recently ran for school board and knew by doing that I was opening myself up to people that don't agree with what I have. Um, there were a number of times that things happened that shouldn't, but I knew that that was part of the responsibility I was taking by putting myself out there. I appreciate the comments that council members have made in regard to their desire to be open and approachable by us, and I hope that that continues. I 
would like to ask if this is a problem that has been in Bloomington, because I'm not aware of that. And I did see the video that Becky was referencing, and it did look like it could have been a productive conversation. Hopefully no one will feel the need to go to anyone's home, and residents will feel heard. Um, and so that's really all that I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Riser, do we have anyone else on the line wishing to speak to item 7.4? No one is on the line. You may continue. Thank you. No one else on the line. Uh, no one in the council chambers. Council, I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 7.4. So moved, Coulter. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Carter to close the public hearing on item 7.4. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Public hearing is closed on item 7.4. Uh, council, discussion on this. Council Member Carter. Yes, I have two clarifying questions. Um, and I guess this would probably go to Chief Hartley and then Mr. Verbrugge. So I guess my first one is, um, in the caller's comments, they said that there was only one protest that has happened at a residential home in Bloomington, um, the one that Becky referred to. Is that true? Has there been more than one? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Councilman McCarter, uh, I would have to go back and, and check Cat for a, an exact number, but I am aware of uh, at least two in residential neighborhoods. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then the other question that I have, um, and this one is definitely probably toward Mr. Verbrugge and Ms. Manderscheid, when did the conversations around this ordinance begin? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, I believe the City Attorney and Council Member Carter, I believe the City Attorney referenced uh, earlier that this first hit our radar screen, or her radar screen last spring. Uh, I was having conversations with League of Minnesota City staff and other city officials uh, about 16 months ago, maybe. Uh, and there was um, the work that was being done by the League of Minnesota Cities to uh, look at uh, what tools were in place to protect the, you know, the integrity of neighborhoods and, and uh, try to minimize the impact uh, on, on residential neighborhoods uh, for some time. And so we've been waiting to see how that unfolded, which is why we waited to bring it for a while. We wanted to see what the, you know, what, what uh, reaction it may provoke if a bunch of cities were uh, enacting these. And to the point that our city attorney made, um, we haven't seen uh, uh, any challenges, we're pretty confident in the League of Minnesota City's assessment of, um, you know, what is uh, what is legal and what is not, and we're comfortable that this meets those thresholds. Okay, because I think one of the callers had um, claimed this just kind of popped up within the last couple of weeks or in the last month, but that is not accurate then. It is not accurate. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I can uh, chime in, uh, Council Member Carter. Actually, Mr. Verbrugge and I had this discussion uh, in October of 2020 when he asked if after uh, the group visited my house whether or not I wanted to pursue this. And, and at that time I said no, but then we considered continue the conversation over the period of time, whether or not it was appropriate at that time. So the notion that we're somehow coming up with this idea to, to uh, protect or address a certain individual, a specific person is absurd. It's just ridiculous to even say that. So. Council, any additional questions? Comments on this? I have one question. Councilmember D'Alessandro. D Thank you, Mayor. Um, does it does it change the letter of the law or support uh, a, a strengthening of the law if the if the ordinance included um, that it was targeted? not just at a d residential dwelling, but at a person who dwells in that dwelling, like to, to be targeted about a person. Is that, is that useful or does it, does the law as it's kind of defined here uh, for us cover up, intend to cover everybody in that house or how does that work? We met, I asked it because we mentioned specifically like signage, right? That has a person's name on it and things like that. Uh, Mayor members, the definition includes the word occupant. So it would need to be somebody who occupies that that residential dwelling. So I would suspect that if they were holding a sign, you know, I'll try to sort of to stretch the 
the hypothetical, if they're holding a sign and they and they're at the wrong house, um, then it probably you know would probably be annoying to you, but you, but um, may or may not rise to the level of you know making you fear for your safety. Council member, any, any additional council? Any other questions, council member? Just just to make sure I understand. So so it says specifically it's directed at a resident as a residential dwelling but adversely affecting an occupant. What I'm asking is, does it make sense to say it's directed at an occupant of that dwelling? That's my question. All right. I lost track of who chimed in where, so I'm gonna go with Council Member Martin, Council Member Nelson, and Council Member Coulter. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I, a little bit uh, of two minds about this one. I, I could certainly see moving forward tonight just based on it looks like this is pretty well trodden ground with a lot of communities around the region. And if we were going to do something, I'd want it to be in place before, gosh forbid, something terrible were to happen in the community that would cause a lot of unrest uh, where we might be seeing more of this than just the, the handful we've got. So I could see this being useful down the line. I think if, if I had my druthers, I would appreciate... Uh, I, I don't know if it's even possible, more specific verbiage around, I guess I would be concerned if folks were out in front of my house based on the disturbance to the neighborhood, all of my other neighbors and the stress that would call them, that caused them because they didn't choose to have a council member live next door. Uh, and that's a, a pretty big impact to them. So I'd be comfortable moving forward tonight. I, I very much appreciate the chief's comments on this and where the fuzziness would get complicated. Um, but I, for the most part, I, I would guess common sense would prevail on this and it wouldn't come in to play a whole lot. Um, but yeah, so I'm comfortable moving forward, but I don't know, I will have to ask Council Member Carter, she's the mastermind on this one, I guess. <laughs> Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor, uh, appreciate that. Um, two quick items. Um, so let me see if I can phrase this right. So. From what I heard from Ms. Strohmeyer, I, candidly just sort of ignoring the baseless speculation of the rationale for this, is that she was in favor of this because it would have been helpful for her. Um, and and then um, when Ms. Moreau spoke, she was against it, but supported Ms. Strohmeyer. And, and I regret that Ms. Strohmeyer wasn't on uh, any longer because I was a little confused by that. It sounded like she was in favor of this because not only would it apply to us that ran for this and put ourselves out in the public square, but to other residents who have opinions and share them and talk with people and, and things of that nature. And um, it, 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 Mayor, City Manager, did you hear that the same way I did? Or am I just totally misinterpreting what she said? It's totally probably an unfair question for you guys. No, I think Councilmember Nelson, I, I I think you're interpreting that correctly. I think that's the way I heard it as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then um my my second completely unfair question is for Chief Hartley. Um earlier in the conversation you expressed some concerns about this. And normally we have um uh you know staff recommendations and things of that nature. I just, you know, in the last issue talked about process and things like that. How far do you want to go? I mean, do you not think we should do this? Or do you think we should do this? Or do you think we should send it back for some tweaking and have more conversations? You know, where are you at? Where's your team at on this? And I don't want to put you uh, or your staff or our officers in a bad situation either. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, council member Nelson. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm usually used to be putting on a spot. I think we've we've really hit on the subjectivity of this of this ordinance, and uh, I have talked at length with the city attorney. And again, I, I'm I'm coming to you. I would benefit as a public official, and what we see happening throughout the country, and what happens at police chiefs' houses. Um, but I just want to make sure that maybe we can iron out some of that subjectivity, some of that gray because my fear is that we would be putting our, our officers in a situation where, um, you know, I get the cooler heads would prevail and, 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 and we would make, uh, you know, decisions that are based on the facts at hand on each individual case. Um, but I, I just, 
I just want to I want to just prepare the council for the possibility that um, this gets framed as people that were exercising their First Amendment and had force eventually used upon them when uh, an arrest was made after uh, the police responded. Uh, I don't. That that is a that is a narrative that none of us want to have to work through. That is a concern of mine. And I just would ask that if we can inject, and I, I don't have the answers tonight, um, if we can kind of take some of that subjectivity out of it and remove some of that gray, um, I would support it. Because again, I think, uh, you know, as I'm looking out for the officers of the department, I'm looking out for what's best for what I think uh, in the community for, for our, uh, our residents and our visitors. Um, I just, I just want to make sure we're not setting ourselves up for a really difficult scenario down the road, one that I think we just have to be prepared for if we're going to, um, you know, we're going to leave the gray in this and and and, and leave that to the, the the occupant of an individual to determine where their level of sense of security or or um, you know privacy, but. Um, that's just again. I, I could support it to answer your question. I just I think we just need a little bit more more work on it. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for the candor. Very much appreciated. Um, I guess in just follow up, um, City Manager and City Attorney, is that possible to allow a little bit of time to work through some of those things and see if we can come up with a little tighter language that uh, addresses those concerns. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, there is no uh, urgency to adopt this particular ordinance. Uh, I think the question is whether we can satisfy that level of subjectivity within the constraints of what is permissible under First Amendment case law. And that's something that I think the city attorney and the police chief are going to have to continue to work on. Thank you. Appreciate that answer. I see Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Lohman, but first, Council, I would like to move that we extend our deadline from 11 o'clock to 11.20 this evening to ensure that we can get our work done tonight. And uh, no later, not to exceed 11.20. Second, Coulter. Got a motion and a second by Councilmember Coulter to, exceed our, or to extend our deadline not to exceed 11.20 this evening. No more discussion on this. Mr. Brillhart. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you much for your flexibility. It's appreciated. We will get through this as quickly as we can. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. And I will try and be as brief as possible, which you all know is not really very brief for me. But um, I thank you, first of all, to the city attorney and, and Chief Hartley. And I, I think... A lot of important points have been made that that are made have made this a, a challenge for me. In fact, as as recently as just not too long before we were set to to vote on this two weeks ago, um, I was ready to vote against it. Um, in truth, I think targeted residential picketing is, if I'm being blunt, stupid. I also know that that as a tactic, it's it's ineffective. It it absolutely does not work. And that was true when it happened outside of Bob Kroll's house. And that was true when it happened outside of Tim Bussey's house. Uh, but that's not enough for me. That would not have been enough for me to, to support this ordinance. And I, I think what it comes down to for me is ultimately that the, the damage that this can cause for, for individuals, for people. And we should be clear, you know, we our conversation has primarily focused on public officials, whether they be elected officials or or folks who work for the city or are appointed by the council. But this could just as easily apply to a private individual, somebody who is not elected or or employed by any public entity, somebody who simply works at a a, a private business. And what I have come to realize about this is that. You know, when we specifically do, when we talk about public officials, what this does is it, it harms individuals and it, it discourages people, people from participating in public processes. I know I have spoken with people who 
were interested in running for office, who wanted to serve on city boards and commissions, who wanted to take a job with the city, who were afraid of what would happen if they did that. And that is that is concerning to me. And when it again, when it comes to public officials, there, you know, there are other opportunities for folks to raise issues, to to ask questions and, and hold public officials accountable. And I would also note that um, somewhat ironically that one of our previous callers has literally uh, told me the email that I don't need to respond because I respond so frequently. Um, but I, you know, there, there are those opportun other opportunities. And I would say that if a, an elected official, for example, is not responsive enough, if, if constituents feel that that is something they are not getting from their elected official, then the then the remedy is at the ballot box. The remedy is a a political one, not a not you know targeted residential picketing outside of someone's home. And you know that that to me at the end of the day that's what this is about is is about ensuring that folks have a right to live peacefully in their homes and engage in public service. And or even not even that, just do their day jobs. And there, I, I you know, this may be something of an unpopular opinion, but as it does apply to, to private individuals, I think it's fair to to ask if folks do have a right to seek out that kind of redress. If if they do have a right to to get that kind of feedback from a, a private individual, somebody who was not not a public official. Um, but I, I am very concerned about what, what this kind of tactic, as ineffective as I think it is, um, what this kind of tactic does for public service in general. And I, you know, I, I did initially think and, and was initially very concerned that this was a violation of First Amendment rights. Um, I, am, I am convinced legally that that is not the case. And, and to be frank, I'm convinced philosophically that that is not the case either. So, um, you know this this is something that that i i can support i think it is whether or not it's it's happened to me i think the closest i came was uh, a group of residents driving by and one of my neighbors thought it was actually a, a prom proposal um but um whether or not this happens to me i think this is something that that would be good for all of us in terms of ensuring that we have good people who are willing and able to serve the public Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, uh, you know, this one is, uh, I think it's an interesting one. And um, I, I know I'm in the minority on this one, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I think it's particularly interesting that this is uh, happening uh, during uh, African American History uh, Month. Um, sometimes uh, when protesters uh, feel that they cannot uh, be able to uh, get to the elected officials or those folks who are in power, they end up having to utilize means by which that are not traditional. Um, sometimes it means they end up having to go to, the, to a particular person's residency. I think it's quite salient now, uh, given uh, some of the things that we've seen in other cities across the, uh, across the country. While I, I don't, I don't, again, I agree with uh, Councilmember Coulter, I don't, I don't particularly care for this particular means by which to to get a hold of your elected officials. Uh, this is a means by which uh, uh, to, to do it, um, and um, and so I am very concerned about uh, someone's freedom of speech. However, how this is written, it uh, seems to protect some of that, but then there's a gray area uh, that's there uh, that the police chief talked about. And uh, that uh, gray area, I think also relates to those folks who find themselves uh, in the minority of our political discourse as well, uh, that don't fit in the majority of that, uh, whether it be politically or depending on your ethnic background or how you look or your gender. Um, and these can be, these particular laws, if left to that subjectivity, can be utilized um, as, uh, loitering has been for years, um, and that's why many uh, 
municipalities have worked hard to uh, bring the, that particular law to uh, uh, to its conclusion. And as I look at this particular piece, I, I, I get it. Um, I don't want folks to be intimidated, uh, to, to not be able to, to be able to participate. This seems to protect those folks as well, well who have uh, differing points of view and perspectives. So uh, given the way that it's written today, I cannot support uh, this, uh, the way it's written today with all this subjectivity. I do not want to put the, the Bloomington Police Department um, in, in this particular position uh, to, to try to have to make these subjective choices. Um, I, I just, uh, given what's going on in our current climate, I think we need to be clear uh, about what we're trying to do here. And as this is presently written, I, I can't support it. And I am happy to, to, to work to get to that conclusion. Uh, but I think the police chief has put it uh, quite well. Councilmember Carter. Um, thank you, Mayor. So I'm going to try to keep my comments brief and not be repetitive of what others have said. But, um, you know, I feel like in our conversation and what we've learned from staff tonight, we've established that most of the things that are covered in this ordinance are also covered by state law and that there is some subjectivity as there is subjectivity in many of the things that you probably have to enforce or police have to enforce. Um, so for me, though, uh, this is really about the remedy and making sure that people have um, a faster option to be able to address the concerns that they have when they have them. And so I will be supporting this ordinance. Others, Council? Well, I, I can say that, um, frankly, I... I almost don't want to support this because I don't think it goes far enough. Because in my mind, uh, and from what I have seen, a, a protest at a private residence is not about First Amendment. It's not about having a discussion. It's about intimidation. It's as simple as that. It's about intimidation. Uh, the, the protesters at my house, the protesters at Ms. Strohmeyer's house, the protesters at our school board chair's house, uh, the protesters at the, the dentist who shot a lion at his house, I mean, th that, it wasn't about expressing an opinion, it was about intimidation. And granted, you could probably say intimidation is a First Amendment protected activity in itself in, to a certain degree. So I honestly don't think this goes far enough. I know it's legal, uh, my question is whether it will be effective. But uh, ultimately I will support this. It was, uh, uh, when considering that uh, I, I, we signed up for this. And sometimes, I mean, it, it comes as part of the job, whether it's an elected or an appointed official. Um, my neighbors did not sign up for it, and they had to put up with it also. My wife and daughter did not sign up for it. They had to put up with it. Family members, friends. Uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's one thing to do it to an address uh, an elected or an appointed or a public official. It's another thing when you get the, uh, the wash, when you get the, the unintended victims of it as well. Uh, and and there is a, a victim portion to this. I mean, it's it, it it can be frightening for people, and I get that, and I understand that. Um, so uh, I I do think it's it's something that we should do. Um, originally, when I had this discussion with Mr. Verbrugge, I did not think it was something we should should do, and he can attest to that that I was very hesitant to move forward with this. But I think, given uh, what we're seeing now, and the chilling effect that it's having on people, um, either uh, applying for our boards and commissions, thinking about running for office, being a, a city employee, uh, and also uh, just just given the overall uh, tenor of it and what we want our city to be, I can I can tell you everyone that I talk to about this in our city, from whatever political stripe they are from, they are they are appalled at the notion of protests at a private residence. There are I think this, it, this reflects our community as well and our community values about what we're expecting of, um, of the people who disagree with you on any number of things. And so I, I think despite all of the shortcomings and the fact that, as I said, I think it's more legal than it is effective and I don't think it goes far enough, I think this is the thing that we need to do here um, for our community. Any additional comments, Council? Let's 
Seeing none, Council, I would look for action. Mayor, I can make that motion. Council Member Martin. Uh, Mayor, I will move that we adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the City Code to regulate targeted residential picketing. Do we have a second? Second, Coulter. We have a motion by Council Member Martin, a second by Council Member Coulter to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the City Code to regulate targeted residential picketing. No further discussion on this? Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. No. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Nay. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 5-2. And Council Member Martin, second part of this motion. Sure. Uh, Mayor, I will move that we adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of the ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the City Code to regulate targeted residential picketing. Second, Coulter. I have a motion by Council Member Martin, a second by Council Member Coulter for summary publication. No further discussion. Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries. Was that 7 0 or 6 1? Did I hear an A in there? Or... Okay, 7 0. Thank you. Uh, item 7.5, which we need to get through if we're going to get, get through this all tonight. This is uh, another public hearing. This is an ordinance authorizing city attorney, our city attorney, to enforce city code. Ms. Manderscheid? All right, I'll be brief. Uh, so we have been adopting uh, ordinances, um, and when we do that, there is language in them about who has the authority to enforce, what office is going to be doing the enforcing, and... Um, that occurred most recently and mentioned the city attorney's office as being the enforcement entity for conversion therapy. We now have the portal available to report uh, conversion therapy um, and we need to amend our code to make the city attorney's office um, an authorized entity uh, within the city to issue citations and otherwise enforce the provisions of the conversion therapy um, ordinance housekeeping for lack of for simplicity's sake here council questions of ms mandershot on item 7.5 any questions hearing none i will open this public hearing on uh, item 7.5 which is an ordinance authorizing our city attorney to enforce city code we have no one in the city council chambers coming forward this evening Risa, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.5? No one is on the line. Please continue. We have no one coming forward, no one on the line. Council, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 7.5. So moved. So moved. Coulter. We have a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, a second by Councilmember Coulter to close the public hearing on item 7.5. No person or no uh, additional comment by the council. Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Council, any discussion? Questions to be answered on this? Councilmember Lohman? Um, Mayor, I will not be uh, supporting this uh, for statements I've made in the past. I, I think that uh, uh, this particular action should be enforced uh, through a criminal remedy. Thank you for that clarification, Council Member. Any additional comments, questions? Hearing none, Council, I look for action on item 7.5. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Council, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Sorry, uh, just to clarify, the, the motion on the table is, is strictly to add the city attorney to the code in the enforcement area, right? It's not a function of any any particular legal... Thing or you are correct Council okay Board. it's just yep. the administrative correct you are correct thank you very much yes yes there are all kinds of codes out there mayor and members in our city code and it speaks to who can enforce them 
Um, you know, the animal control officers catch uh, stray dogs. You know, there are different provisions and different assignments um, based on the uh, relevant entity within the city. Um, with conversion therapy, um, it fit into a lot of different places within the city. Um, we ultimately uh, decided uh, amongst the staff to recommend that it be the city attorney's office. Um, we have those kinds of conversations whenever we move with new le new sort of ordinances, legislation, um, you know, earn sick and safe leave there, those sorts of things. There will be times when we have these large scale compliance um, legal compliance things, and um, and we need to specifically call out who is authorized to enforce the code. So you'll see the list on page 197. It's adding the city attorney. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Mandershine. There are no further questions. As I said, Council, I would look for action on item 7.5. Mayor, I, I just, uh, sorry, you probably didn't see my hand here. I just want to clarify that I'm fully supportive of the, uh, the city attorney being able to force laws. I just disagree with uh, this particular enforcement piece. So just to make real clear on that. Understood. Thank you. Mayor, if I, I, I know we're trying to be quick here, but just to be clear, this particular um, amendment is applies to the entire city code. It's not specific to conversion therapy. That's just the most recent occurrence of the city attorney's office being the enforcement entity. So this is in the generic or general uh, opening provisions of our city code and applies to the totality of the document. Mayor, I hate to do this again. <laughs> I want to clarify that since I don't want to strip it all the way out and and and, uh, uh, and parse this out in a legalese way, I'm just making a statement now about why I don't support this particular thing because it also supports the thing that I do not agree with in principle. And you've made that point three times now, Council Member. Thank you for that. Council action on 7.5. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I would move to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 1 of the City Code related to enforcement of ordinances and laws. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Carter, a second by Council Member D'Alessandro to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 1 of the City Code. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. No. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 6-1. Councilmember Carter, uh, summary publication. Um, I would move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance amending Chapter 1 of the City Code related to enforcement of ordinances and laws. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro for summary publication on item 7.5. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, if you're just tuning in now, I pity you, but also uh, we moved our organizational business item 8.1 through 8.6 to our meeting next Monday night on the 14th on Valentine's Day. Those will be our uh, a discussion of the board and commission policy and process improvement update, and then our appointments to a variety of commissions. But we do still have item 8.7, our city council policy and issue update. Mr. Verbrugge. Uh, Mr. Mayor, no uh, policy issues to raise this evening. I did want to just advise the council that uh, I will be away next week. So Mr. Sable will be the acting city manager and will be uh, fulfilling that role during the council meeting. Very good. Councilmember Coulter, and then Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I will be very, very brief, but since this does relate to uh, action the council has taken recently, I did just want to announce for anyone still watching at home that Nine Mile Brewing, Bloomington's very first brewery tap room, is opening this Friday. They're having an event, I think it's from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. I know I'm going to be there. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, just wanted to make that known for folks. Duly noted. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
just wanted to make mention of the Veterans Memorial. I know that they're working on their fundraising and um, just would be curious if we could get an update from the city on where that's at, what role we have uh, in that um, and, and how they're doing. So I was unfortunately not able to make their event. I believe, Mayor, you were there, if I understand correctly. So I'm um, just really excited about that project and happy to see things moving forward and, and just would like an update to see if it's going the right direction. Why don't we get that on a on an upcoming council agenda? It's a, it's a good update. There's a lot of fantastic work that's being done. Anything else, council? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Forgive me if this is not appropriate, Mr. Mayor, but I do I do I do not know if we have recognized the passing of John Aaron. Uh, we have not, John. John Olson. Sorry, Olson. That's what I meant. Sorry. There was, was next. I, I apologize. Was next on my list, actually. Oh, yes. then by all means. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Council Member. That's a, a, a good segue. I, I, I just wanted to make, I, I think you have all heard uh, the sad news, the passing of uh, John Olson, who was a uh, council colleague of many of us, uh, served here on the council from 2014 through 2017. He was also on the HRA from 2017 to 2019. It's on the Planning Commission uh, from 08 until about 012. We're not even sure even beyond that. And he was a past president of Daymakers Rotary here in Bloomington. He was a teacher, he was a grandfather, he was an author, he actually wrote a book, uh, What Legacy Are We Leaving, Giving to Our Kids? And um, he, he was an all-around good guy. Uh, I enjoyed serving with John. I'm gonna, I was sad to hear of his passing. And, um, uh, you know, wish him, wish him eternal rest because it's, uh, it's, it was sudden in my mind. I hadn't heard that he was ailing in any way and I'm sad to see him go. So, but thank you for bringing it up, Council Member. I wanted to make sure that we do that yet tonight too. Just take a minute to remember John. So... Council, is there anything else tonight? If not, I would look for a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn this evening's meeting. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you much for staying with us tonight. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you for your discussion, Council. Staff, I think it was a good night, a lot of good discussion, and I really do appreciate your work tonight. So thank you all very much. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you, Council. Thanks, folks. Have a good night.